Why were vanilla dungeons so long? Well, because the designers thought people would only do them once. In order to explain why pretty much all of the vanilla dungeons were so long, I kind of have to explain the philosophy behind MMO dungeons at the time. Before WoW, EverQuest was the most popular MMORPG on the market, and they didn't have instance dungeons or raids. What this meant was that every single dungeon or raid boss in the game was essentially an open world dungeon or world boss, so guilds had to fight each other for the opportunity to clear dungeons, and had to fight off constant attempts to kill raid bosses. And since EverQuest had player collusion, they would sometimes hire other guilds that just had big character models to stand at the entrances of dungeons to literally body block people from getting in, just so they could complete it. And because of this dungeon design philosophy, only the most hardcore players got to do dungeons, and it wasn't something everyone was able to experience. And World of Warcraft could have easily gone down this same path as a lot of the development team were hardcore EverQuest players. And there was a huge argument about whether or not WoW Dungeons should be instanced or not. Now, we all know which side won that debate in the end, as all dungeons and raids take place in separate instances, so that anyone can do them if they want, as long as they have a group. But it very easily could have gone the other way. And since there was not too many standards when it came to MMOs yet, the standard for dungeon design was to just make them really big, kinda like D&D dungeons which also partly contributed to their large designs, as in D&D, players basically only complete a dungeon once, and if they ever return to it, it's usually pretty much empty. And under a one-time dungeon visit rule, it makes sense for them to be big or massive and have lots of things to explore or navigate with tons of bosses along the way. And I think it was under these two design philosophies, where developers didn't think people would do a dungeon more than once, and that there wasn't really a precedent for repeatable dungeons in mainstream games yet, that led to developers kind of going crazy with their sizes. Once they created the Deadmines, they basically used that as a benchmark for how big other dungeons needed to be, and for how raids and high-level dungeons needed to be bigger. On screen, I'll show you a little diagram of the Wailing Caverns development from the WoW Diary, and you can see the original dungeon looked pretty similar to a modern-day dungeon, before they then doubled the length of it, added side wings to it, and then added a maze section to double the size of it again. Although even at the time, they thought the maze section was a little too much, so they added little mushrooms in the cave to help navigate the maze better. Although they made a mistake, and the mushrooms blended into the environment too well, so that didn't really help with navigations very much, as people just thought it was normal ground clutter. And taking a quote from the WoW Diary, In hindsight, it seems obvious that our early dungeons were too big but previous MMO dungeons were epic experiences embraced by only the most hardcore players. The paradigm of big dungeons was established by EverQuest's non-instance play spaces, where play spaces needed to accommodate everyone on the server who wanted to go there. Besides, we didn't want people to play through content too fast, otherwise they'd be done with WoW in only a couple of months. What we didn't realize was how much private play spaces, instances, would shrink the amount of overall play space needed. Besides, the concept of short, one-hour dungeons didn't exist in MMOs. The closest things to one-hour dungeons were the wings of Aaron Keller's Scarlet Monastery. We learned only after shipping WoW that players really liked short dungeon runs, and so the Scarlet Monastery's wing approach was a direction taken by subsequent expansions. So basically, they created massive mega dungeons because they expected players to explore it maybe once, but they had also created a system of gearing that required players to run dungeons multiple times. And you can kind of see the disconnect between the different parts of the development team. The people who added gear to raids were not really the same people who designed the dungeons. And you also had different people who designed the fights for those dungeons. So while they were created with the intention of running through them multiple times, they were also kind of created to only be ran once, as they didn't think players would enjoy doing the same dungeon more than one time. So with future expansions, they significantly reduced the size of dungeons, and in the Burning Crusade, there was just a whole bunch of short dungeons. And occasionally, they might have a dungeon that's a little bit longer than normal, but all of the biggest dungeons in the game are all still pretty much every single dungeon from Vanilla WoW. And whenever they remade one of the old dungeons, they would usually cut them in parts or completely remove parts of the dungeon, like they did with Skolomonts or the Sunken Temple. They've neutered pretty much all of the original classic dungeons to the point where none of them are as long as they used to be. And you have to play classic WoW if you want to do dungeons in their original mega forms. And it turns out players like the smaller dungeons, 
People like to get through a dungeon quickly, and big, long dungeons are just kind of tedious once you've done them for a second or third time. So that's why vanilla dungeons were long, and why dungeons after Vanilla WoW were created much smaller. In Vanilla WoW, there was a pair of gloves that were a low-level epic world drop, so they could be sold and bought off the auction house, that were best in slot for melee classes that could equip them. So warriors would go out of their way to grab these items, as well as the odd shaman and melee hunter. Now what made these gloves so good was that they gave plus 7 in weapon skill to three different weapons which is probably going to need some explaining to let you know why that's a good thing, because even today people aren't 100% sure what weapon skills did in Vanilla WoW. Basically, an increase in weapon skill would increase the damage you did when you landed a glancing blow. Melee classes on their normal auto attacks have about a 40% chance to do a glancing blow on bosses or other mobs that are three levels higher than you. And when you perform a glancing blow, you would only do about 70% the normal damage and be incapable of critting with that attack. So, wasn't as bad as straight up missing, but was still something you didn't want to happen. And having an increased weapon skill past the maximum amount would lower the damage penalty of glancing blows by about 3% per point. So with one extra weapon skill point above the maximum of 300, you'd do about 73% damage instead of 70%. Kind of. Here's where the weapon skill stat gets a little tricky. People aren't exactly sure how much weapon skill impacted glancing blows, but most people agreed it was about 3% per point, and having 10 points would reduce the damage penalty to about 5-10%, to allowing you to do 90-95% to damage on glancing blows, which almost eliminates glancing blows from the equation, and would vastly increase your DPS, as 40% of your auto attacks would be glancing blows. It was to the point where one extra point in weapon skill was more valuable than 1% more of any other stat, like a 1% increase in crit, for example. So one piece of equipment giving you a plus 7 is really good, as that's almost at the 10 point soft cap by itself. And there were very few items that gave weapon skills, let alone the maximum amount possible for three separate weapons. In the game files, there's a series of items called Of Proficiency, which are random items that give weapon skills as one of their stats. Kind of like how items of strength would give an increase in strength, or items of the bear would give an increase in strength and stamina and so on. It was supposed to be the name of a series of random items that just had weapon skills on them, except for the fact that they were never actually added to the game. They just existed in the game files and could even be linked to through macros, as they were fully programmed and set up. And these weapon skill bonuses on of proficiency items would go from plus 1 all the way up to plus 7, meaning plus 7 was the maximum amount you could get on a piece of equipment. And because of these of proficiency items, we know that the Edge Master's handguards have the maximum amount for those three weapon types. Now the Edge Master handguards are an epic world drop, meaning it's almost impossible to farm out a pair for yourself, and you're just going to have to fork over a ton of gold on the auction house in order to buy some, if they're even available. So while these gloves might be really good and best in slot for some classes until way later raid tiers, don't expect to see too many people having these gloves on the classic servers. Expect to only see these gloves on people who are either really lucky, really rich, or really hardcore. In World of Warcraft, there are two qualities of gear that aren't supposed to have stats on them, and those are the poor and common quality, or the gray and white items. Gear doesn't start getting stats on them until green quality, or uncommon. But throughout the course of WoW's history, there have been some pieces of common quality gear that did have extra stats on them similar to green quality and above. Although I'm not sure that's the case anymore. One of the more famous pieces of white quality equipment with stats was the Battered Viking Shield, which dropped off of Olaf and Uldemon. The shield gave an additional 8 stamina and 4 spirit despite the fact that most white items did not give any extra stats like this. Usually they only give armor and nothing else, so the battered viking shield was quite the oddity, and was most likely the only white item in the game with stats on it, until patch 2.3 when they upgraded the quality of the shield from common to rare, completely skipping uncommon quality. And this upgrade made sense since it did drop off of a mob in a dungeon, and generally special drops from dungeons are rare quality. And there wasn't really a reason for this item to have stats while being uncommon, 
but Vanilla WoW gear had all kinds of crazy stats on them, and some pieces of equipment even had Negata stats. So it wasn't too weird and kind of fit into how everything was weird. And if anything, I assume there was just a mistake with the shield. It was meant to be a higher quality, or it wasn't meant to have stats on it. Or it was meant to be a quest item, as quest items are most of the time common quality. And a lot of quests in Vanilla WoW required you to equip a weapon or something in order to accept a quest. Although even then, those special quest items didn't have stats on them. So the shield didn't really make sense, but also wasn't the last time they had white gear with stats on them. In Wrath of the Lich King, they introduced a vendor called Warsmith Sikfina, who sold five pieces of equipment, four weapons and one shield. All of this equipment was common quality, yet all of the weapons had an extra stat on them. The weapons all had a damage proc effect, where every time they hit with the weapon, it also did extra frost damage. And unlike normal weapon proc effects, this one happened every time you hit instead of a chance on hit. So I assume that's why they made these white item weapons, because it just added extra damage with every attack, and they thought to balance it out by lowering the quality of the weapons. That's just one theory, however. These weapons were also incredibly useful because you could sell them on the auction house since none of them were bind on pickup. And what made these weapons so useful was farming Physidius in AQ40, a boss which required both frost and physical damage in order to kill. So if you were playing a class like a warlock who had zero frost or physical damage, you could equip one of these weapons in order to gain both of those. And you could also go to the auction house to buy one of these weapons. And they were the best in slot weapons for Iron Man challenges where part of the rules is you can't equip any green items or above. And since these are all technically white quality items, they were legal for the challenge even though they had special effects. But then in Legion, Blizzard upped the quality of all of the weapons in the shield to green quality, which also changed them to bind on pickup, so they can no longer be sold on the auction house. Most of them kept the exact same effects they had, where they still did frost damage on each attack. Except one of the weapons got the frost proc removed, and instead was given normal stats for some reason. And I'm not really sure why these items had their quality increased, as it didn't really seem necessary, but it was most likely another fix like they did with the battered viking shield. But this wasn't the end for white quality items with stats. When Blizzard did their first stat squish, and changed all of the stats on gear to compensate, there were a lot of reports of white quality items from quests incorrectly having stats on them. So what probably happened was whatever formula they used to downgrade the stats and all the gear in the world probably applied stats to certain item levels of gear, and accidentally gave stats to some quest reward items that were common quality, where normally they'd have no stats at all. Eventually though, all of these items were fixed, and none of them no longer have stats on them. And as far as I know, that's the end of the story for common quality items having stats on them. I don't think there are any other white quality items in the game with stats on them anymore, as all of them were either fixed to no longer have stats, or they were upgraded in quality like the shield and weapons. Which keeps things consistent I guess, but as someone who really enjoys the Iron Man challenge, I wasn't the biggest fan of the weapon changes. In Vanilla WoW there were a few items which had negative stats on them. Most of the time the negative stats was just stamina, but a few of them gave negatives and other things as well. In this video, we'll talk about negative stats on items, why they existed in vanilla, and why they didn't continue this trend going forward. Now, the biggest reason why Vanilla WoW had negative stats on items is because that was a classic RPG trope. It was very common for RPG games and fantasy stories to have corrupted or cursed items, which gave you powerful bonuses at some kind of drawback, with the most iconic one probably being the Ring of Power from The Lord of the Rings. In The Lord of the Rings, the One Ring gave you the ability to go invisible, but at the cost of slowly driving you mad, and a whole bunch of other negative side effects and benefits as well. So negative stats on items, in which there is already negative effects on some powerful abilities, just made sense. Like for example, the vanilla item Skull of Impending Doom. It was an offhand weapon that increased your run speed by 60% for 10 seconds, but at the cost of draining your health and mana while active. An item with a powerful effect that had a downside to it. So items with negative stats just seem like the natural conclusion to this fantasy trope. Like for example, the Shriveled Heart. It's a neck item which gives 13 stamina, but at the cost of negative 5 spirit and strength. If you're playing a class which doesn't need those two stats, that could be a decent stamina boost. Although that's not really a good example. 
You might be more familiar with the most famous item that had negative stats, known as the Corrupted Ashbringer. This item completely fits the trope of powerful items at a cost. The Ashbringer was one of the strongest weapons in the game, had a good on-use effect and some extra effects out in the open world. Scarlet Crusade members would see you as friendly, all at the cost of negative 25 stamina on the weapon. And since this weapon was removed with the Wrath of the Lich King, it's one of the rarest weapons in the game. Other MMOs at the time also had gear with negative stats on them, including EverQuest, so no one really batted an eye at them at the time. But there might have been another reason why gear with negative stats existed. In the WoW Diary book, one of the vanilla WoW developers talks about how they had a philosophy of adding intentionally bad items to the game in order to make good items look much better in comparison. A very common practice done in card games to give the very strong cards better value when compared to all the intentionally bad cards, but it's not really something that happens very often in RPG video games. The book also talks about how they didn't really embrace this philosophy fully, and just kind of dropped it eventually. So that could be a factor in why gear with negative stats existed, but it's much more likely the gear was just a homage to the corrupted or cursed item trope, which is very prevalent in RPG fantasy games, books, and movies. And if you take a look at items which have negative stats on them, this is a very easy conclusion to come to. So let's go over basically all of the negative stat items. For one, you have the Corrupted Ashbringer, which is pretty obvious. Even the Shriveled Heart could be seen as a cursed item, as you're gaining stats from someone else's body parts, which is taboo. The Ring of Scorn gave negative 3 spirit, and was a reward item from getting revenge on the guy who killed a Forsaken's wife. The Doomsayer's robes had negative 10 stamina and was a reward from the first part of the quest chain which ultimately rewarded the Skull of Impending Doom, an item I talked about earlier which drained your health and mana in order to run faster. Which thematically fits, as of course the Doomsayer robes would give you negative stats as the whole quest chain was about getting a cursed item. The Cursed Eye of Palath was an offhand item which gave negative 3 stamina, and has cursed in its name, and is a reward from a quest chain that has to do with finding a cursed item. Corruption, a sword which gave negative 40 spirit, with corruption in its name. Cloak of Rot, which gave negative 5 stamina, and has rot in its name. The Black Widow Ban was a ring item that gave negative stats for stamina, which is just a drop from a spider, and thematically, could easily be reason that you're gaining the plus 7 intellect at the cost of some of your health from like a spider bite or something. The Cowl of Necromancy is kind of in the similar vein, in that it has negative 4 stamina, but gives you 15 intellect on a level 31 item, and is related to necromancy, which is usually a dark art in most RPG games, including World of Warcraft. So as you can see, nearly all of the negative stat items are related to cursed, dark magic, or taboo items. So thematically, it makes sense why they all had negative stats. Of course, there were also a few negative stat items that didn't really fit this trope, like the Fletcher's Gloves which were just a leatherworking crafted item that had negative 1% parry chance, but gave you an increased 1% crit chance with missile weapons, which was later changed to negative stamina stat instead of a negative parry chance. Although these gloves do kind of make sense thematically as well, giving up some of your defenses in order to have better attack power. But after Vanilla WoW, there were no more negative stat items added to the game, and then all of the negative stat items were removed in Cataclysm with the Old World revamp. So why didn't Blizzard continue the trend of cursed or corrupted items with negative stats? The answer to that is basically just how they did stats in Vanilla WoW in general. Stats in Vanilla WoW were completely different to how they were in, say, the Burning Crusade. Items didn't have haste rating, crit rating, dodge rating. Items would just straight up give you a 1% chance to crit, a 1% chance to dodge, a 1% chance to hit, etc. It was in the Burning Crusade that they added the Raiding stat, which would add up to then give you maybe 1% chance to dodge or crit, once you got to an appropriate amount of that stat. Also, stamina used to be budgeted into an item's stats, along with all of the attack power increasing abilities. Today, stamina is just on pieces of gear alongside armor and your main stat boost as your primary stats. And then a piece of gear will budget out your secondary stats, unrelated to the primaries. But in Vanilla WoW, there were no primary stats, and all of the stats were budgeted together, except for armor. So if something had stamina on it, that means it had less damaging stats, or healing stats, than a similar level piece of gear that didn't have stamina on it, as it was taking away some of that gear's budgeted stats for that stamina. 
So, some DPS classes could bring a set of glass cannon gear with no stamina on it that did a lot more damage. But with how raids and dungeons worked back then, that wasn't a good idea, as it meant you would die more often as well. And then there was a whole bunch of other secondary stats that don't even exist today. And that's how you have an environment in which negative stats were acceptable. Once stats started to be more streamlined and less random, where pieces of gear had main stats and then budgeted secondary stats, negative stats don't really fit into that format of gear. So if they wanted to add an item that had some kind of negative effect, it would just be added to a special weapon or item, like the trinket Whispers in the Dark, which was a haste trinket that gave you a really good haste proc for 12 seconds, but at the downside of after that proc ended, it would then decrease your haste for 8 seconds. And this trinket was released not too long ago in Legion, as it was a drop from Gul'dan in the Nighthold. So Blizzard is still willing to put out items that have negative effects. They've just kind of moved away from putting negative stats directly on pieces of equipment. And that's why negative stats was only a vanilla thing, and will most likely stay a vanilla thing. Now, if you play a Red Paladin in Vanilla WoW, and if you're not fighting an undead, you only have one damaging ability, until the target goes below 20% health anyway, in which case you'll gain access to a second damaging ability. The way Red Pallies do most of their damage is through their seal system, which buffs their auto attacks and does different things depending if you consume it with your judgment ability, which is their only damaging move, which requires you to have a seal active in order for it to work. So basically, a Red Paladin's DPS revolves around activating a seal, using judgment to consume that seal to do its unique effect, and then reapplying another seal to buff your auto attack damage while you wait for judgment to come off cooldown. And that's basically how Red Paladins played. They just waited around for judgment to come off cooldown, as they couldn't really do anything else damage-wise, Unless they also wanted to use their AoE ability on single target, or if they were fighting undead. In which case, they gain access to two new abilities, called Exorcism and Holy Wrath. Now, this may surprise you to hear, but this version of the Ret Paladin wasn't added to the game until two weeks before the game went live. So basically, completely untested and added in at the last second. Because during the beta, Red Paladins had a little bit more to do than just activate a seal and use Judgment. Red Paladins had two more damaging abilities called Crusader Strike and Holy Strike. Holy Strike was basically the Paladin version of the warrior ability Heroic Strike, where it would turn your next weapon swing into a harder hitting attack. But Holy Strike turned all that damage into pure holy damage, which meant it bypassed armor and was actually really good. And Crusader Strike is an ability Paladins have in the live version of the game, and they basically have had the ability ever since it was given back to them at the beginning of the Burning Crusade. And what Crusader Strike did in WoW's beta was it would do instant damage and then put a debuff on the target which would increase the holy damage they took for the next 30 seconds. And this debuff would stack up to 5 times. And Crusader Strike did not have a cooldown. So Paladins actually had a spammable damaging move as well as a decent holy damage ability on a 10 second cooldown with Holy Strike, which would hit harder the more stacks of Crusader Strike you had up on the target. And this version of the Paladin in the beta was actually pretty good, and did decent damage, unlike how a baseline Red Paladin played in Classic WoW, where they were one of the lowest DPS classes in the game. So, why did Blizzard remove Crusader Strike and Holy Strike, and then basically give them nothing to replace their only damaging abilities? Well, there are some theories and rumors about this, and I plan on going over both of them. First up, mechanically speaking, these two abilities were removed from the game because they just made the Paladin go oom incredibly quickly. Both Crusader Strike and Holy Strike cost mana to use, and caster classes in Vanilla WoW had to worry about their mana. So, they had to be careful about which abilities they could spam before running out of mana. And while Paladins did good damage with these two abilities, Having a spammable Crusader Strike caused them to run out of mana a little bit too quickly, and the Vanilla WoW class design was absolutely not about making the mana cost lower, as there were a couple of other classes in the game who were unviable because they also had so much mana problems. So many people theorize the reason they converted Red Paladins into the auto attack version they got for Vanilla WoW was a band-aid way of solving the mana issue that Crusader Strike brought up. If the Paladin only needs to use one ability every 8 seconds in order to do damage, 
then they don't have to worry about mana as much for their DPS. Regardless of the fact that this promoted a style of gameplay which wasn't as fun as what Crusader Strike and Holy Strike might have brought about. And there was also the debuff limit. Vanilla WoW only had an 8 debuff slot limit, which was later increased to 16, which is what we have at the start of Classic WoW. And if the Paladin's main damaging ability, Crusader Strike, required them to take up one of these debuff slots, then Paladins wouldn't be able to use their main damaging ability in raids anyway, and they'd be stuck with only Holy Strike every 10 seconds. Because in beta, when Paladins had both Crusader Strike and Holy Strike, Judgment and Seals didn't really exist in the way they did in Vanilla WoW. Beta Judgment was literally just Holy Wrath, where it was an AoE that only worked in Undeads. And when they changed the Paladin class to how it eventually worked in Vanilla WoW, they changed Judgment into the 8 second cooldown ability, which consumed Seals in order to do damage. And then they just added in Holy Wrath, which had Judgment's old effect. And the Seal system was completely added to the game along with this Judgment change, where the seal system in Vanilla WoW requires you to activate a short-term buff on yourself, which is usually about 30 seconds, and then you consume that 30-second buff with your judgment in order to do damage, and other various effects. And while that 30-second buff is on you, it gives you an auto-attack buff, which does various things depending on which seal you're using. And the things in Beta WoW, which were called seals, were just changed into the blessings, which is kind of confusing to explain in this video, but to make it as simple as possible, they completely created the seal mechanic from scratch at the start of Vanilla WoW, and then for some reason gave it a naming convention after another set of abilities that Paladins already had. That functions nothing like how the seal mechanic works. Anyways, since they didn't have the seal and judgment mechanic alongside Crusader Strike and Holy Strike, they never really got to test how that would function for the class, allowing them to have three damaging abilities that they would then use regularly along with the auto attack buff from seals. Considering that system would still have the mana problems and the debuff slot limit problem, I can see why they decided to simplify things for themselves and just give them the auto attack thing instead, so that paladins could focus on being buff bots. You see, paladin buffs were really good, but they only lasted for 5 minutes, and you can only place one on a person at a time. So having a paladin in your raid meant everyone else in your raid could do more damage and healing. But that also meant the Paladin spent most of their global cooldowns just buffing everyone else, making them one of the only pure support classes to exist in the game. Which could be another big reason why they were changed to focus on auto attacks instead of having an active rotation with Crusader Strike. Because they wanted the Paladin to use those global cooldowns on buffing the raid instead of using them on damaging moves. Of course, the seal mechanic wasn't a huge success either, as it was all but removed after Vanilla WoW since, while it did have a few fans, it wasn't very good, and I'm sure everyone probably would have liked it more if it just did a little bit more damage or, you know, was a little bit more involved than having to press two buttons every eight seconds. So if you go back and watch any beta footage of World of Warcraft that has paladins in it, you can actually see Crusader Strike on the debuff bar of the video I'm showing right now, as a shaman is going out and fighting a paladin in the open world, and you can see the Crusader Strike debuff on him as he's killing the higher level paladin. But Vanilla WoW was already taking a long time to come out. It was in development for five years before they launched, so they started just rushing things towards the end, but it's kind of a wonder why they decided to make such a drastic change to the paladin class two weeks before the game launched which kind of segues into this next section of the video. Now, outside of the mechanical reasons that people theorize, these aren't, you know, confirmed in any way, about why they removed Crusader Strike and Holy Strike, there's also the rumors of two game developers joining around the same time the SEAL system was added. Two famous EverQuest players named Furrer and Tiggle joined the WoW development team at around the time Paladins got this drastic change to their damaging rotation. And the change to the Paladin class was so last second that even in the official Vanilla WoW guide, which was sold in stores, they featured the Paladin old class systems, including Crusader Strike, Holy Strike, and calling their blessings Seals. And you see, these two players were infamous for absolutely hating hybrid classes, to the point where they would stage protests in-game whenever they found out a hybrid class was doing anything except being a buff bot 
or something like that. They just really didn't like the fact that a hybrid class could do as much damage as a pure DPS class, and they were well known for wanting hybrid classes to basically be terrible as a tax for being able to do a whole bunch of different things. Which would make sense why Paladins lost their fun rotation as soon as they joined and were given the infamous seal system for Vanilla WoW. Although I'd call these just rumors instead of what actually happened, because there isn't confirmation this is why it happened. And in fact, Ghostcrawler is largely credited with changing Paladins to how they were in Vanilla WoW. And Ghostcrawler is also the person who wanted hybrid classes to perform just as well as pure DPS classes. So what probably happened was Ghostcrawler just wanted to try out this change with the Paladins and see how it worked. Saw that it failed in Vanilla WoW, and then changed his philosophy going forward to try to push all classes to basically being equal. So, all that being said, there's not too much credit to the Furrer or Tiggle changing Vanilla WoW Paladins into a garbage spec. Although this wouldn't be a video about beta ret Paladins without mentioning this very famous rumor. I just couldn't find any confirmation for any of these rumors besides lots of speculations on forums and stuff. Which is usually the case for very famous WoW rumors. So there you have it. The reason Paladins only had one damaging ability was because it was given to them at the last second without any kind of testing like all the other classes got, as well as a whole bunch of rumors and theories as to why they made this decision in the first place. After Vanilla WoW, Blizzard changed Paladins to no longer be buff bots. They allowed them to actually tank and gave them competitive DPS. Arguably, um, it was much better than it was in Vanilla WoW though. Did you know that there were plans to have a huge server-wide questline for Warlocks similar to the AQ event? The event would have involved Warlock players needing to perform a global collection effort to rebuild Medivh's spellbook, and after they completed that, they would perform a group ritual to open the Dark Portal, while players on the server protected them from enemy attacks. Now, the source for all this was from an interview from a Vanilla WoW developer, and the main reason why they cut this was because of the AQ Opening the Gates event. Because you see, they did something similar to this with the opening of On Courage, where players could go on a massive quest line, literally the biggest quest line in the game's history, which also required the server to contribute a whole bunch of supplies, which would culminate into ringing the gong that opened the gates to the raid instance. And during the opening of the gates, there would be a server-wide event for 10 hours, where elite monsters would pour through the portal and overrun the zone of Silithus and there would be bosses that drop loot, so there was many players scrambling to kill as many of them as possible in the time allotted to them. And there was also crystals that spawned around the world, which would spawn mobs and bosses that also dropped loot. So everyone in the world participated in this event. And it was worth participating as you could get gear from it. Now, this all sounds great, but the reason why they never did something like this ever again was because this completely crashed servers while the event was going on. Because you see, this event was a limited time thing, and could only happen one time per server. So you had 10 hours to do this one event, otherwise you'd never be able to do it again. And under those kinds of time constraints, pretty much everyone tried to participate if they could. And the servers weren't really built to have that many people in one zone at a time. Or just that many people online at the same time killing a whole bunch of monsters. So most servers were basically just unplayable during the opening of the gates, which kind of killed the whole point of the event being a limited time anyway, as if you couldn't log in to do the event, or if you got disconnected every time you tried to get closer to Syllabus, then the event was basically wasted on you anyway. And since the opening of the gates was such a disaster from a developer point of view, players still love the event and think fondly back to it to this day, but Blizzard doesn't like it when people aren't able to play the game due to hardware limitations. So they weren't happy with the event, and they never tried anything like it again. And even cancelled the planned Warlock event, which most likely would have been the event for the launch of the Burning Crusade, but they just didn't have the hardware to do something like that again, so they just scrapped it. In some of the early beta builds of WoW, there were dark portal placeholders in random parts of the world, including one located underwater off the coast of Ajara. For many years, the WoW community theorized that Blizzard was just using the dark portal as a placeholder for dungeons, raids, or battleground entrances. Basically, since the Dark Portal is placed in so many different parts of the world at random, which ended up being near those kinds of entrances anyway, it was a pretty safe assumption to make. And the only placeholder that didn't really make sense was the one located underwater. But they did have a planned battleground in that zone, and it was heavily Naga-based, so 
A lot of people just thought it was a placeholder for the entrance to that battleground. But then, with the WoW Diary book, we found that those were not placeholders for dungeon entrances at all, and were actually potential locations for the Dark Portal to be placed. Now, I mentioned this in a previous video briefly, and a lot of people were very apprehensive about that explanation, and insisted that they were actually just placeholders, because the Dark Portal has a very set location in lore already that predates Vanilla WoW. But here's the thing with how they created Vanilla WoW. They were very flexible with the lore and the zone layouts. They were absolutely willing to move the Dark Portal somewhere else if they thought it was cooler. And a lot of the lore of zones was done by other people besides Chris Metzen, who basically wrote most of WoW's lore, and was being designed alongside Warcraft 3 in the early stages, so their lore could be changed at a moment's notice. Taking a quote from the WoW Diary, Chris Metzen and the art team only vaguely knew the level ranges, which were finalized only in the last year of development. In this fluid state of indecision, even major lore objects like the Dark Portal bounced around. Chris decided to move it out of the Tree of Life area, no one on the team called it Tedrasil, letting the World Tree become its own area. He planned to move the Dark Portal to Ajara because the game designers were thinking of making it a high level area anyway, and it was also cool to have the Dark Portal submerged in water. Eventually, Chris decided on putting it in the Blasted Lands because there wasn't really anything else interesting going on there. So, based on this quote, the Dark Portal could have absolutely ended up underwater, as I think that's even where they had it in the Warcraft movie. So, it is an idea that Blizzard liked, but ultimately they just put it in the Blasted Lands, partly because there's nothing else going on there, but I think it's also partly because that's just kind of where it was supposed to be located in lore previously anyway and they just decided to not move the Dark Portal somewhere else. They also eventually ended up scrapping the battleground in Ajar anyway, and they also converted Tedrasil into the Night Elf starting zone instead of making it into some kind of max level zone, or an entrance to the Dark Portal. Alright, and that's it for this little micro fact about WoW. I know I've covered this topic briefly in another video before, but I thought it'd be a good idea to expand upon it a little bit more, as a lot of people just straight up didn't believe me in the other video. Another thing John Stat says in the book is that many players have theories and ideas about why a lot of things happened in World of Warcraft, and like 99% of them were wrong, and a lot of decisions were done on whims or for pretty mundane reasons actually. For some very dedicated wall jumpers and explorers in Vanilla WoW, they were able to discover an early version of Hellfire Peninsula, which was the first zone in the Burning Crusade expansion which led many people to believe that Blizzard had planned to add Outland to Vanilla WoW instead of it being its own expansion. And there's even some videos online of people exploring the area, and it seems like there's a lot that was done, and a lot of its inspirations were used with the actual Hellfire Peninsula. But, according to an interview with a Vanilla WoW developer, that early Hellfire map was most likely just someone playing around with assets as they never had any plans to add it to Vanilla WoW. And in fact, they didn't even really want to go to Outlands as their first expansion. The first expansion they wanted to have was the South Seas, with pirates and stuff because the Pirates of the Caribbean movies came out and were super popular at the time. So we could have gotten the BFA expansion, with players going to Kul Taras and Zandalar, as the first expansion, rather than like, the seventh. And the reason they didn't do that was because of hardware limitations. They literally couldn't add any more maps to the original world map, so they had to create another world tab, which is the main reason why they decided to go with Outlands. That way, they could just put it all in its own world tab, and they could just have players teleport to it when they went to the zones. As if you didn't know, all of Outlands is on the same map as the Blood Elf and Draenei starting zones. If you're able to go out of bounds and go way far into the fatigue zone, you could potentially fly into the Blood Elf starting zone, the Ghostland, or the Drenai starting zone and its extended zone afterwards. Basically, all of the zones added in the Burning Crusade took place on this one world map, because they just didn't have the hardware to put them on their own yet. Now, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on this, but apparently this was the best way for them to do it at the time. Eventually, they got server upgrades where this was no longer a big deal, and that's why the next expansion took place in Northrend, which is another map on the Azeroth map, and then they didn't really have the limitations on the Azeroth map after that, so they eventually did the South Seas expansion, which is the current expansion we're in right now, basically. Now, it's a wonder why this never-used version of Hellfire Peninsula snuck its way into the game, 
But hey, they did have the developer playgrounds in the game files as well, that you could technically get to if you were very creative about using game mechanics, or exploiting. So it's not too far-fetched to believe that the Hellfire Peninsula map was also just one of those assets. Although it is kind of hard to believe that they had no plans to add Outland maps, considering they did have plans for the Emerald Dream, which was also a cut thing that they couldn't do correctly. But apparently they had no such plans for Outlands of Vanilla WoW, and Outlands wasn't even their first choice as an expansion. The quest will be available at level 16, and send you to remote parts of the world to gather things, and druids do not get travel form until level 30, nor mounts until 40, so you have to walk everywhere on foot. No matter which faction you start on, both will send you to Moonglade for the first part of the quest. Druids learn to teleport to Moonglade at level 10, so this is no problem. Once at Moonglade, you'll be asked to retrieve a bauble from the bottom of the lake, and be given a 30 minute timer to complete the task. This one's pretty easy, as all you do is go to the lake in the middle of the zone, swim to the bottom, and then get the item needed. Then you have to head over to Remulus and use the bauble which completes the quest. After that, you turn it into the quest giver who is right next to Remulus. She will then send you on to the next part of the quest, which is to collect two halves of the Pendant of the Sea Lion. But she won't tell you where they are, and instead tells you to talk to the locals in Moonglade to find their locations. Eventually, you'll find out that one is located in Darkshore, and the other is located in Westfall. The Darkshore one is probably the easiest, as you can just take the flight path from Moonglade to Aberdyne, and then run north to the location. After swimming for a bit, you'll come into contact with two large rocks, and a bunch of level 17 and 13 thrashers swimming around them. If doing this at level, you'll have to be careful to avoid them or only fight one at a time. But it's a relatively short swim down for the item you need. Assuming you knew where it was, mind you. Remember, it was intended for you to figure out where these items were located by asking NPCs for clues and figuring it out for yourself. Which I imagine was quite difficult, as this is kind of a farish swim from shore. Now, for the next part, Westfall. Getting to Westfall for the first time as a night elf on foot was probably the most time consuming part of this process. So, what you had to do was go back to Aberdyne and go to the docks, and then take the boat to Menethil Harbor. Later on in WoW, this boat was changed to go to Stormwind, but in Vanilla WoW, it was to Menethil in the wetlands. Once you got there, you were going to have to run through the wetlands, which was a level 20-ish zone. So there were tons of nearly level 20 mobs everywhere, which at level 16 did give you some trouble. So you had to be careful as you ran across the wetlands to Dun Algas, a little mountain path needed to get to Dun Moreau. And in the mountain path were level 20 orc guards, who were almost impossible to avoid and could kill you easily if you weren't very careful. But once you got past that and made it to Den Moreau, all you had to do was run to Ironforge and then take the tram to Stormwind. From Stormwind, you could run through Elwynn Forest down to Westfall. Luckily, all of these places are in your level zone, so not as dangerous as the wetlands. Once in Westfall, you had to swim to this location on the map, which was in the fatigue zone, and you had to swim very far down to the box with the item you needed. There were also elite sharks that path this area so you had to keep high alert as they could easily kill you. It was very easy to die of fatigue when you got too close to it too. But luckily, there was an air bubble fissure right next to the lockbox that you could swim to instead to regather your air, and then get the item from the box. Once you got the item, you could then simply teleport back to Moonglade and turn in the quest. And now you know how to use aquatic form, which ironically, would have been very useful for doing the quest, and is incredibly useless outside of it, as most things did not take place in water in Vanilla WoW. Now, for the Horde version, it was a lot easier. The first part was the same as the Alliance version, in that you had to swim to the bottom of the lake in Moonglade and get the item within 30 minutes. Then you had to ask around for clues as to where you could find the two pieces for the next part of the quest. One was located in the north of the Barrens, in the middle of the little sludge pool, with the only thing to look out for was an elite sludge that path nearby, which was easily avoided. The next item was a lot harder to find and was located off the coast of Silver Pine Forest. So you needed to run to Orgrimmar, take the Zeppelin to Undercity, and then run to this point on the map. 
The only real indicator of where the box is located for people who didn't know exactly where to go was to look at the shipwreck boat on the shore and then swim directly out from that point and hit the edge of the fatigue zone and then swim down. Then, once you got the item, either res if you died of fatigue or drowning damage and then teleport to Moonglade to turn it in and you're done. No running halfway across the world through high level zones like the Alliance counterpart. So, it was much easier. And that's it for as far as the aquatic form quests go. On a scale of harder than the water totem class quests, I'd give this one a 7 water totems out of 10. Call of Water was infinitely more terrible than this one, but that doesn't mean it wasn't still a pain in the ass nonetheless, especially the Alliance portion. Eventually, Blizzard changed the boat in Darkshore to go to Stormwind instead of the Wetlands, which made the Alliance portion just as easy as the Horde counterpart, so it was nerfed a little bit later on. But it was still a lot of traveling for a low-level quest that gave you arguably your most useless form, especially since you had to walk the whole way. When the WoW developers were first planning out which classes players would be allowed to play, Druids were not on that original shortlist. But Blizzard did have nine classes planned in the original list. Basically, Warriors, Paladins, Shamans, Priests, Hunters, Mages, and Warlocks were all in the design table from the beginning. And in addition to those seven, they also had Assassins and Rune Masters. Assassins eventually got converted into Rogues, as they even have a spec called Assassination, and Rune Masters were never actually added to the game. Now, the idea behind Rune Masters was to have an unarmed fighter who had runes on their body, which gave them magical properties. And they were kind of like an enchanter, but a whole class based around enchanting their bodies in order to do magic or physical feats. And they had even planned on having Rune Masters being one of the hero classes once they eventually decided to not include it in vanilla. And he would be alongside the Death Knights and Necromancers. And that also means they had planned on adding Necromancers to the game at some point, just as a hero class which was supposed to be better than normal classes. So they never actually went with Rune Masters, but they did like the ideas behind some of its flavor. So they kind of split it up into the Death Knight and Monk classes that were eventually added. Death Knights have a rune system to use their magic, similar to how they wanted Rune Masters to work, and Monks are an unarmed class, who do basically the other side of what Rune Masters were supposed to be. And then they eventually just added Druids, because that's a fantasy staple, and there were already some pretty notable lore figures that are Druids, so it only made sense for them to add them. And funny enough, Druids were not the last class added into the game, or programmed in anyway. They just weren't on the original design table for classes, Hunters were actually the last class to be added, or programmed into the game, and even then, they only barely made it in. And their design philosophy with druids was that they wanted them to shapeshift a whole bunch, so they gave druids a whole bunch of abilities that could only be used in their various shapeshifting forms. And they'd intended for players to be constantly shapeshifting in battle in order to do their full rotations and stuff. But there was one little caveat to this that they had kind of overlooked. Um, shapeshifting cost way too much mana to do that. And the final talent point in their Feral Tree for a time was a talent that reduced the shapeshifting cost by 25%. Which did not alleviate this problem at all, I might add. Shapeshifting still cost a ton of mana, but Blizzard was happy if a class was good at at least one role in a raid. And Druids could function as a healer in raids, as they gave innervates to Priest or other healers, so they considered them good to go, even if the design philosophy they were supposed to be doing in raids didn't actually work. You know, the whole shapeshifting a whole bunch of things. Eventually, later on in the game's history, they did a much better job of encouraging druids to shapeshift more in combat, but generally only in PvP, as PvP players would shift into bear form in order to tank damage or to use their stun ability, and then shift into travel form to run away or go behind pillars, then go into human form to heal up. So if you want the true shapeshifting druid fantasy, you kind of have to play PvP for it, as in raids and dungeons you basically just stay in one form the whole time. If you've ever run Blackrock Depths in Classic WoW, you'll know that the dungeon is massive, probably the biggest dungeon in the game, and it even has the raid entrance to Molten Core inside of it. But did you know they had plans to make it even bigger? In the Dark Iron Highway section of the dungeon, there's a boss at the end of the road in front of a big unused door called Belgar, and the door was put there as an excuse to have a road leading to the city. The thought was that, what was behind it might eventually be turned into another raid. 
and in the Boss Dungeon Journal, it says, The monstrous molten giant Belgar lumbers across the Dark Iron Highway, a stunning feat of dwarven engineering carved into Blackrock Depths. Ragnaros pulled the giant from the heart of the Firelands to guard a massive sealed door at one end of the highway. According to legend, only the Fire Lord and the Dark Iron Clan's highest ranking members know what lies beyond the mysterious gate. Now currently, there is nothing behind the door, and there has never been any mention about what's actually behind it. But according to an interview with John Stats, the level designer who created Blackrock Depths, they did have plans to put something there. And that's why they had this big room leading to a door that was closed, to add mystery to the whole event for when they would eventually add the extra dungeon in this place. So why didn't they ever go back to this room and add a dungeon here? Well, because the dungeon was already too big as is. There was already so much going on in there, and there was already a raid entrance in the dungeon that the designers thought they had gone a little bit too far, and that maybe they had added too much to this one place. So adding an additional instance to the dungeon was probably not the best idea, considering they already had so much else going on in the mountain. With Blackrock Depths, the Lower and Upper Spires, plus Molten Core and the Blackwing Lair, I can see why they decided not to add an additional dungeon when they already had so much going on in the mountain, and instead prioritize those resources onto making something new. In this video, we'll go over 10 equippable items which had weird or unique effects in Vanilla WoW. And at number 10, we have the Lufa. This was a trinket which had the effect to remove one bleed effect. Now, seeing as trinkets were kind of rare and hard to get, you didn't really lose much for having this equipped. And using it to get rid of a bleed from a warrior or rogue in PvP, or the odd raid or dungeon boss who applied a bleed, was pretty good. So it was a unique trinket with an effect that was pretty useful, despite the fact it gave no other stats. Then again, a lot of trinkets in vanilla didn't really have stats on them either, and would sometimes only provide a unique effect. The trinket was easy to get too. All you had to do was complete one quest in the Searing Gorge, which required you to go around and kill 20 dinosaurs. And there originally was no limit on the bleed it would remove. So when the Burning Crusade came out, and one of the bosses in the new raid, Morose and Karazhan, used a hard-hitting bleed as one of its mechanics, tanks were using this vanilla wild trinket in order to remove it. So they added a restriction to the trinket, where it would only remove a bleed effect applied from a target level 60 or below. Because outside of this trinket, there are no ways to remove bleeds outside of a dwarf's racial ability stone form, and straight up immunity spells which remove everything. Bleeds are one of the few common dot types which can't be removed by healers. Although in Legion, they did add a homage item in the game called the Feathered Lufa. It was an item that you could create with first aid that had the effect to heal for a little bit, and remove bleed effects, but only while you're on the Broken Isles. And with the removal of first aid in BFA, this item was just added to tailors along with all other first aid crafts. And at number 9, we have the 6 Demon Back. This was an item with an on-use effect which would have one of six random effects. Three of its effects were to shoot out a spell. Two of its effects were CCs. Its last effect was to summon a fell hunter pet for you for a little bit. Of its six effects, its three spell effects were a lot more common than the other three. So every time you used it, it had a higher than normal chance to shoot a fireball, a frostbolt, which would slow the target for five seconds as well, or a chain lightning, which would chain to two other targets. And then its other three more rarer effects was a cyclone-like ability, which was just a straight up stun, a polymorph, and then the fell hunter pet summon. Since trinkets were pretty rare, and you had a good chance for its effects to just do damage, and it only had a 3 minute cooldown, this item, despite having a weird effect, wasn't half bad as far as DPS trinkets go. Obviously, there were much better ones in the game, but if you had this one, it at least had some fun effects on it if it didn't do damage. Number 8, the Gnomish Mind Control Cap. This engineering item had the effect to possibly mind control an enemy target, which would then allow you to control them like a warlock or hunter pet. But, if you already had a pet out, you would have to dismiss your pet first in order to use this ability. But there was also a few catches to it. After patch 1.11, you could only use this item on targets out of combat. Also, you had to be an engineer with a high engineering skill in order to use the item. But despite its name though, you did not need to be a gnomish engineer. 
any engineer could use this helmet. The helm had a 30 minute cooldown, so not something that could be used very often. And as probably the biggest caveat to this thing, it had a chance to fail, which was pretty common with a lot of engineering items. In fact, that's still kind of the case today. If this thing failed, it had a chance to just not do anything, or mind control yourself and put you under the control of the mob you were attempting to mind control. And because engineering items had a pretty high chance to fail in vanilla WoW, this was not used as a reliable form of CC, and instead, just kind of a fun item with occasional niche uses. Number 7, the Horned Viking Helmet. This helmet had the on use effect to charge an enemy and incapacitate them for 30 seconds, but it would also knock you down and stun you for a bit. A 30 second CC is actually an incredibly useful effect, to the point where a lot of warriors would farm the helmet in order to use it in PvP. And of course, had some niche PvE uses as well, since CC were heavily used in dungeons and raids. The helmet itself dropped from Eric the Swift in Oldemon, and is only available to Horde players as the NPC is friendly to Alliance. And since it was located inside Oldemon, a not max level dungeon, warriors could solo this place to grab it if they were smart about it as the item dropped from one of three of the Lost Vikings. So if you attacked one of them, the other two were going to join in. Soloing lower level dungeons back in Illawau was a lot harder than it is today even if you had about 20 levels on the place. And since the helmet had such a good effect, after Vanilla WoW, they gave the helmet a little restriction that it could only be used on targets level 60 and lower, basically. Number 6, Skull of Impending Doom. This was an offhand item that has the effect to increase your run speed by 60% for 10 seconds, which was a pretty good effect back when not all classes had speed increasers, and the few that did, had incredibly long cooldowns or restrictions placed on them. And the offhand only had a 3 minute cooldown, but when used, it would deal damage to you and then drain mana over its duration. So the offhand worked very similar to modern day Burning Rush, a talent that warlocks have which increase their run speed but deals damage to them while it's active. If anything, Burning Rush was probably inspired by the Skull of Impending Doom. In order to get this offhand, you had to complete a four-part quest chain, which had you go to a dungeon and around the world killing things. The quest would start in the Badlands from a dwarf, who would send you to Oldemon to grab a tablet, which despite the quest text, didn't actually require you to go inside Oldemon, as the tablet was located right outside the entrance. Then you would go to another quest giver in either Ironforge or Undercity, depending on your faction, who would then send you to Dustwalla Marsh, Stranglethorn, and the Alteric Mountains to collect three items from three elite mobs. Then you'd be sent back to the Dwarf in the Badlands and you'd receive your Skull. Even with the drawbacks of the Skull, it was still a pretty useful item just for the speed increase it gave you, and even saw some niche uses in PvP, on classes that can equip an offhand normally. For the Burning Crusade, the item received an update to drain 60% of your mana and health when you used it, instead of a fixed amount like it did in Vanilla WoW. This was most likely done so it couldn't be abused by the new health values that players had, keeping its drawback as an actual drawback to it. And then in the Cataclysm, you can no longer obtain this item. So if you have one, it still works like the TBC version to this day. And at number 5, we have the Freezing Band. This was a world drop epic ring that had a 1% chance whenever you were hit to freeze the target for 5 seconds, and inflict a little bit of frost damage. It also gave some frost resist and increased the damage of your frost spells. Now, the unique thing about this item is absolutely that on hit chance of freezing a target for 5 seconds, as this freeze was treated basically like a stun, and would just freeze them in a block of ice for 5 seconds when activated, had no internal cooldown, and did stack with another freezing band. As this ring was not unique equip, you could have two of them on at the same time to double the chances of getting freeze procs. The only thing that might have prevented this from happening though, was how you obtain this ring. It was a world drop epic item, which is about the hardest way to obtain an item in the game, as you just have to get really lucky to obtain this from a random drop. So usually, the best way to obtain one was to just buy it off the auction house for a crap ton of gold. And even then, there was no guarantees that there would be one on the auction house. But if you were very rich, and he played on his server with these being sold, 
You could obtain two of them and have fun with your enemies randomly being stunned whenever they hit you. And since the targets were treated as frozen, there was lots of synergy with Frost Mages and their Shatter Talent. And at number 4, we have the Thunder Brew Boot Flask. This was another trinket item, which had two unusual effects tied to it. The first being, when you used it, you would breathe fire for 5 seconds, which would give you a nice little AoE. And I've heard reports that this AoE could be used without a target, and wouldn't aggro nearby guards if used on low-level players and towns. Its second effect is that it would get you drunk, which could be a good or bad thing, depending on who you ask, and all on a measly 30-minute cooldown. Vanilla WoW had incredibly long cooldowns on a lot of their items for almost no reason. <laughs> that was kind of the name of the game back then. Everything had long cooldowns in other games, and if anything, WoW's cooldowns were pretty reasonable in comparison. You rarely see abilities or items with cooldowns this long today, when that was kind of the norm back then, as you may have noticed with some of the other items on the list. Now, the way to acquire this item required a lot of legwork. You had to complete a five-part cross-continental journey in order to complete the quest chain, which awarded this trinket. So let's go over it. First part of the quest chain required you to talk to a dwarf in Westfall that required you to be level 40 in order to accept the quest. Westfall was a low-level zone, so it's almost impossible you found this on your own while leveling normally, and also unlikely you found this quest when you're at max level since the quest didn't appear for low-level players or max-level players. And the quest giver himself is kind of hidden in an out-of-the-way location. This is kind of a secretive quest to accept. Anyways, the first part of the quest required you to go to Stranglethorn Vale, in the middle of a Naga camp in order to get some Holy Spring water. The second part of the quest chain required you to get three separate materials. One located in the Swamp of Sorrows, another located in Tanaris, and the last all the way in the Hinterlands. Then you'd be asked to get one true silver bar, which you could just buy off the auction house. And after that, you'd be sent on another journey, this time to Feralis in order to get a branch. And then for the final part of the quest, you'd be sent to the Searing Gorge in order to get a piece of oak. Then, after you returned to Westfall, you'd finally get your trinket. There's some speculation that this was meant to be a quest for players newly obtaining their mounts to give them a reason to run around the world with their newfound mounts. And that's why it had them go to like five different parts of the world. A speculation that was most likely entirely correct, as in the WoW Diary book, a book in which one of the WoW vanilla developers talks about what went into making the game, they do talk about how they really wanted cross-continental quests for all classes at level 40, so they'd have a reason to use their new mounts. This quest is a good example of what they had planned for every class, instead of just a few of them getting quests like this. Number 3, the Spectral Essence. This trinket has the effect to allow you to interact with ghosts inside of one town. This trinket was pretty standard for quest-like items and special effects, as trinkets in Vanilla WoW were not very commonplace and good trinkets were pretty rare, your trinket spot was usually fine to equip something there without hindering your character all that much. In order to get the trinket, you had to complete a quest which would send you into Skolomance to kill a rare elite, and burn two bodies. Then you'd get this trinket which would allow you to talk to the folks of Cyrodaro, and even buy some unique items from a vendor, which could only be seen with this trinket or the Eye of Divinity, a trinket only priests could equip that dropped from a boss in Molten Core. The trinket didn't have any stats or do anything else. This is basically just the precursor to quest items, which did special things. Blizzard would usually just put them on trinkets that you had to equip. And at number 2, we have the Dark Moon card Twisty Nether. This was a Dark Moon trinket which had the effect, which would only have a chance to activate when you died. Basically, it gave you a 10% chance to resurrect after dying, with 20% health and mana. And when the trinket resed you, it worked kind of like having a soul stone on you, in which you could choose to accept a resurrection or not. Now, seeing as this trinket only had a 10% chance, it was not at all reliable, and not really worth the trinket slot in raids or dungeons. Its uses were basically just for solo content to occasionally save you a run back to your corpse, or if you literally didn't have any other trinket. It at least had the potential to be sometimes useful in raids or dungeons. Now, this trinket didn't actually see very much use until arenas were added to the game in the Burning Crusade. 
in which people would equip this trinket in order to sometimes come back to life in an arena match, which could single-handedly help you win the game. Usually, after one person dies in arena, the team which secured the kill will basically treat it as if they've already won, and maybe let their guard down a little bit. So, seeing someone res back up real quick to join the fight is all it could really take in order to turn the tide of the battle back in your favor. And as far as I know, this trinket still works in arenas today. Maybe. I tried looking it up and couldn't really find any confirmation, but I also didn't find anything saying that it didn't. And at number one, we have the Hook of the Master Angler. This is a trinket that had the on-use effect to turn you into a fish and allow underwater breathing and an increased swim speed. Kind of like the artifact fishing pole effect, which turns you into a fish and allows you to swim faster. Except instead of having to equip something in your weapon slot, this one only required you to equip it in your trinket slot. Unusual for a trinket like this, this trinket actually didn't have a cooldown in Vanilla WoW where usually all fun abilities had incredibly long cooldowns. This one, you could just turn to a fish whenever you wanted. Well, outside of waiting 30 seconds after equipping the trinket anyway. The trinket is a reward from the Stranglethorn fishing extravaganza event and winning the grand prize. So not many people could get it, considering the event is only held once a week. And basically, only one person per server can win per week. You can still win this trinket today, but you do have to get first place in the fishing tournament, which is pretty difficult. Unless you're on a server that literally has no one else trying the tournament that week. Which is doubtful, since the tournament also has a prize for an heirloom ring item. Which is an incredibly useful item, as it gives you an extra 5% experience. And since the item is so useful, that means lots of people are still doing this tournament today in order to try to get one. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to win it. The first time I ever tried doing the tournament, I won second place. Not good enough to get this trinket, but it was good enough to get the heirloom ring, which is what I actually wanted anyway. In this video, we'll go over 10 things which existed in Vanilla WoW, but won't be in Classic WoW for one reason or another. And at number 10, we'll have the constantly changing game. This is on the number 10 spot because it's kind of obvious. In Vanilla WoW, lots of spells and abilities changed constantly over time in that one expansion. Whereas Classic WoW will be taking place in basically the last patch, after all of those changes already took place. Let's take Power Word Shield as an example. If you take a look at its Vanilla WoW only changes, you'll see that in patch 1.2, it was changed to only work on party members. As Power Word Shield is a bubble you can place on other people, which will absorb a set amount of damage. Being able to cast it on a whole raid would be pretty good, so they limited it to just party members. Then in patch 1.3, they changed it to be castable on all raid targets, making it much better. In patch 1.6, they allowed Power Word Shield to absorb damage from mana burn-like effects, which hints that it didn't work on all damage and only some forms of it. In patch 1.7, they fixed a bug that would cause Power Word Shield to heal warlocks when they had Soul Link up. In patch 1.10, they allowed Power Word Shield to actually scale from your gear, which would only increase your healing previously. As before that, it only counted as an absorb, which was technically not a heal back then. So if you count that, that was four changes and one bug fix, all before patch 1.12. In which case, Classic WoW will only have the final version of that spell. We won't be able to live through all those changes. The same could be said about some other abilities, Power Word Shield is just a good example because it had quite a few changes as they tried to figure out what they wanted it to be. And at number 9, we have Trial Accounts Being Able to Talk to People. In Vanilla WoW, if you created a Trial Account, you could talk to other players. Trial Accounts in Vanilla WoW just restricted what level you could get to, but basically allowed you to do everything else. This was changed because Gold Farmers took advantage of Trial Accounts and did all sorts of things with them. Some people might even remember how they used to use trial accounts to spell out gold farming websites with the dead bodies of those trial accounts. So of course they can't allow trial accounts to talk to people to give a classic WoW experience, because then people would just take advantage of it like they did back then. Also, I'm pretty sure trial accounts are just called starter editions now, as you can now play WoW for free up to level 20 for as long as you want. There's no longer a time limit on it, but you still can't whisper people though, unless you have them added to your friends list first. And at number 8, we have, tentatively, the Corrupted Blood Incident. 
This is tentative because Blizzard said they might recreate the Corrupted Blood incident, but in that case, it still won't really be the same. For those of you not in the know, the Corrupted Blood incident was when a player found a bug where if their pets got the Corrupted Blood debuff on them from Hakkar, they could dismiss their pet in the raid to keep that debuff, and then summon their pet back in the middle of a city, who would then spread that debuff to other players, which would instantly kill low-level players and infect the NPCs and high-level players, and then these new infected players would infect other people, until an entire city was killed. It was such a famous incident that virus researchers use it as an example of how an outbreak would affect a populated city. Of course, Blizzard fixed the bug, where the debuff could no longer be saved on pets or work outside the raid instance. So if they were to recreate the Corrupted Blood incident, I'm not sure if it would really have the same effect. People would just go around killing each other for fun, and I doubt too many people would try to have quarantine zones like they did during the original one, or try their best to stop it. Or maybe they would, I don't know. I don't really see them intentionally trying to break the game like this for a few days. But they didn't completely rule out recreating it either. And at number 7, we have the anticipation of a class patch. In Vanilla WoW, Blizzard used major patches as an excuse to try and balance one class at a time. Since a lot of the classes were unbalanced, they most likely will stay unbalanced if they're trying to keep true to Vanilla WoW. Every major patch Blizzard did attempted to fix one class, and would usually give them a whole bunch of buffs or fix abilities that no one used. And people loved waiting for the next class patch because maybe their class was going to be the one to get a whole bunch of buffs next. Unless you were a shaman, they weren't too happy about their class patch and told their community manager to get hit by a bus, which became its own infamous incident. But since Classic WoW will be starting at patch 1.12, that's after all of the class patches have already happened. And since they're trying to create the experience to be as close to 1.12 as possible, I don't see sweeping class patches happening. And at number 6, we have servers crashing constantly. You see, during the first couple of weeks of WoW, playing the game was nearly impossible because of how many people were logging in, and Blizzard wasn't expecting the game to be as popular as it turned out to be. They didn't have stable servers to fit all the demand they had for the game, and even then, they still worked on their servers over time to try to make them better and better, and with them testing out stress test stuff during the Classic WoW beta already, and with how smooth the launch of BFA had, it's pretty safe to assume there will be very few server crashes once the game actually goes live. Which, while that may make it a better play and experience, that's something that was a common occurrence in Vanilla WoW, which will probably not be in Classic. Number 5. Debuff Drop-Offs Now, for those of you who don't know what this is, it's applying a whole bunch of debuffs to yourself intentionally, in order to force yourself to reach the debuff cap, which would then force off a debuff that you didn't want on your character anymore. To give an example of this working in a beneficial way, back in AQ40, while players were fighting C'Thun, they could bring out the non-combat pet, the Disgusting Oozling, who when summoned would give you a minor debuff that lowered your nature resistance. So if you dismissed and resummoned this pet multiple times, you could stack this debuff on yourself near infinitely and drop off any debuff you didn't want on yourself. So if used in the stomach room of C'Thun, you could use it to drop off the stacking debuff and stay in that room for as long as you wanted, as the mechanics of that fight made it so that you could only stay there for a limited amount of time. Or if you were tanking Valistraz the Corrupt and Blackwing Lair, and didn't want your tank to die instantly to the debuff, you could have a whole bunch of priests use Mind Vision on the warrior, along with a few disgusting oozling summons to fill up your debuff slot and drop off the instant kill debuff. Now, Blizzard never intended for people to be able to drop off debuffs in this way, so they did eventually fix these things in vanilla, and that's why debuff drop-offs won't exist in Classic. It was basically a bug, and they're going to be fixing bugs. And at number 4, we have Front Stabbing. Front Stabbing is a term for rogues being able to use their ability Backstab, or other abilities that require you to be behind your target, while in front of your target. You see, front stabbing was possible because of the old Blizzard servers, where if you got close enough to the hitbox of a target player or NPC, you could just strafe back and forth constantly while spamming your backstab ability. And because of the server lag, sometimes your target wouldn't register as being in front of you, and instead register as having its back turned to you, 
but only for a split second. So if you were spamming backstab, the ability would go through during that split second. And because of this, you could use backstab in solo PvE situations, where usually that would be almost impossible without either being stealth or CCing the target to get behind them. But in Classic WoW, they're going to be running on modern clients, that's trying to simulate the look of Classic WoW without the back engine of Classic WoW. So unless Blizzard specifically designs the game to have front stabbing in it, because they are specifically designing the game for other old school mechanics similar to this, then front stabbing won't be in Classic WoW because the servers are too good for it to be in by accident. And you'd have to go to illegal servers to get some good old fashioned crappy server lag in order to front stab properly. And at number three, we have the original epic mounts. Before patch 1.4, the epic ground speed mounts, or the ones which gave you 100% run speed increase instead of 60%, were just different colors of the 60% speed mounts. So in patch 1.4, they added the new armored versions of them and then removed the different color versions that existed previously, with an option to trade in one of the old ones for one of the new ones. So people who kept the mounts from before patch 1.4 now have some of the rarest mounts in the game possible, as they were only available for a short time at the beginning of WoW, and are no longer obtainable. But since Classic WoW be launched at 1.12, this is way past the cutoff point for getting the original epic mounts, so players won't be able to buy these incredibly rare mounts like vanilla players had the chance to. And at number 2, we have the Supremacy of the Slow Weapons. These will not be in Classic WoW because weapon speeds were normalized in patch 1.8. For those of you who don't know what weapon speed normalization is, basically before patch 1.8, lots of abilities would do damage based on the maximum damage of your currently equipped weapon. So if you use an ability like Mortal Strike for example, it would do an instant 100% weapon attack on whatever cooldown it had. So the best way to make use of this ability was to equip the slowest possible weapon you could find because weapons were balanced around their weapon speed. If a weapon could attack fast, then it did less damage, because they were balanced around the fact of how much damage per second it could do. So if you're attacking quickly all the time, overall it would equal the same amount of damage as attacking with the slower, harder hitting one. And since slow weapons hit less often, they'd hit harder every time they did hit. And since lots of melee abilities would just do damage based on your weapon, you wanted to get the slowest weapon possible, because those were your hardest hitting weapons possible, which led to the famous status of some slow two-handed weapons, like the Arcanite Reaper. So what Blizzard did in patch 1.8 was basically pull from a table of three fixed weapon speeds. All two-handed weapons would be treated as having a 3.3 second speed when used with an ability that did weapon damage, like Mortal Strike. All daggers would be treated as 1.7 and all other one-handed weapons would be treated as having a speed of 2.4. So if using an Arcanite Reaper, which had an attack speed of 3.8, which is really slow, the closer it gets to 4 seconds, the slower it is because that was the max, it would instead do damage as if it had an attack speed of 3.3 seconds, which is pretty average for a two-handed weapon. Essentially, removing weapon speeds from the equation and making it so just a higher item level weapon would do more damage, rather than a weapon with the slowest speed. And in Classic WoW, the game already has this weapon speed normalization in it from day one, so you won't be able to experience the supremacy of slow weapons. And finally, at number one, we have wall walking. There was kind of a bug in vanilla WoW that could allow your characters to wall walk on vertical surfaces. If you were good enough, you could literally wall jump up a 90% incline. That's just straight up non-slanted walls because of how the game registered where your character stood in relation to non-movable surfaces. So some players would spend all their time just trying to explore places they weren't supposed to get to. And there's tons of guides online showing how to get to all kinds of places like the Iron Forge airfield for example, which is some light wall jumping. And then some much more complicated places that required some pro wall jumping skills. Now, there will still be some places you can glitch yourself into. In fact, you can still kind of do that in the live version of the game. But the straight up wall walking that exists in Vanilla WoW, the one that lets you go up straight vertical surfaces, if you were good enough, will not exist because that was a combination of old server technology and kind of a bug, which they'll be fixing. 
And I've heard from many people that wall walking is the one thing they will miss most when classic servers come out, because there's no way Blizzard will include it intentionally, in the same way people are doubtful Blizzard will include front stabbing. In today's video we're going to go over some useful items you can obtain along your journey in classic WoW, ranging from consumables, trinkets, and other useful items that are given either by quest rewards, vendors, or dropped from mobs throughout the world. And at the number 10 spot we have the Skull of Impending Doom. This item is an offhand that can be equipped by any class and has the unique effect of increasing your run speed by 60% for 10 seconds, but also dealing damage and draining mana when used with a 5 minute cooldown. To get the item, the player must complete a small quest chain that starts at different places depending on what faction the player is, with Alliance starting in 2 Iron Forge for Yagen's Digest and 2 Undercity for Yagen's Digest for Horde. Now, the 60% run speed bonus already has a ton of usefulness for everyone and doesn't really need to be expanded on since it's pretty self-explanatory, although that alone would be enough to make it a very useful item. But what really sets this item apart is the damage it does to you when you use it. See, if timed correctly, you can use this item before being polymorphed by a mage, and when the polymorph land, it will almost immediately break to the damage you're doing to yourself, thanks to the offhand. It also works the exact same with a rogue's blind, a hunter's trap, or a scatter shot. And since those are all very popular classes in Classic, being able to counter all of these CC abilities with a simple offhand is pretty valuable, especially since the damage dealing component is not a debuff, but a buff, which means you can just click it off once you've broken free. Now, the reason why it's so low on this list, however, is because if you equip this, it has a 30 second cooldown before it can be used. Meaning it's not really feasible to use mid-combat to escape CC, but rather equipped beforehand, replacing a weapon or another offhand that might have stats on it that would be more useful. But if you have really bad weapons and you're looking for every advantage possible in PvP, then this can definitely help you out in the short term. And at number 9, we have an alliance only item called the Bag of Marbles. For anyone who's ever leveled in Elwyn Forest, you've probably had these at one point throughout your adventures, as this comes from a quest called Gold Dust Exchange that starts with Remy two times. He tasks you with bringing him 10 gold dust from the Kobolds in Fargo Deep Mine and the Jasper Lobe Mine. After slaughtering all the Kobolds and collecting all the dust, he rewards you with this item along with some money. Now, the reason why this item is so good is because when used on an enemy, it reduces the target's chance to hit by 25% for 10 seconds, which effectively reduces their damage by 25% on average. However, if you time it, you can use it just before your enemy's powerful abilities, causing their damage to be massively nerfed. This is insanely good at lower levels, as some elite mobs, more specifically Hogger, the true end boss of WoW, is nearly impossible to solo for most classes, and having his hit chance reduced to 75% is very, very strong. Not to mention they can be used against players as well. So if you get attacked by a rogue in Stranglethorn for the 10th time, you can use this against him, and if it lands, it will massively lower his damage. But there's one major downside with this item, as Bag of Marbles can potentially be resisted. And while it doesn't have a level cap per se, the higher in level you go, the higher the chance it has to be resisted. But if 1 in 10 chance it doesn't get resisted when used at level 60, then it can be used against a dungeon boss or even a raid boss. And while the likelihood of Bag of Marbles working on raid boss is very, very low, it is still possible and according to ThoughtBot's comments from Vanilla WoW, it was used in Dire Maul and even Naxxramas during progression. But since it isn't guaranteed, this is the reason why it lands only the ninth spot of this list. And at number 8, we have actually two things, the Crystal Spire and the Crystal Charge. Most of you probably remember that one weird quest in Ungoro Crater, where you have to collect all those crystals of varying colors. Well, once you complete that quest, you can continue to pick them up and turn them in for a few different crystals that provide their own specific buffs depending on what colors you turn in, with these two items being the only damaging ones. To get the Crystal Charge, you need 10 red and 10 yellow power crystals, and to get the Crystal Spire, you need 10 blue and 10 yellow power crystals. So, let's start with the Spires first. When consumed, it's basically a Thorn's ability for anyone who uses it, and it causes 12 damage to each attacker when struck. And Crystal Charge acts like a grenade, which is not only an instant throw, but also does quite a good amount of fire damage in a 3 yard radius. Warriors being amazing tanks as they are in Classic have trouble keeping aggro with multiple mobs, and having the Crystal Grenade acts as a nice way to get a burst AoE aggro, which is not only an overall buff to their damage for AoE, but also lets them hold aggro easier. Along with the Crystal Spire's Pseudo Thorns, this is actually a pretty good, oblique small buff to all tanks, as the constant damage done to the mobs hitting them will help them hold aggro easier as well. While both of these buffs are great, even if you're not a tank, the reason why this is also lower on this list is because 
you have to be quite a high level in order to even get them, since the quest starts at level 47. But it is better weighted until around level 50 to complete. That and having to farm the crystals over and over again, even though they are plentiful, can get pretty tedious. And at number 7 we have probably the most recognizable consumable in WoW, which is called the Noggenfogger Elixir. To get this item, you have to do a small quest chain in Tanaris from an NPC named Mara Noggenfogger called the Thirsty Goblin, which tasks you with bringing a laden dew gland. Fast forward through some other minor quests in the chain, and you have 5 Noggenfogger as your quest reward, but also an infinite amount of Noggenfogger available and ready to be sold to you. Once you consume it, it gives you one of three effects, turning you into a skeleton, decreasing your size, or causing you to float. However, these three effects are not just visual, but have bonuses to them. The skeleton transformation makes you able to breathe underwater. The float effect allows you to slow fall, and the shrink effect actually makes your hitbox smaller, making you harder to hit, harder to see, and able to access locations not normally accessible. Now, it is worth mentioning, of course, that Noggenfogger was somewhat spammable, and if you were to get the floating effect to save you at the last moment from a falling death, or spam it in order to get the flow fall effect ahead of time, let's say just jumping from lumber mill to blacksmith, if you were lucky, you could get the floating effect and jump down to blacksmith in time to fight or save the flak. But if you were not, then you would just fall to your death as maybe a skeleton. And the player base at the time dubbed this the Noggenfogger Roulette. The reason why Noggenfogger makes this list at around the middle mark is because it requires the player to beat at least a level 44 to even do. And since the effect was random, it could be rather expensive or annoying to try to get the specific effect that you wanted. Although the quest chain required to unlock the ability to purchase the potion can be quite challenging to some players, but most people use a Noggenfogger for aesthetic purposes instead of its actual utility, because being a skeleton is pretty cool. Like, who can deny that? The potion is unique since each effect can do something pretty useful that gives the drinker a pretty good benefit. And at the sixth spot, we coincidentally have the six demon back. This is a trinket that casts one of six different spells at random with a 30 yard range on a 30 minute cooldown. The six spells that this trinket can cast are Fireball, Frostbolt, Chain Lightning, Polymorph, Enveloping Winds, and Summon Falhound. There's no real confirmed stats on the cast rate of each specific spell, but a few players have estimated it to be around 25% for Fireball, Frostbolt, and Chain Lightning, 10% for Polymorph, and 5% for the last three. But why is the trinket even good? Well, the spells that it casts scales with the player's spell damage and 100% of it too, which is really good overall as not many things scale with 100% of your spell power. The fireball did around 190 damage, meanwhile the frostball only did 150, but at least it left a 50% slow on the target for 4 seconds. You also have the chain lightning which did around 175 damage to the targets, and with each hit of the ability being boosted by the spell damage, this was pretty powerful for anything over one target. The polymorph spell it cast was just a regular mage polymorph, however only lasting for 20 seconds and having the chance to backfire in the caster and cause them to be polymorphed instead. Which sounds really bad, but this was actually kind of useful sometimes, as polymorphing gave a huge amount of health regeneration, but would most likely be broken almost immediately since polymorph breaks randomly, or upon receiving any damage. Although the chance of this happening being so random and low, meant the situation of it happening when you wanted it or needed it, was almost entirely impossible. Next is Enveloping Winds, which looks somewhat like the Druid Cyclone ability, and stuns the target for 10 seconds, but it's broken upon receiving any damage. And lastly, we have the Fellhound. It behaves very similarly to a normal Warlock pet that's set on attack and will go gung-ho and charge your target. Over its duration, the Fellhound will simply auto-attack its target and also cast its Mana Burn spell on the target if it has mana, which will consume the mana and deal extra damage. Now, each one of these abilities is pretty strong and has their own powerful potential, especially as one of the few bind on equip trinkets that can be very useful for leveling. But with the negative effects of the long cooldown and not being able to choose which effect you get, leads it to only being the sixth spot on this list. And at number five, we have all of the Lincoln pieces. Now, these pieces of gear can only be obtained from a very long quest chain at Ungoro Crater that you can find from a destroyed boat in the southern eastern part of the map. The quest chain takes the player all across different zones, even requiring them to die at one point to interact with a gravestone. On the final quest, called It's Dangerous to Go Alone, it asks you to kill Blaze Runner, with the completion of the quest offering you the Spirit of Aquamentas, Lincoln's Sword of Mastery, and Lincoln's Boomerang. So let's start with the Spirit of Aquamentas. If you're new or haven't really been looking at other players, this is a very popular offhand for priests and mages to use as the plus 20 to spell power is really good. You can also choose this or the next item, Lincoln's Sword of Mastery, which is a pretty decent starter tanking sword, 
since the 1.8 attack speed and the chance to blast the target with nature damage is a nice thing to have for increased threat generation. Both of these are very good for players who want a powerful item to even use in early endgame progression. Whichever one you choose, you also get the Lincoln's Boomerang with it. I have discussed Lincoln's Boomerang in another video before, but I'll go over it again here, as it comes with the other two really good items. The Boomerang is a trinket, which flings a magical boomerang that does a small amount of damage and has a chance to stun or disarm the target. A tank being able to use this item at a long range to pull is great, since tanks like Paladins wouldn't have to spec into Holy Shock and just use this instead. With the added bonus of stunning or disarming the target being great for PvP too, but the RNG about it was very unreliable. Now. While this spot does have three items instead of just one, the reason for this is because each piece offered by this quest has its own use, with both of the main choices, the off-handed sword, as well as the boomerang, all being useful. And they should all be mentioned all together since you get them at the same time anyway. And at number four, we have the Barav Peasant Collar. This is a unique trinket that summons three random NPCs. At first glance, it doesn't seem like much, but it does a lot more than you'd think. See, the three NPCs that are called to do some decent damage, but the damage itself isn't exactly what makes the trinket so good. In vanilla, spellcasters have to deal with spell pushback quite often, which is when the cast bar recoils a bit whenever you're hit. And having something like a hunter pet stuck on a priest that's casting can make it so the priest has such an effect that they cast 30% slower depending on the attack speed of the pet. So, if a single hunter pet is that strong at slowing a caster, Imagine three NPCs all in melee fighting at the exact same time. The spell pushback is so strong that it's almost impossible for a spellcaster to cast at all before just being killed by another player. Not only this, but the servants themselves have quite a bit of health and cannot be killed by just a simple quick AoE spell, as the only real way to stop them from attacking you is if you were mage and just use Ice Nova, for example, to escape. But all other casters have no real way to deal with them easily and will just be completely curb stomp into the ground. On top of this, this trinket can be used while stunned, and is an excellent way to prevent a rogue from getting a re-stealth due to all the mobs hitting, forcing them to either run away or use vanish, which won't even help, as for a long time, these mobs were bugged and would continue to attack a rogue even who had vanished. This trinket can also be used from range and is a great way to eat a hunter trap for you, or two, or even three, as they could soak a freezing trap for each, for example. Now, to get this trinket, you must complete the Baroff Family Fortune quest in the Western Plaguelands. That varies depending on what faction you're on, while the Alliance turned it into Weldon Barov and Horde turned it into Alexi Barov to get it. You then have to go into Skullamance and recover all the Barov family deeds, which is one for Brill, Cardaro, South Shore, and Terran Mill. And once you bring it back, you're tasked with killing the opposite faction's quest giver. Now that this is completed, you now have the Barov Peasant Caller. And with Skullamance being a very popular dungeon, you're likely to do this anyway, but the very high level requirement and needing a group to even complete it can definitely prolong this trinket's obtainability until later on, but it's still a very strong PvP and PvE trinket. And at number 3, we have a Horde exclusive item called Really Sticky Glue. This is a quest reward from the Solvent Spirit, which is available from Master Varnal by the Troll Starting Area. This quest tasks you with bringing 4 intact Macure Eyes and 8 vials of Crawler Mucus back to him and in return, he gives you 10 Really Sticky Glue. Now, this item being offered at such a low level is insane. See, the glue that it uses is a player version of Spider's Web, and like the Bag of Marbles can be used against players and elites, although the higher the level, the higher the chance it can be resisted or breaking out upon taking damage. So not only does this have insane use for PvP by allowing you to CC kiting classes like mages or hunters, or CC power classes like warrior, or for example paladin making them waste blessing of freedom just to dispel the effect, which can very easily turn the tide in your favor since they won't have it up for later. Or just to have them sit there and stare at you, like warriors are great at doing. Not only that, but being usable by a class that doesn't even have a root in their ability list, like a warlock or priest for example, can very easily make them overpowered. Now we do have an item like it available to engineers, which a lot of people are, but not everyone. The Gnomish Netomatic Projector, a trinket that has unlimited use and a much higher hit chance. However, this uses up a trinket slot, which has a chance to backfire requiring high level Doish engineering and 10 times longer the cooldown, while also taking up a full trinket slot which could have gone to an insignia instead, or any other damage slash utility ones, is quite a big trade off since trinkets have quite a lot of value in vanilla for PvP. Now, the bad part is that since patch 1.7, when they made this item bind on pickup, you can't farm this item on a bunch of low levels and then send it to your main character 
and just have an infinite supply like you could in early vanilla. Which admittedly does suck, but it's kinda needed because being able to have a ton of these would make PvP an even more unbalanced mess. But an item available from a low level class that was as good, if not better, than an item crafted with a near max level profession shows just how strong it is. And at number 2 we have the Rune of the Guard Captain. This is a Horde exclusive trinket that's the best in slot PvP trinket for not only Fury Warriors but for Enhancement Shamans, Feral Druids, Rogues, and also Protection Warriors during Phase 2. The reason for this is because the increase to hit stat on a trinket is very rare, as the only other hit stat trinkets in vanilla are the Kiss of the Spider, which drops from Myaxna and Naxxramas, and the Dark Fane Talisman, which drops from Eberrock and Blackwing Lair. Well, unless you're a rogue, as they have the Dire Maul Royal Seal trinket that comes with 2% hit, making it BIS for a long time. Since the two non-rogue trinkets are both max level raid items, Rune of the Guard Captain can be obtained as early as level 46 making it an amazing trinket to get. See, in order to never miss a level 60 target with auto attacks, you need a bare minimum of 5% hit, while dual wielding players need 24%. For level cap bosses, which are level 63, you need 9% chance to hit and 25% chance for dual wielding. Now, while there are obviously other hit increasing items in literally every other slot, those are fairly common to come by, while one slot, trinkets, are not, and having a required stat on something that's already pretty good can be obtained somewhat early, and doesn't have an upgrade until way later on, this made it one of the best pre-level cap trinkets in the game during that phase. However, this trinket is Horde only, giving Horde, who keep in mind have insane racials, even more power in PvP, while Alliance having nothing equivalent to it, making this trinket very, very important for not only PvPers, but also PvEers who were still trying to get their other trinkets. And at the number one spot, we have Magic Dust. This is an item with a small drop chance from Unbound Cyclones in Westfall, and what this item does is put an enemy to sleep for 30 seconds on a 1 minute cooldown, and can be used on both NPCs and players. Now, just by hearing this you probably already know the serious value behind the item, as some classes, like Warriors, have trouble dealing with multiple mobs at one time, especially while leveling, and being able to put an enemy to sleep on an instant cast for 30 seconds at such a low level can be a lifesaver. But I know what you're thinking. Does it make another player sleep for 30 seconds in PvP? Well, yeah, kinda. Like the glue, each second with the effect, NPCs and even more so players, will have a chance to break free of the effect. And it even goes through a Paladin's Blessing of Protection as it's classified as Shadow Magic. This means that only an undead Will of the Forsaken and a Shaman's Tremor Totem will be able to break it, as regular trinkets don't remove sleep effects yet. So if you decide to twink, as was pretty common for vanilla, or if you were just a low level character, let's say a rogue having double blind along with regular CC effects, you get the idea. Also, this is very useful for hunters too, outside of the regular affected gifts. For their epic bow quest to get Rock Delar, you can use this dust on Simon's pet to CC it while you fight the demon since traps can't be used in combat. If you were smart enough, you could lay a trap beforehand, fight Simone, and then when the trap ends, you can just tap target, use the dust on the pet, and keep fighting Simone normally making her pet useless the entire time. And these were also a great gold maker too, and would sell for quite a lot since the mobs that dropped them were farmable by both Horde and Alliance. So unlike the bag of marbles or really sticky glue, you can have an infinite supply of these, assuming you had the gold to buy them or the time to spend farming them. In this video, we'll go over 10 talents from Vanilla WoW that are a little weird in the way that they're either really bad, out of place, or just did a unique thing. But mostly, a lot of these are just going to be kind of bad. And starting off, we'll go with one of those out of place talents. So number 10 will be weapon balance. Now I'm going to read you what this talent does, and I want you to guess which class and spec it belongs to. Increases the damage you deal with melee weapons by 2%, up to a maximum of 10% with 5 talent points. Now would you think this was a talent for a weapon based class? like a warrior, rogue, or paladin? Well, you'd be wrong because this was a deep talent in the Balance Druid Tree. Weapon Balance was a 20 point talent for Balance Druids, a spec that today could be more accurately described as a pure caster class. In Vanilla WoW, or in the early days of Vanilla WoW anyway, Balance Druids didn't really have a niche yet, and their talents generally increased the damage or interacted with their spell casting, with the final talent in the tree being Hurricane, a spell casting AoE. And then randomly there was Weapon Balance, 
which increased the damage they did with their melee weapons. Despite the fact that they had no melee attacks with weapons, nor any other talents in the balance tree that indicated they wanted to use melee weapons. Now, druids did have melee abilities while in cat or bear form, and this talent did not affect those. Eventually, though, in a later patch, weapon balance was removed from druids, and they kind of redid the talent tree a little bit to be more spellcasting focused, and even gave them moonkin form as their final talent. And at number 9, we have Curse of Exhaustion. Curse of Exhaustion in its first form was kind of a unique slow. Curse of Exhaustion was a 20 point talent in the Affliction Tree, and it gave the Warlock a curse with the effect of reduce the target speed to 90% of their normal run speed for 12 seconds. Now what's interesting about this is that it doesn't just say lower your target speed by 10%. It says reduce their speed to 90% of normal. And this little distinction actually makes it so it's a little bit more useful than the standard slow. Now there was also another talent right next to this one which would increase the slow to 30%, which most people took with this talent, so I'm just going to refer to it as a 30% slow for the rest of this part. Anyways, with its unique wording, if you applied Curse of Exhaustion to a player on a mount, for example, it would first reduce the running speed to the standard 100%, so completely ignoring the mount movement speed increase, and then it would apply the 30% slow. Whereas other movement speed decreases would just slow on top of the mounted speed, and not slow for as much as Curse of Exhaustion. Or if used on any other run speed increase, like a sprint, for example, it would lower the run speed to 100%, and then lower that by another 30%. It would just normalize the run speed, and then slow them, which made it a pretty decent slow. And then in a later patch in vanilla, Blizzard removed this distinction, and just turned Curse of Exhaustion into a normal slow with its new effect being reduces the target movement speed by 30% for 12 seconds. So the reason this one even makes this list wasn't because it was bad, but because its effect was unique. And at number 8 we have Throwing Weapon Specialization. This was a 25 point combat rogue talent with two ranks that would increase the range of your thrown weapons by 6 yards. Now here's the thing about thrown weapons in vanilla WoW, they sucked. Thrown weapons did terrible damage, required you to aim the weapon, or I guess had a casting time, and had a cooldown. You could only use the throwing weapon once, or maybe twice, if you had a fast one and did a little bit of kiting, but it was so inefficient to use throwing weapons that they were really only ever used to just pull a mob. And that's about it. You did not need to throw extra ones, nor did you need to waste talent points deep in the combat tree to get an extra 6 yards on it. Basically, what I'm trying to say is this talent was useless, but not only that, it was a top talent, being only second to the final talent in the combat tree, Adrenaline Rush. That's why in patch 1.12, throwing weapon specialization was removed from the combat tree, and instead it was replaced with weapon expertise, which was much better, as it gave the rogue 6 extra expertise in swords, fists, and dagger weapons. Number 7. Two-Handed Axes and Maces. This was a 10-point enhancement shaman talent that allowed the shaman to use two-handed axes and maces. Pretty simple effect, enhanced shamans also had a 20-point talent called parry, which allowed them to parry attacks. Here's the thing about these two talents. All other classes that can parry or use two-handed weapons get those abilities as baseline abilities, not something you have a talent into. And after Vanilla WoW, no classes had to use talent points to be able to use two-handed weapons or parry. But during Vanilla WoW, Enhanced Shamans had this unique distinction of needing to waste their talent points to get baseline stuff. But what made two-handed axes and maces kind of annoying, for lack of a better word, was the fact that if you swapped your talents and lost this talent point, you lost all of your skills in those weapons. So if you took this talent again later on, you'd have to skill up your two-handed axes and mace skill from zero. Vanilla WoW did not have dual talent specialization. That was not added until Wrath of the Lich King, so every time an enhanced shaman had to swap specs, they would have to spend a couple hours skilling up their skills in these two weapons, something no other class needed to do, because they were given their abilities to use weapons as baseline abilities, not talents. 
Number six, the light well. Lightwell is infamous for being one of the worst and poorly designed abilities in WoW's history, despite the fact that it seems like a pretty useful ability at first glance. Lightwell was a last point talent in the Holy Tree for priests, and had the effect of creates a Holy Lightwell near the priest, and party and raid members can click on the Lightwell to restore health over 10 seconds. Being attacked cancels this effect. At first glance, it seems pretty useful. The priest will place down a light well, and party members can click on it to heal themselves. But here's the thing. For the longest time, taking damage would cancel the heal you got from the light well. I think this was in place so that a healer couldn't just drop a light well next to a tank, and they could just keep clicking on it to heal themselves while tanking. But this also made it kind of awkward to use for other people, as in a raid fight, you'd constantly be taking damage, which could easily cancel this effect. And there's also the thing that players have to click on it themselves if they want to get a heal. And it was easy for players to accidentally click it multiple times and use up too many of the charges at once. And there's also the thing that no one ever wanted to click on the light well. In fact, it was kind of infamous for this, and probably this reason alone. Blizzard even put it on some of their loading screen tips for people to just click on the light well. Blizzard tried so hard to get people to click on the light well, that they eventually gave up and converted into something that would spit out heals to people, before finally removing the ability with Legion. And at number 5, we've got Lacerate, the last talent in the Survival Hunter tree. Lacerate is a pretty standard dot. It was a melee range bleed that did about 100 damage over 21 seconds, and did not scale. Serpent Sting at rank 4, which hunters obtained at level 40, did 140 damage over 15 seconds, which is just a straight up better dot. And Serpent Sting is baseline and a ranged ability. The max rank of Serpent Sting obviously did much more damage. Lacerate was just really bad for some reason. But also in the survival tree, there was an ability called Melee Specialization, which increased the damage a hunter did with melee weapons by 5%, and was at the 25 point talent mark the second to last row before Lacerate in the survival tree. Hunters in Vanilla WoW had terrible melee damage, but Blizzard had a couple of abilities in the survival tree sorted towards melee. In patch 1.7, Lacerate was removed from the survival tree and replaced with Wavering String. And then after that, they didn't completely remove melee talents from the survival tree until Mists of Pandaria. Number 4, Blood Craze. Blood Craze is a 10 point Fury Warrior talent with the effect of regenerate 3% of your total health over 6 seconds after being the victim of a critical strike. Now at first glance, this may seem like a pretty niche heal, until you remember a few things about combat in Vanilla WoW. For one, its heal is really low, 3% of your total health over 6 seconds, as if getting 3% of your health instantly would be too much or something. But putting it as a 6 second hot, well it's kind of like a worse version of Brush It Off. Brush It Off is the new Kul Terran human racial, which heals you for 2% of the damage you take over 4 seconds. Except Brush It Off works on any ability, and not just crits. Which brings me to another part of this ability. It only activates if you're subject to a critical strike. One of the tank's jobs is getting enough defense rating so that they won't be crit by bosses who have an inherent 6% chance to crit. So Blood Craze isn't a tanking talent. Fury Warriors and Raids should not be getting hit by anything. So it's not a PvE raid or dungeon talent. Out in the open world though, spells can't crit you, but physical, ranged, and melee attacks can. And if they do, they do so much damage that this tiny little heal isn't going to help very much, especially having to spend 3 points into it. But what's funny about this talent is that this is the buffed version of Blood Craze. The original version of Blood Craze had this effect. Allows 15% of your health regeneration to work during combat for 20 seconds after being the victim of a critical strike. And health regeneration as a stat in Vanilla WoW is just referring to your out of combat health regeneration. You know, the thing that recovered incredibly slowly in Vanilla WoW? Health regeneration was so bad that the troll racial regeneration, which allowed 10% of your health regeneration to continue during combat at all times, was considered one of the worst racials in the game. And the original talent allowed you to sometimes 
have a slightly better version than the troll racial. Only after being hit by a crit, of course. That is to say, Blood Craze was a very interesting talent, and for some reason was very rarely picked, despite warriors having almost no self-healing in vanilla. Number 3. Divine Strength Let's play another little guessing game. I'm going to read off what this talent does, and then I want you to guess which paladin tree it's a deep talent in. Divine Strength increases your strength by 10% at 5 ranks. If you guessed it was a 25 point holy talent, and in the second to last row, you'd be correct. But did you also know holy paladins didn't do melee damage? Or they weren't supposed to anyway, in raids or PvP where it mattered. This is just another one of those interesting talents that would actually be really good for a lot of classes, but for some reason is given to a spec that doesn't need it, and that's why it was later removed from the holy tree. I should also mention that the last talent at the time was Holy Shock, which is a spell Holy Paladins have today, except in its first version, it only did damage, had a 20 yard range, and a 30 second cooldown. Holy Shock was supposed to be the Paladin version of the Shaman Shocks, except all three of the Shaman Shocks were really good, and had 6 second cooldowns. And for some reason, they gave Paladins one shock with a much longer cooldown at 30 seconds, but with the same short 20 yard range, and not at all good. Later on in vanilla though, they did finally give it the option to heal instead of doing damage, which was the hallmark of the Holy Shock ability, where you could choose to do either or, but it still wasn't good. Blizzard had a really hard time getting Paladins to use Holy Shock, basically until they added Holy Power to the game in Cataclysm. Number 2, Primal Instincts. This was the final talent in the Feral Druid Tree, which had the effect of lowering the mana cost of your shapeshifting by 25%. Now, shapeshifting was very mana intensive, and Blizzard did intend for druids to be able to change forms regularly during combat, but shapeshifting was too mana expensive, and a 25% reduction was not enough to encourage shapeshifting combat. And in fact, a 25% mana reduction to shapeshifting was a terrible final talent, and that's why they removed it and replaced it with something better, and then moved this talent to the balance tree in the second row of talents and renamed it to Natural Shapeshifter, which at 3 ranks reduced the mana cost of shapeshifting by 30%, and at an easy point to get in the talent tree, with only requiring 3 ranks, wasn't half bad here. And that's the thing, this version of it was just straight up better than Primal Instincts, and even then, it's a pretty meh talent. Which should go to show how terrible Primal Instincts was. It was a worst version of Natural Shapeshifter, and one of the final talents the Feral Druid could take, a role usually taken up by one of their best abilities or talents. And finally, number 1, Master Conjurer. This was a 15 point demonology talent that at max rank, reduced the mana cost and casting time of your stone creations by 40%. Here's the thing about Warlock Stones, they could only create four of them. Two of them were basically useless, and the two useful ones, the Health Stone and Soul Stone, were never casted in combat. All four of them were things you casted outside of combat as kind of a preparation spell, so their cast times and mana costs didn't matter, which in lies this talent's uselessness. At least Primal Instincts was somewhat useful, as shapeshifting was very mana expensive, and something you might have to do in combat sometimes. Although rarely did you have to cast any of your stone abilities in combat. In a later patch of Vanilla WoW, Blizzard just straight up removed this talent, as no one really took it and it was kind of useless. And I think that's why I put it at number one. Out of all the talents, this one is arguably the least useful one, which is saying something considering a lot of the talents I covered in this video. Back in Vanilla WoW, there was a dagger called Finkel's Skinner, which dropped off the beast in Upper Blackrock Spire. The dagger was one of two items in Vanilla WoW that gave a plus 10 skill up to skinning while it was equipped. Since not all classes could equip daggers, others were forced to farm the sword Zulin Slicer instead, which had a similar equip effect. Now, what's different about these skinny knives, as opposed to other skill up items, is that these were needed for progression rating. In Blackwing Lair, back in Vanilla WoW, many bosses use an ability called Shadow Flame, 
which did so much damage that it still killed players up to level 80 who were going back and farming the place two expansions later from unhealable damage. The only way to counter the damage was to wear a cloak called Onyxia Scale Cloak, which had the effect of protects the wearer from being fully engulfed by Shadow Flame. You could not clear Blackwing Lair without this cloak, but I've heard that some raids could get by with only the tanks wearing the cloak by cheesing certain bosses, but even then, at least one person had to have it equipped. Now, the cloak itself wasn't a rare drop or anything. It was simply crafted by leather workers and could be learned when you turned in the quest for defeat Onyxia. One of the biggest problems with crafting the cloak, however, was that one of its materials for crafting it was a scale of Onyxia. The scale of Onyxia could only be obtained from skinning Onyxia, which is where the skinning knives I mentioned earlier come into play. The maximum level for skinning in vanilla was 300. You needed a skinning level of at least 315 to skin boss level mobs. There was an enchant that could give you plus 5 skinning, but that only brought you up to 305. So in order to get that last 10 levels, you needed to obtain either Finkel Skinner or Zulin Slicer, depending on which class you were. Or you could just equip both of them if you were a hunter and not worry about the skinning enchant. And that's what made these skinning knives so sought after. They were required to skin a boss who had a one-of-a-kind mat needed to make a cloak that was needed for progression raiding. But luckily, you only really needed one person in the raid to have one. And since raids were comprised of 40 people back then, there was a good chance at least one person was both a skinner and had one of these weapons to skin the boss to make some cloaks. Required gear for certain bosses was a big thing in Vanilla WoW, so this wasn't even really that big of a deal. At least it was only one item and not a full set of resist gear. Sadly, neither weapon is available to obtain in game anymore, as both the bosses they dropped from have been removed, with Zula and Slicer being removed in Cataclysm with the Troll Dungeon revamps, and Finkel Skinner being removed in Warlords of Draenor with the Upper Blackrock Spire revamp. Speaking of Finkel Skinner, while it's no longer obtainable today, if you still had it from back then, it's not exactly removed from your bank or anything. But its flavor text was removed, which used to say, Property of Finkel Einhorn, Grandmaster Adventurer. Now, it just says, also serves as a skinny knife. Its old flavor text is a reference to its lore in the Warcraft RPG, which states, This dagger looks like nothing more than an ordinary skinny knife but it bears a powerful enchantment that makes it ideal for fighting beasts. Originally carried by the gnomish adventurer Finkel Einhorn, it has not been seen since his legendary effort to hunt down a massive canine creature, said to be terrorizing a remote section of the Blasted Lands. The dagger's pommel appears wrapped in a well-tanned animal skin that changes to a different type each day. One day it might be a gray wolf hide, while the next it bears the orange and black stripes of a jungle tiger. Since the dagger dropped from the boss simply called The Beast, it's a safe bet to assume the gnome adventurer was not successful in his attempts at killing the massive canine creature. And the fact that he comes out of the beast if it was killed and then skinned only proves that things did not go well for him. Einhorn also appears in Blackwing Descent in Chimeron's room, trapped in a cage. You have to talk to him to start the robot which allows you to not be one shot by the boss. During his dialogues, he'll ask you if you've seen his skinny knife, obviously referencing his famous dagger from Vanilla. Finkel also appears as a quest giver in Mount Hyjal, and in your garrison inn, and will give you a quest to go into the new Upper Blackrock Spire to get his son's skinny knife back. In Hearthstone, when the card The Beast dies, your opponent will get a Finkel Einhorn card on their side of the field. The name Finkel Einhorn is also a reference to Ace Ventura, Pet Detective. In the movie, a big plot point was that the main villain was a former football player, who cross-dressed as a woman. As a guy, he went by the name Ray Finkel, but as a girl, he went by Lois Einhorn. With the gnome this dagger refers to going by the two last names of the character, Finkel and Einhorn. Now, as to why a skinning dagger would be related to a cross-dressing villain from a 90s comedy movie, is a mystery to me. 
This video will go over powerful abilities and combos that were incredibly strong at one point or another in Vanilla WoW. But this list will also cover more than just strong damage dealing abilities, and cover defensive and CC effects as well. At number 10, we've got kind of a meme combo in the form of the Paladin Bubble Hearth. You see, Divine Shield, the Paladin ability that gives him immunity to all forms of damage and debuffs, lasted for 12 seconds in vanilla. Hearthstones had a 10 second cast time, so a Pally who was in trouble could simply use Bubble and then cast Hearthstone to get out of anywhere. If a Pally got caught out in the open world and was dying, they could just Bubble Hearth out of there. If a Pally was mad at a raid, they could just pull the boss and then Bubble Hearth. It was the ultimate escape tool, and there were no ways to remove it in Vanilla WoW, as Mass Dispel and Shattering Throw weren't added until later expansions. So, if a Pally wanted to run away, there wasn't anything you could really do to stop them. Number 9, Frost Shock. Frost Shock is also another kind of a meme ability that everyone liked to call overpowered, but it kind of deserved its infamy to an extent. Frost Shock was one of the three shock shamans could use, which all shared the same short 6 second cooldown. And since three abilities all shared the same cooldown, Blizzard wanted to balance each one in a way that made you want to pick it over the other two. Earth Shock had a baked in interrupt and was also kind of overpowered to an extent. Flame Shock just did damage and put a dot up, and Frost Shock did damage and slowed the target for 8 seconds. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say Frost Shock did damage? Because I meant to say Frost Shock did a lot of damage. It did way more damage than an instant cast spell with such a short cooldown really should have been able to do. Plus, it had a slow attached to it that was longer than its cooldown, meaning you could keep someone permanently slowed with Frost Shock. Frost Shock was one of the few ranged slows in the game that could do that, in Vanilla WoW anyway, and the only one that also did damage. And in Vanilla WoW where mobility was low, this was actually super powerful for that time period. So much so that Blizzard added DRs to slows in patch 1.4. Basically just to deal with the Frost Shock problem. In case you were wondering, DRs don't exist on slows today. They removed them from that in the Burning Crusade. Slows were a much bigger deal in Vanilla WoW, and Shamans were one of the most mobile kiters thanks to Frost Shock. Number 8. Fear. Not just the Warlock ability fear, but all fears. Fears in Vanilla WoW worked a little differently than they do today. Functionally, they are basically the same. When used on someone, they run around randomly and can't use abilities. And in Vanilla WoW, fear had a chance to break early if they took damage. This is still the case today as well. Only, the damage threshold worked differently. Fear had a higher chance to break the more damage they took from an ability, and a low chance to break from small amounts of damage. So, if you just put dots on a target and used a channeled ability, fear was basically a 12 second stun. Technically, hunters, priests, and warriors also had fears, but only warlocks had a spammable, no cooldown fear. So if a warlock got opened up on in PvP, they could have their invisible succubus seduce the target, turn around and cast fear, then put up full dots and use one of their three channeled abilities to do a ton of small ticks of damage, and basically kill people through a near permanent fear that would never break. Number 7, the cheap shot slash kidney shot combo. Rogues could cheap shot out of stealth for a 4 second stun, and then combo into kidney shot for another 6 second long stun for a total of 10 seconds of stun, the longest stun chain in Vanilla WoW without some kind of special items or gimmicks. The only real downside to the stun combo was the energy and combo points required to use the two abilities, which could be completely offset through some items like Thistle T. A 10 second stun was enough time for a gear rogue to kill a low armor target, so it was technically possible for rogues to kill someone of equal level while never getting hit back in exchange and with very little skill involved. A 10 second stun was powerful back then, and would be powerful today. Although this 10 second stun wasn't exclusive to Vanilla WoW. It was a thing all the way until Cataclysm, when Blizzard finally put Kidney Shot and Cheap Shot on the same stun DRs. But it was really strong in Vanilla WoW too, and the cause of lots of complaints about rogues being too overpowered. But funny enough, the thing that people associate rogues to being able to CC someone to death without ever getting hit back didn't actually involve the cheap shot kidney shot combo, which I'll get into a little bit more later on in this list. 
Number 6, Curse of Shadow and Negative Resistances. Before patch 1.9, you could cause targets to go into negative resistances with either Curse of Elements or Curse of Shadow. Resistances were a stat that would lower damage taken by their specific element and give you a chance to resist their effects. So having high shadow resistance meant you took significantly less shadow damage and could sometimes be immune to fear and other shadow school debuff effects. Negative resistances basically did the opposite and caused you to do bonus damage to targets. So a warlock throwing up a curse of shadow on a target, causing their shadow resistances to go into the negative, they could hit them for double damage shadow bolts, which if they crit, could do a potential of four times their normal damage, which was basically a guaranteed one shot to any player. This was so good that Blizzard just removed the ability to go into negative resistances in patch 1.9 as it was most likely a bug anyway, and unintended. Number 5, Mortal Strike. Mortal Strike was one of the hardest hitting instant attack abilities in the game, which scaled with weapon damage. For those of you who don't know, some abilities scale with weapon damage, and weapons have varying levels of damage based on speed. So a fast weapon will do less damage than a slow weapon, since it hits more often. While a slow weapon will do a lot more single hit damage because it doesn't hit as often, and that's how Blizzard balances them out with each other. So with an instant attack like Mortal Strike that scales off the weapon's damage and doesn't care at all about its speed, you want the slowest weapon possible to make sure it could hit the hardest. And this is where the Arcanite Reaper came to fame. The Arcanite Reaper was a high level blue weapon that was somewhat easy to craft and extremely slow with an attack speed of 3.8, making it a monster of a weapon for warriors. It was so good it even outclassed some epic two-handed weapons from Molten Core, despite being a level 58 blue item. So coupled together with Mortal Strike, a middle of the road geared warrior could take out half the health of a player with one MS, and even kill Clothies with a crit. It was easy, effortless power, and very widespread with how easy it was to obtain the Reaper. But come patch 1.8, Blizzard normalized weapon attack speed, and brought Mortal Strike more in line and no longer overpowered with an extremely slow weapon. And on a side note, because of the widespread use of the Arcanite Reaper, it was used as the model for the heirloom two-handed axe we have today. Number 4, Blind Prep. Ever hear the infamous Stun Rogue who killed max level geared players while naked and using a starting zone dagger? Well, that infinite stun combo actually didn't rely on stuns very much, and was in fact so strong because of Blind. You see, Blind is an instant cast, long form CC that breaks on damage, and Preparation is an ability rogues have that resets the cooldown of all other rogue abilities. So what the naked rogue in the video did was take advantage of the fact that Preparation could also reset the cooldown of Blind and the fact that Eviscerate did static damage and didn't scale at all with gear. So what he did was double cheap shot with Vanish and then blind. He'd wait the full blind duration in order to leave combat and re-stealth. Then sap and wait the full duration again for another re-stealth, since in vanilla WoW, sap made you leave stealth. Then pop prep to reset all cooldowns and then do the whole thing again. After going through two full rotations of this CC chain, along with at least two cold-blooded eviscerates, and a couple of other damage moves to build combo points. That's what allowed a naked rogue to kill fully geared players. And blind was the crucial part of that whole CC chain, as blind was what allowed the rogue to leave combat in order to use sap, which allowed cheap shots DRs to disappear, and let the rogue save all of his combo points for eviscerates. So it was really Eviscerate's static damage and Blind's cooldown resets that allowed the chain to be as effective as it was. And you could have someone CC'd for about 45 seconds straight if you did it correctly, of which only 10 to 12 seconds of that were spent in stuns. And because of Blind's incredible usefulness with a cooldown reset from prep, Blizzard made sure all future versions of preparation excluded Blind from being reset, starting with the Burning Crusade. And that's how preparation has worked ever since. Number 3, Wind Fury Weapon. During two points in Vanilla WoW, Wind Fury Weapon was kind of broken and overpowered. Wind Fury is a shaman weapon enchant that gave the shaman a 20% chance on hit to proc two extra attacks. Before patch 1.4, 
This proc didn't have an internal cooldown, so it was possible for Wind Fury to proc off the two hits generated from Wind Fury, and theoretically could proc off of itself forever until the target died. This was also the time period before attack weapon normalization, and since the extra hits from Wind Fury basically counted as extra attacks, they did insane amounts of damage from a very slow two-handed weapon, like the Arcanine Reaper. There was even a famous video of a shaman going around with a legendary mace from Molten Core, one-shotting people with Wind Fury procs. Eventually though, Blizzard added a 3 second internal cooldown to Wind Fury, so it couldn't proc off of itself anymore, and killed it even further with attack speed normalization in patch 1.8. But in patch 1.11, someone discovered that the individual ranks of Wind Fury didn't share an internal cooldown. So if you dual wielded weapons, you could apply the highest rank of Wind Fury to your main hand weapon, and then the second highest rank of Wind Fury to your offhand and get two times the procs, which was pretty good. Until this too got nerfed, or fixed, in the Burning Crusade. Number 2, Will of the Forsaken. Will of the Forsaken was given to undead players as a racial with the launch of the game, when Blizzard decided to make undead players be counted as humanoid instead of undead, to retain some of the CC immunity that that may have provided, as being classified as undead in the beta made them immune to a lot of CC that could only be used on humanoid targets, like sheep, and just made them immune to fears altogether. So what Will the Forsaken did was break charm, fear, and sleep effects, as well as make you immune to those effects for 20 seconds. Now, 20 seconds of fear CC immunity is huge, and that was a downgraded version of what undeads could do in the beta, which was be permanently immune to them. Which is why I can see why Blizzard left that in the game for so long. Eventually, Blizzard thought giving a race 20 seconds of immunity to 3 CC effects, of which one of them, Fear, being heavily used in PvP, was a little bit unfair compared to the other racials. So they nerfed it in patch 1.6, to only make you immune to those effects for 5 seconds instead of 20. Which was still powerful, but pissed off a lot of undead players. Someone took a screenshot back in the day of a list of reasons Blizzard thought players might be quitting WoW, and one of the options available was because Will of the Forsaken was nerfed. Which was most likely a joke, but still kind of a big deal. Will of the Forsaken was always a strong racial throughout its whole life, and still gets nerfs even today, but it was at its strongest in vanilla WoW. And number one, Pyroblast, or POM Mages. Back in vanilla WoW, Blizzard balanced castable spells based on how long their cast times were. So the longer the cast time, the more damage the spell did. And Pyroblast had one of, if not the longest cast times of a single target nuke spell, clocking in at a 6 second cast time. It also had a 6 minute cooldown because it hit so hard. Now, arcane mages had this ability called Presence of Mind, which made your next spell instant cast and worked on Pyroblast. Also, they had Arcane Power, which gave them 35% more damage for 15 seconds, both of which were on a 3 minute cooldown, and neither was on the GCD. So if you had two good, on you spell power trinkets, because before patch 1.10 you could use multiple on use trinkets at once, you could just macro in Presence of Mind, Arcane Power, your spell power trinkets, and Pyroblast to create one of WoW's very first one-shot macros. Except this one was literally a one-shot macro, and not just a clickbait burst macro. You could one-shot players with this macro, but only once every three minutes. Or I guess once every six minutes before Pyroblast's cooldown was removed in late vanilla. As far as damaging abilities go, this was probably the most overpowered thing, as it was a guaranteed one-shot instant cast range nuke that didn't require skill, outside of getting two good spell power trinkets and creating the macro. Now for some honorable mentions, things I thought to put in the list but decided against for one reason or another. That's basically just Reckoning, it was a paladin talent that allowed a paladin to solo a world boss. I didn't include it though, because for one it's talked about to death, and everyone would probably be expecting it. And two, the big reason, it was only in the game for like a day or two, and it was 
obviously a bug and an oversight. I guess it would technically count, so I'm adding as an honorable mention, but these other things, you know, were actually used in the game for more than a day. Back in the Burning Crusade, Beast Mastery Hunters were the best DPS spec for Hunters. As this was still in the early days of WoW, class balance wasn't the best, and every pure DPS class had one spec, which was just way better than the other two. Now in the Burning Crusade, a new ability was given to Hunters called Steady Shot. Steady Shot was a spammable filler ability which Hunters lacked in vanilla WoW. All of the Hunter's shots before Steady Shot had cooldowns. So a Hunter's standard rotation was to use the cooldowns of all of their abilities, and then just wait for those cooldowns to come back up. All while just doing auto shot damage. And with Steady Shot, Hunters finally gained an ability to use during the downtime of waiting for their cooldown abilities to come back up. And they made the ability really good. Steady Shot just did a lot of damage in the Burning Crusade. So much so that for BM Hunters, it was a DPS loss to try to weave in other abilities. For example, the Hunter's Serpent Sting, basically their only damaging dot, would have its damage increase based on 10% of the Hunter's attack power. Pretty standard skill in with gear. Whereas Steady Shot would increase the damage based on 20% of the Hunter's attack power, and also increase in damage based on the damage of your weapon. So it had two points of scaling with your gear, and scaled a little too well. As in Wrath of the Lich King, they reduced the attack power gain from 20% down to 10%. All that to say, Burning Crusade Steady Shot was powerful, but there was a problem with only spamming Steady Shot. And that was your auto shot. Physical DPS classes, basically all melee classes and hunters, have the ability to auto attack, where their weapon will just do damage every two seconds or so, depending on the speed of your weapon. So in the early days of WoW, there were a lot of abilities that would reset or delay the timer of your weapon. So if you did an auto shot, you had to wait two and a half seconds for the next one to go off. And then if you used steady shot right as that two and a half seconds was about to end, the steady shot would go off in place of the auto shot. And then it would reset its timer, which basically just meant that auto shot would fire as soon as it was able to, since auto shot had about a half second invisible cast timer. But it would never be able to fire if you just kept spamming Steady Shot after that, causing you to miss auto shot damage, which is known as clipping your auto shots. And since Steady Shot had no cooldown and could be spammed as long as you had mana, it was real easy to accidentally clip all of your auto shots and severely lower your DPS, as auto shot damage made up a large amount of your total damage. So if doing nothing but spamming Steady Shot was the most amount of damage, but in doing so you clipped all of your auto shots, how were you supposed to perform maximum DPS? Well, this is where the macro comes in. In the Burning Crusade, it was possible to create a macro which is straight up wouldn't allow you to use Steady Shot more than every two and a half seconds, or whatever your ranged weapon speed was. So let me go over the macro and then I'll explain how it works. The macro always starts with hashtag show tooltip Steady Shot. This would just make it so that your macro would show the tooltip for Steady Shot when you moused over it because without this line in the macro, when you mouse over a macro, it won't show you anything other than the name of the macro. The next line would be for hiding script UI errors, as back then they didn't have an option to disable it by default. So since you'd be spamming one ability the whole time, you didn't want your character to constantly tell you it wasn't ready yet. Next we have the kill command macro. Kill command was an ability that wasn't on the global cooldown, but you wanted to use whenever it was available. So it was just macroed into everything and Kill Command would just tell your pet to attack the target for some extra bonus damage. And finally, you would have the Cast Sequence Reset line. Basically what you do is type in slash Cast Sequence Reset, and then you'd put the number as your ranged attack speed, and usually just add a .01 to it just to be safe. So if your ranged attack speed was 2.10, you would change it to 2.11 to allow for a margin of error. Then you'd add Steady Shot to the sequence, and then Auto Shot after it with an exclamation point in front of it, which gave it priority and reduced the chances that it would clip. Then, once both of the abilities in the cast sequence have been cast, or the timer is up, the macro would reset. And then to close off the macro, you'd have another hiding script UI error line, or a slash pet attack line, that way your pet was always attacking your target, and if you're using a Wind Serpent pet, you would add its Lightning Breath to the macro as well. So the final macro would look like this. So with this, spamming the button will allow you to use Steady Shot, and then would wait just enough time for your auto shot to go off before starting the cast of the next Steady Shot, allowing you to perfectly weave your Steady Shots with your auto shots 
without clipping any of them. And hunters would do perfectly reasonable DPS with just this macro alone, and manually using your two DPS cooldowns off cooldown, Bestial Wrath and Rapid Fire. Now, the reason this was basically a Birdie Crusade only type thing was because they changed a few things about the game after this. In Wrath of the Lich King, they made it so you could no longer clip your auto shots, so you didn't have to worry about weaving in any of your abilities to let the auto shot fire, and they also nerfed Steady Shot to no longer be ridiculously good, and kind of just nerfed BM as a whole. And they also messed with the cast sequence macro line sometime later on in WoW's history, not that you'd really need it since you don't need to worry about clipping your auto shots anymore. Basically, if you didn't have to worry about clipping your auto shots in the Burning Crusade, you wouldn't really have to worry about having a complicated macro. You could just spam Steady Shot as much as you wanted, and then just add Kill Command to the ability in a macro. You technically could macro your other two DPS cooldowns to the macro as well, as neither was on the global cooldown, but a good player will know the best time to use cooldowns on a boss fight, so you kind of want to activate those manually. And there you have it, the one button hunter rotation. Unlike most of the clickbait macro things you'll see from PvP YouTubers, this was actually a one button rotation, as long as you don't count having to activate cooldowns, or putting up Hunter's Mark before the fight. And at number 10, we have the Dark Iron Pulverizer. This is a two-handed mace that has an amazing effect, where it has a random chance on hit to stun the target for 8 seconds. That is longer than any other stun that a player character can use in-game. But from Vanilla WoW anyway, there were some expansions in which a rogue could get a 10 second kidney shot stun. But anyway, that would have made this weapon really amazing, if it wasn't for the fact that it never procced. Well, never isn't the correct term for it, it's more like you just had an incredibly low chance to proc, where if you attack something continuously for 5 minutes, you might see it proc one time. It procced so infrequently that it was basically useless and just kind of a gimmick weapon. But oh boy, if this thing did proc, then you could totally swap to a better weapon and make full use of that 8 second stun to maybe kill something. And at number 9, we have Finkel's Skinner. This was a dagger weapon that could be used as a skinny knife, and was the most sought after skinny knife in the game, because it gave you a plus 10 to your skinning level, which when combined with the plus 5 skinning enchant, allowed players to skin boss level mobs. So in order to skin Onyxia, you needed the skinning dagger and the plus 5 enchant in order to successfully accomplish that task, which was needed in order to get the scales from Onyxia, which were then used to create the cloak which was needed in order to complete Blackwing Lair. Later on in Classic WoW, they added a sword item called the Zulin Slicer, which was a drop from ZG, which gave the same effect as Finkel's Skinner, except on a sword item. So classes who couldn't use daggers could use this sword instead, and be able to actually skin boss level mobs. So despite not being a max level dagger, it was a very sought after dagger for its unique effect. Number 8, the Ravager. This was a two handed weapon drop from the Scarlet Monastery, with a special unique weird effect that had a chance on hit to force your character into basically a blade storm for 9 seconds your character would spin around and just do damage to everything within its AoE. Except, unlike Bladestorm, you couldn't move during this weapon's proc, so you were just stuck spinning around in a circle, hoping things in it wouldn't move away from you, which was entirely possible in PvE situations. Now, the damage this ability did was okay for its level, and procced a lot of good class abilities, but most people grabbed the axe because of how cool the ability looked and not really because of its usefulness as people would use this weapon at max level just to have their character spin around. They removed the ability to get this weapon and miss, so the only way to acquire this weapon again would be to wait for the classic WoW servers. And at number 7 we have a unique item called Andonius Reaper of Souls. This is a one handed sword legendary weapon that only existed for 10 minutes, but it had really good stats for those 10 minutes and did a crap ton of damage and I guess that's kind of the whole point of the limited real-time duration. The item was used during a quest chain for the Atiesh staff, where you'd fight a demon called Atiesh, who is dual wielding the sword, and drops one of them in the middle of the fight, which you can pick up in order to defeat him with it. The sword was unique for being one of only two conjured weapons in Vanilla WoW, the second being the Hammer of Expertise of course, which lasted one hour instead of ten minutes. And at number six we have the Death Blow. 
This is a two-handed sword that has a chance on hit effect to deliver a fatal wound for a set amount of damage. Now despite the fact that this weapon says it deals a fatal wound, what it really means is that it just does some extra damage. As in, this fatal wound doesn't automatically kill your target. It also doesn't mean that it only activates when the target is low on health or something. To, you know, do a fatal wound, it's just a chance on hit to proc some extra damage. Just like other weapons which state the exact same thing. Like the Jacklick Crusher, which is a chance on hit to wound the target, producing bonus damage. Fatal Wound just seems like a flavorful way to word the same thing. And there are four of the weapons of Vanilla WoW that also state they deal their bonus damage as a Fatal Wound. There's also items like the Halbert of Smiting. Unlike the Death Blow, this weapon has a chance on hit to literally decapitate the target and kill them instantly. Oh wait, it doesn't actually do that? It just does bonus damage instead? Alright, it's just another ability with a very flavorful way of saying that it does some extra bonus damage. I don't think Blizzard knows what decapitate means. Well, to be fair, this weapon did have another distinction, where its bonus damage proc could proc its bonus damage proc, kind of like how a Shaman's Wind Fury proc could proc Wind Fury. So it did have a chance to do some really good damage, but I don't think that was intended since it was hotfix later on, and just turned into a normal proc weapon. One that decapitated the target and killed them instantly, of course. And at number 5, we have the Hydro Cane. This staff, which is a drop from a boss in Nomergon, gave a little bit of frost resistance, which is okay, I guess. But it also allowed the user to just passively breathe underwater. And since this was a weapon, you could swap it in if you were underwater and fighting things, to allow your breath meter to reset, and then switch back to an actual good weapon later on. All while still being in combat. And because this item is a weapon specifically, that actually made it really useful, as you could swap it in and out during combat. So it was one of the few weapons that people could actually carry around in their bags to have in some of those just-in-case moments. You know, moments where you have to randomly be underwater for a quest for long periods of time. Moments like this almost never happened, but if they did, you'd be happy you carried around a hydro cane in your bags. And at number 4, we have the Dazzling Longsword. This sword has an effect where, when you hit a target, you have a chance to decrease their armor by about 100 for 30 seconds. So, armor pen, before that was a stat put in the game. But also, while this armor pen effect was applied, the target cannot stealth or turn invisible. So this sword item basically applied fairy fire to your target, which is really good in PvP against stealthy classes. The unfortunate thing about the sword, was that it was a main hand weapon in vanilla, so you couldn't just equip it into your offhand in order to try to fish for procs on classes which could dual wield it. And it was also a low level epic item which dropped from random mobs of around level 40, so it was hard to obtain. There was another low level weapon which was a little easier to get, called the Phantom Blade, with a similar effect except it lasted for 20 seconds instead of 30, and was also a main hand weapon. Late in the Burning Crusade, Blizzard changed both of these weapons to just be one-handed instead of main hand, which means they could be equipped in the offhand slots, in order to use its proc more effectively. Although by then, their damage would have been way too low to really mean anything in the Burning Crusade, although these two weapons seem like they would be really good twink weapons for the 30 and 40s brackets. And at number 3, we have Typhoon. This is a two-handed sword, which gave you an increased 1% chance to parry which is a really good weapon for Death Knights, who wouldn't be added to the game until two expansions later. In Vanilla WoW, tanks included warriors, and that concludes the list of classes which could tank. And warrior tanks always equipped a one-handed weapon alongside a shield, not two-handed weapons. And parry is definitely a tanking stat, so not very useful for classes who could use this as damage dealers, as they would love that stat to be something that increased their damage instead. But I guess cases could be made for PvP usages, whatever. There was also another low-level sword item called the Guardian Blade, which was a two-handed weapon that gave you bonus armor and defense stat. Two tank exclusive stats that classes that can use two-handed weapons don't really care about. But I guess cases can be made for classes using them to level up with, where having a little bit more defensive stats might matter. In case you're wondering, no, druids could not use these weapons, 
Druids cannot use swords. So even the class who only cares about the stats on the weapon couldn't make use of the defensive stats on these weapons. Plus, bears can't parry attacks anyway. And at number two, we have Sulthrays, the Lasher. This was a two-handed sword with a proc chance to debuff a target as well as put a dot on them for 15 seconds. Although it's not on this list for that proc, it's actually here because in order to obtain this weapon, you had to combine two other weapons together, which dropped from two different bosses. So far as I know, I think this is the only weapon in the game which required you to combine two weapons together in order to make it, which wasn't part of a quest or profession. So in order to make this weapon, you have to head over to Zulfarak and kill two bosses who would each drop a weapon called Jangthrays, the Protector, and Sangthrays, the Deflector. Jangthrays had an on-use effect that would combine it with a Sangthrays from your inventory in order to create Soulthrays. So unlike other created weapons, you didn't make the weapon through a profession. You literally just combine two items from your inventory to create a new one, which is unique in of itself and isn't really something, to my knowledge, that's been done since. Of course, there were some weapons which you can click on them in order to transform them into other weapons, but this isn't that, as it's literally combining two weapons to create a brand new one. And at number one, we have the Manual Crowd Pummeler. This was a two-handed mace weapon with a really good on-use effect, which would increase your attack speed by 50% for 30 seconds but with the downside that you could only use this effect three times total, and then you could never use this effect again. This is one of the few weapons in game with limited charges on its ability, that once you used all three charges, you just straight up could not use its ability anymore, and it was turned into a normal stat stick. That being said, it dropped off a low level boss in Nomergon, so if you wanted extra charges as a max level character, you could just go in there and farm it, to have multiple copies of the weapon. And this is exactly what feral druids would do. Because you see, on certain illegal servers, people have been playing older versions of WoW for many years, and have metagamed everything there is to know about those old versions of WoW. And it's through these less than legal servers that people found out that feral druids could actually pull competitive DPS as long as they just farmed out a crap ton of manual crowd pummelers. And no joke, if you look up how to perform the best DPS for Feral Druids in Vanilla WoW, they will include this weapon as part of the normal rotation. Despite the fact that you can only use the effect three times before the weapon is useless. And why does this work on Feral Druids and not other melee classes? Well, that's because Feral Druids don't care about the weapon's damage. Weapons to them were only stat sticks, as a weapon damage didn't increase their melee attack damage. So, using the Crowd Pummeler to get a 50% increase attack speed for 30 seconds, which is ridiculous I might add, was such a great effect that it let them forego the need of having actual good stats on the weapon, whereas other melee classes would be completely neutered if they had to use this weapon just for a 50% attack speed proc because if you swap this weapon to another one, the effect would end immediately. So only Feral Druids could take advantage of this effect's unique ability at max level. Of course, today, you can still get this weapon, they just removed the charge system in Burning Crusade, and gave it a more reasonable haste proc. This weapon was only available and usable in this way, in Vanilla WoW, basically. Back in Vanilla WoW, in order to fire your ranged weapon, you needed ammo to be applied to your weapon as there was a slot in your character panel to show what kind of ammo your weapon would be using. The ammo did a set amount of damage and just increased the amount of damage your ranged attacks did. So as you leveled up, you could buy stronger and stronger ammo, just like you'd buy stronger and stronger weapons today. There were special bags that could only carry ammo called quivers and ammo pouches. Only bullets for guns could be placed in ammo pouches, and only arrows for bows and crossbows could be placed in quivers, since arrows were used for both bows and crossbows, despite real-life bows and crossbows requiring different types of bolts. Now, you could equip and use bullets and arrows from any old bag, but there were some advantages to taking up one of your bag slots to use a quiver. For one, your quiver and ammo bag would actually appear on your character like any other piece of equipment. 
no other bags in game could appear on your character except these two. Now, outside of cosmetics, they also auto-reloaded your ammo into your gun or bow. You see, only hunters, rogues, and warriors could equip and use ranged weapons, but only hunters could auto-shoot with ranged weapons. Warriors and rogues had to manually shoot every shot. So when a hunter would auto-shoot, they eventually ran out of ammo mid-fight, as they were only in stacks of 200. And you'd use ammo with nearly all of your abilities, in addition to using one for each auto-attack. But once you ran out of that 200, you'd just stop shooting, which would be really bad in the middle of a boss fight. But if your ammo was in an ammo bag, like the quiver or ammo pouch, your weapon would automatically search for a new stack of the same type of ammo in that bag once it ran out, which then allowed it to auto-reload for you, as long as you had more ammo of the same type. And on top of this auto-reload feature, ammo bags also gave a haste bonus. And this is where epic quivers come from. The quality of the bag used to matter a big deal, because the maximum haste bonus you could get from your ammo bag which I might add only affected your auto shot speed, was 15%. So if you just bought a small white quality quiver from a vendor in town, it would probably only give you a 10% haste buff. But the epic quiver from the epic hunter quest chain gave the full 15%. So gearing up for a hunter required them to get one extra piece of gear in the form of a bag. Hunters were the only class in game that had to pay money to use their abilities, and had to give up one of their bag slots for a piece of their equipment. Warlocks also had soul shard bags, but they didn't give useful benefits like ammo bags did, and just had larger carrying capacity. So already, you can see some of the reasons why Blizzard felt the need to remove them, but I'll get to that part a little bit later. For now, let's talk about engineering. Ever wonder why nearly every hunter you meet is an engineer? Well, because engineers could create bullets. Good bullets too, the best bullets in the game even. But only bullets, not arrows. But you could trade in the best bullets, thorium shells, to a vendor for the arrow equivalent for free. So basically, engineers could craft the best ammo in the game. And many hunters just felt like it was a huge convenience to be able to craft the thing required to play their class. Me included, I started playing in Wrath and even then, it was just so much more convenient to be able to make my own ammo than buy it off the auction house. Then comes the Burning Crusade and Blizzard even finally let engineers just craft the arrows themselves, with the very first crafted arrows being the Adamantite Stinger. Then in Wrath of the Lich King, the trend continued Engineers could craft both bullets and arrows the whole expansion, with even the final raid, ICC, having a rep-gated engineering schematic to craft the best bullets or arrows in the game. The Ice Blade arrows were also one of the only two ways of giving your arrows a little glow with every shot. But since the cost to learn how to craft these two ammos was pretty steep at first, Buying the best ammo for your weapons from the auction house was very commonplace, and people loved to post ammo in stacks of one to troll the auction house. Because you see, ammo could only stack up to 200, which wasn't changed until mid-wrath when the stack was increased to 1000. And hunters needed tons of ammo, and since it was basically the largest quantities of things one could buy from the auction house, it wasn't uncommon for people to troll the auction house by posting ammo in stacks of one to try to trick players into spending a lot of gold on one ammo, which was almost useless. You only ever wanted to buy full stacks of ammo, and I think this was also another reason it was removed. Using the default auction house interface to buy ammo was a nightmare with just how many people flooded the market with single ammo auctions which caused pretty much every hunter to have to be very careful when they bought ammo from the auction house. In TBC, the legendary bow that dropped from Kill Jaden had a special effect of not needing any ammo to use as it created its own magical arrows when it fired, making it a very loved quality of life legendary that wasn't very useful, 
as it was obtained from the last tier of raiding and was made useless come the new expansion. That does make me wonder if hunters with that bow still had a quiver equipped when using it though. Now let's go back to quivers and ammo pouches for a bit. For all of vanilla and TBC, ammo bags gave the hunter a bonus to auto shot speed, which made them basically a piece of gear that they had to upgrade. But in Wrath's early patch 3.1, this attack speed was removed from ammo bags and instead was just baked into auto shot baseline. And for the longest time, the auto shot tooltip would even say that it gave a 15% haste in addition to letting you auto shoot ranged weapons. With this change, the only benefit of having special bags was their increased carrying capacity for ammo and the auto load mechanic. But once Cataclysm hit and they removed ammo from the game, Quivers and ammo pouches were just turned into regular bags and no longer showed up on your character, effectively removing them from the game. Now, why was ammo removed from the game? Well, like I mentioned earlier on in the video, hunters were the only class in the game who had to pay for every shot they fired, and most abilities also consumed in ammo even if their power wasn't modified by it in any way. Hunters had one more chore to deal with that other classes didn't, and it was a pretty big deal if they ignored it. Running out of ammo in the middle of fight meant doing almost no DPS, as you had to run in and do melee damage, which was not very good. If anything, removing ammo was just the logical choice, as they didn't really need it outside of class fantasy stuff. Now, lots of hunters complained about its removal, and still do. But one of the more valid complaints about the removal of ammo was the loss of quivers and ammo pouches, since there is no way to get that look back outside of the MM artifact weapon. So for Warlords of Draenor, Blizzard announced this new exciting thing called Class Accessories, which would be a way to give hunters their quivers and ammo pouches back, finally after all these years but they wouldn't come into a later patch in Warlords, and they could even be leveled up to change their appearances. What a new, fun, and exciting thing Warlords was going to add. Now, you might be wondering, what? There's no such thing as class accessories, though. And yeah, you're right. This was one of the many things scrapped from Warlords of Draenor. Or more like Warlords of... Scrap content. But seriously, there was so much thrown out from that expansion. I'll link a video at the end of this one going over most of it. But yeah, Class Accessories was the last we've heard of any kind of return to quivers and ammo pouches. I'd guess since MM Hunters did get quivers with their artifact appearance, Blizzard just called it a day and left it as is. But I've heard rumors that Blizzard didn't abandon class accessories quite yet, and more or less put them on hold to work on artifact weapons. But I don't know how true that is. In this video, we're going over the history of some of the rare mounts in Vanilla WoW. Mounts that people knew about, but were very difficult to obtain for one reason or another. First up, we have the Winter Spring Frost Saber. This was a mount only available to Alliance players and simply required you to grind out the reputation known as the Winter Saber Trainers. There were only two NPCs in the game associated to this rep, and only one of them would actually talk to you or did anything. So in Winter Spring you could talk to an NPC known as River and Frostwind, who would give you a quest to go kill some bears and Chimera in the nearby area, and after you completed it, you would get around 50 rep. And then the quest would turn to be repeatable, so you could do it over and over again to get more reputation. After a bit of rep, you unlocked another quest which would ask you to kill some Furbolg, that would then also become repeatable after you completed it, giving another avenue for 50 more rep per completion. And then once you had honored, you'd unlock the last repeatable quest, the Rampaging Giants, which had you go out and kill around 8 elite giants in the area, for a total of 75 rep, which generally wasn't worth it compared to the other two quests. And because the only way to get rep was through these three repeatable quests, they would take the average non-human 840 quest completions before you got exalted. Or 746 if you included the giant quests as well. And we're talking about vanilla WoW quests with low drop chances and spawn rates, 
and of course actually hard elite mobs, so doing 840 of these was kind of insane. And at the end of it, it would simply unlock the vendor which would allow you to purchase the Frost Saber for 900 gold. But at least it was an epic mount that could be used with the basic training, so it could save you some gold on a mount if you didn't want to unlock epic training. The only reason this mount was rare was because it was hard to obtain, and because it was Alliance only. In the Burning Crusade, when Blood Elves were added to the game, they weren't initially hostile to this NPC, and could talk to it in order to get neutral reputation, although they still couldn't accept or do any of the quests for them, so that never went anywhere beyond that. And eventually this little bug was fixed, and they had the reputation removed. They also greatly increased the amount of reputation you gained from this in the Burning Crusade, by a magnitude of five times, so you only had to complete a measly 168 quests in order to get exalted, which is still a lot. In Cataclysm, they removed the old method for how to obtain this mount, and instead added a much more simple daily quest system, where you do a series of 20 dailies in order to get it instead. And then they finally added a horde equivalent in Wrath of the Lich King, which was an Ungoro Crater and awarded a Raptor instead. And if you complete either of these quests in Retail WoW, you'll be given the other one on the opposite faction, so you don't need to unlock both of them. Next up we have the Unarmored Class Epic Mounts. Before patch 1.4, every race except the Undead who had the option to buy the 100% speed epic mounts, only had the option to buy different colored versions of their normal 60% speed mounts. And since patch 1.4 was only 5 months into the launch of the game, there were not a lot of people who were able to actually obtain the epic mounts yet. Because you see, in early vanilla, mounts didn't really have training, and instead were just items that had level requirements on them. So if you had a mount, you could just use it. And in order to purchase the epic mounts, they cost 1000 gold which is equivalent to around half a million gold in retail's currency. So being able to farm that out within the first five months was not something a lot of people did. In fact, most people didn't even make it to max level within that time, let alone also farm out the equivalent to half a million gold. So the amount of people who actually owned one of the unarmored versions was very small. Made even smaller by the fact that when they did introduce the armored versions of the mount to the game, they added the option to trade in the old ones for the new ones. So a lot of people traded in their very rare color variations for the new, better looking armored ones, without knowing they were trading away future rare mounts. The only races it didn't really apply to were the undead, because they were already given armored versions of their epic mounts from the beginning for some reason. And that's probably why they decided to slap armor on the rest of the mounts as well, to kind of copy the undead. And now we'll go into the raid drop mounts. First up we have the ZG mounts, the Swift Razashi Raptor and the Swift Zulian Tiger. Both of these mounts had about a 1% drop chance from ZG, which was a 20 man raid. These were the first rare boss drops in the game, something they'll do once in a while to this day. As in Cataclysm they would start mixing in some guaranteed boss drops from doing hard tasks, then change to 1% later on. Mounts were very rare and few and far in between in vanilla. Finding a way to get a mount without paying the normal fee at a vendor was a huge benefit. So having them be a low drop chance from a raid made them an extra special reward. So there was already a 1 in 100 chance of getting them from a kill on a boss associated to the two mounts, but you also had to win a roll against 20 other people who probably never seen them drop either. Assuming the raid leader didn't just ninja loot the mount, or you weren't in a raid where the officers had the mounts in reserve for themselves. So you just had to be really lucky in order to obtain these mounts, and they were made even rarer once they removed them from the game in Cataclysm, when they revamped that raid zone as a dungeon. And for one of the other drop chance mounts, we have the Death Charger's Reigns from Stratholm, which had an even lower drop chance than the ZG mounts, with most people speculating that it had around a 0.2% drop chance, which was later buffed in WoW to a 1% drop chance in Wrath of the Lich King. In order to get the mount, all you had to do was go to the dungeon in Stratholm and kill the last boss, Lord Arius Rivendare, and get very lucky by winning a roll against 4 to 9 other people, since dungeons weren't capped at 5 people back then. Probably a big reason for this mount's much lower drop chance was because it dropped from a dungeon rather than a raid, and it's much easier to farm a dungeon over and over than it is a raid for the simple facts that dungeons require less people to complete, and could be completed multiple times a day instead of once a week. So it kind of made sense in that regard. The mount itself was just a different color of the Forsaken Epic Racial mount, so it was one of the few ways for Alliance players to ride around on the skeletal horse. And for a time, this mount was even one of the rarest items in the game, period. Next, we'll talk about the legendary mount, the Black Karaji Battle Tank. 
This mount was only obtainable for about 10 hours after the launch of the AQ40 event, which required a person to complete one of the longest quest chains in the game's history, that was also one of the hardest quest chains to complete in the game's history, and then ring the gong after the whole server came together and donate enough materials to start the event. Since the quest chain was so difficult to complete and basically required an entire guild funneling all their resources into one player, the amount of people who were able to actually complete the quest before the very limited 10 hour duration was very small. Which is why even to this day, the Black Karaji Battle Tank is still one of the rarest mounts in the game's history. There are other colors of this mount that will drop that are much easier to get inside of the AQ40 raid, so it is actually pretty easy to get a Karaji mount. The only advantage the Black Battle Tank had over the others was being usable outside of the instance, which actually kind of made the ability a little bit buggy. No pun intended. You see, the mount allowed you to start casting it while you were still in combat, but wouldn't actually mount you up if you were still in combat by the time it finished casting, which didn't really give you much of an advantage, but was a distinction that wasn't shared by any other mounts until that was fixed. There was also a really minor bug in patch 2.2, where if a character logged out while they were on the mount when that patch went live, they would log in to find their character transformed into a flying wasp. This was only a one-time occurrence though, as the buff wasn't available by any other means and simply went away if you clicked it off or mounted up again. This might have been an intentional internal thing, as on the PTR for Wrath of the Lich King's launch, the Black Karanji battle tank had a tooltip change which roughly said that the mount would change depending on your writing skill and location, and if tested in locations that allowed you to fly, the mount would turn into a wasp and allow you to fly in that way, although this functionality was removed before the patch released. And currently, the mount is still a ground mount which can't actually fly. And also, it was possible for people to obtain the mount in Wrath of the Lich King. When Blizzard opened up a couple of new servers, these fresh servers never had their gates opened in AQ40. So players would rush to complete the quest as quickly as possible in order to obtain this incredibly rare mount. And now, we'll talk about possibly one of the rarest mounts in the game's history, but, you know, actually which is probably not in the game anymore, and that's the fluorescent green Mechano Strider. This was an alt color of the Mechano Strider mount that gnomes received, which wasn't available to players in the game, but was a model in the game's files. One day, a player had a problem with his mount and messaged a GM about it, who sent him a replacement and accidentally sent him this alt color version, which wasn't supposed to be available to players. The player was allowed to keep the mount though, and was the only person in the game who had it and you can't really beat a rare mount that only one person total has. Way later on down the road, the mount was removed from the character's collection sheet, like more than 10 years after, but we don't actually know the exact reason why. There's lots of speculations and rumors online though, that the person who owned the account tried to sell it during Warlords of Draenor on a WoW cheating site, and the tagline that he had was having the rarest mount in the game on his account, so Blizzard removed it from his collection. Now, I have no confirmation for this, I have looked into it pretty extensively, and it seems to be exclusively a rumor with no evidence other than other people and websites talking about the same rumors. But it's a very popular one. Whatever the case, it seems like the player who owned the mount no longer plays the game, so you'll probably never see it in-game unless they add the mount to the game later on in some other fashion. Next up, we have the Riding Turtle. This was a TCG loot card added to the game during Vanilla WoW, even though most of the other more famous TCG loot mounts were added during the Burning Crusade. And what the Riding Turtle did was simply allow you to mount up on a mount that didn't actually increase your running speed. In fact, it was slower on most occasions, since it used mount speed modifiers to move. So if you had any way to increase your speed while running, it wouldn't work on the mount. Although if you had a way to increase your mount speed, they would work on it. Since it was one of the earliest, if not the first, TCG loot card mount added to the game, when you typed in the code for the loot card to get the mount, you would only get on that one character on one server. So you wouldn't get on all of your characters until they added account-wide mounts in Mr. Pandaria. The turtle didn't actually increase your swim speed until Wrath of the Lich King, when they added the aquatic mount system to the game with the sea turtle being an obtainable mount. Although they didn't really increase your swim speed as much as they do today, as they didn't get a buff to the swim speed until Legion. But at least it was slightly more useful than just a mount that didn't actually increase your movement or swim speed at all, and was purely a vanity item that you could ride around in town for looks. Especially with how rare it was because it sold out so quickly, and you could only have it on a single character. The mount was also a white item when it was first introduced to the game, so if you accidentally deleted the item, it wouldn't give you a confirmation if you wanted to delete it or not. 
since the protection only applied to blue or higher items, until the Burning Crusade when the item was properly changed to an epic quality item. Now let's talk about the Reigns of the Bengal Tiger. This was a very popular mount rumor that was never actually added to the game, but did appear in the alpha and was already coded and good to go in the game files. The Bengal Tiger mount rumor basically stated that you could get the mount in the actual game by doing some wall hopping in Stranglethorn Vale to get to the hidden cave, where a female vendor would sell you the mount. Many people did the wall jumping required to get to this cave, but it was always empty. There was speculation that the vendor was on a one month respawn timer, or that only one person per realm could buy from it, but no one ever saw her because she never existed. What made the rumors more credible was there was actual in-game screenshots of the mount. According to some comment threads online, the mount was given to all players in one of the early alpha or beta builds so they could get around quicker, which is where most of the screenshots of the mountain game came from, and then later on they all came from private servers. But just like the famous Ashbringer rumors, the in-game rumors never went anywhere. But exactly like the Ashbringer rumors, Blizzard did put a nod to the rumors in-game eventually. With a revamp of the old zones, Blizzard added a quest to the game that actually sends you to this cave, and then you get a cat pet as a reward. Not exactly a mount, but close enough. Another thing to note about the Bengal Tiger mount, if you look at which races can use it, it includes all of the vanilla races except the Torrents. This really shows you how early on in the alpha the mount was scrapped, since back then, Torrents were going to be given an ability to run as fast as mounts rather than giving any actual mounts to ride but Blizzard eventually decided to scrap that idea and gave Torrens the ability to ride mounts. But not before they scrapped the Bengal Tiger mount, apparently. I recall an email that we got from Chris Metzen. Chris was incensed about something he had seen in some promotional materials where one of the designers had put a night elf on an orange tiger mount. Chris lost it. He was like, night elves should be on dark tigers only black tigers, purple tigers, but never, ever, ever should a night elf be found on an orange tiger. So uh, Rob emailed us all and reminded us that night elves could only be riding on approved tiger palette mounts. For this video, I thought it would be fun to read through the manual that came with Vanilla WoW and compare some of the things it says with how the game works today. I'll be honest, a lot of the things are still mostly the same but there were a few very noticeable differences. Like for one, the manual says that each faction only has four races. As of making this video, there are nine available races to each faction, for a total of 18 playable races. Each faction individually now has more playable races than the combined amount of Horde and Alliance races from Vanilla WoW. And there are still four more races planning on being added soon with Blizzard promising even more down the road. The manual also says there's only nine classes to choose from, and that paladins are alliance only, and shamans are horde only. Well, there's only 12 classes to choose from today, so only three more since Vanilla WoW. The amount of new classes added since then isn't that drastic, like the amount of playable races. Also, Shamans and Pallies were made cross-faction the very next expansion in the Burning Crusade. Faction-exclusive classes didn't stay in the game very long. In a screenshot of the in-game user face, on the mini-map, it has an indication for the day-slash-night clock. In current WoW, at night, it only gets slightly darker, while in vanilla, it was a much bigger deal, so that part of the mini-map doesn't exist anymore. Characters gain access to new spells and abilities whenever they gain levels. To learn these new abilities, you must speak to your class trainer. In current WoW, you learn all of your spells automatically, and the only classes that still need to visit the trainers are mages to learn new portals. If you ask the ghost healer to resurrect you, you will lose a significant portion of experience. This amount will never force you to lose a level. Now, this part of the manual surprised me. I didn't know they had planned on making you lose experience on death. This never made it into vanilla though, and was only in beta stages of WoW. You see, in other MMOs at the time, that was pretty standard. I've heard stories of people dying a few times in raids, and having to go back out and 
level up again before being able to do more attempts due to the level loss. And one of the main appeals of WoW was its less punishing nature to deaths. And the fact that running around in the world didn't have load screens, which was like magic to people back then, making it seem like a real open world. Although, one of the next paragraphs in the manual says, it is almost always better to run to your corpse rather than ask a spirit healer to resurrect you. That's because all you lose when you run to your corpse is time. Which means you were only supposed to lose experience when rezzing from a spirit healer. You'll notice over the course of this video that the manual will say a few things that never even made it into vanilla WoW. Which means the manual was probably written with beta WoW as a reference. Certain character classes can cast spells to raise you from the dead. The priest, shaman, and paladin all have resurrection spells. Notice how they do not list the druid among the classes that can res. Druids did have a battle res in vanilla though, just not a regular res for some reason. They were eventually given a normal res pretty early on in the game's life cycle, but I'm not sure if it was in vanilla WoW. Also a note on resurrection sickness. When you are resurrected by a spell or soul stone, you revive with a condition called resurrection sickness. Resurrection Sickness did exist, it was just applied by player reses and not the spirit healers. Nowadays, player reses impose no such disadvantages, and resing at the spirit healer gives res sickness. Critters are non-combative animals, such as sheep, rabbits, cows, and prairie dogs. These animals will never fight you, even if you attack them. Killing a critter earns you no experience. Little did they know about pet battles, which would be added only eight years later. Also, critters will attack you if you get into combat with them. They just don't do very much damage. This next part will be about various stats. Strength determines the physical power of your character. A high strength improves your attack power. Strength is also a determining factor in how much damage you block if you use a shield. Rogues and Hunters only use a partial value of strength to determine their power. Now, strength still kind of works the same way, only I'm not sure if it still increases the amount you can block, but it no longer provides any benefit to Rogues and Hunters. It used to be, I think, that strength classes would get two attack power per point of strength, and other classes would just get one attack power per point of strength. So while it wasn't as useful, it was still not half bad if you had a piece of gear with strength on it as a rogue or hunter. Which was probably the case quite frequently because vanilla pieces of gear were a mess when it came to which stats they had. Now onto agility. Agility improves your armor rating, your chance to dodge an attack, and your chance to score a critical hit with a melee or ranged attack, thus dealing increased damage. Rogues and Hunters also use agility in combination with strength to determine their attack power. Old school agility was so nice. Current day agility just gives attack power, but it used to also give an increase to dodge, an increase to armor, and an increase to crit. It was good to the point where tanks didn't really mind it on a piece of gear, all the way up until late wrath. Plus the vanilla version gave Rogues and Hunters two attack power per point and other classes only one. But then in the Burning Crusade it was changed only one attack power per point for all classes because I guess Blizzard thought agility was too overpowered as is for all the different stats it gave on top of attack power. But then it was changed back to two attack power for agility classes in Cataclysm I think. And its other bonus effects weren't removed into Warlords of Draenor. So nowadays, agility only gives attack power and nothing else. Stamina affects your hit points, no matter what class you play. However, characters designed to absorb damage, such as warriors and paladins, gain more benefit from stamina than classes who have other capabilities, such as rogues and druids, who in turn gain more benefit from pure spellcasters, such as mages. This might be a little misleading, as stam was the same for all classes, it's just some classes could take talents that gave them more health and stuff like that. Intelligence improves your mana reserves. Intelligence has no bearing on non-spellcasting classes. 
Int used to increase your max mana all the way up until Mista Pandaria, I believe. They also made it so that it gave you a little bit of spell crit later on. Despite what it says about not being usable for non-spell casters, Int was a very highly valued stat by hunters for quite some time. I'm just not 100% sure if they liked it all that much in Vanilla WoW though, but they did like it in TBC and Wrath. Also, Int used to increase, like, how fast you could gain weapon skills. So, it was kind of useful for melee classes, just not in any kind of raid or PvP setting. <laughs> and more in a pure, put on intellect pieces of gear when you go out and grind weapon skills. Spirit determines the regeneration rate for your health and mana. A high spirit results in much faster regeneration, while a low spirit gives you reduced regeneration. Spirit is no longer in the game, and pretty much functioned the same way as it says here until it was removed. Also, Blizzard was trying to push the angle that all classes needed spirit and not just healers, and that's why I think some pieces of warrior gear had spirit on it, because it did increase your health as well as mana only out of combat. <laughs> there wasn't really a way to give you that out of combat regeneration in combat outside of a very infamous troll racial that everybody made fun of for being bad. All characters start at level 1 in the game and can advance in level by learning experience. The level cap in the game is 60. Once you achieve level 60, you cannot gain any more levels. Keep in mind that as an online role-playing game, World of Warcraft is always being updated with extra content. While at its release, the game has a level cap of 60, this cap will increase in future as the game continues to evolve. As of reading this now, the level cap is expected to be raised to two times the level cap of Vanilla WoW. Just goes to show how long ago this was. Experience is the only means of advancing your character levels, and is gained in two primary ways. Most experience comes from defeating monsters and from completing quests. A third means of getting experience, exploring the world, gives you so little experience compared to the two primary methods that it can't really help you gain character levels. Nowadays, there are a few more ways to get XP outside of the three listed in the manual. You now also get experience from battlegrounds, collecting materials from gathering professions, finding treasures, and from pet battles, in addition to killing monsters, exploring, and doing quests. Your class skills, which determine the effectiveness of your class spells and abilities, do not automatically improve when you level up. Instead, they improve as you use them. However, the skill cap you have in class skills does increase when you gain a level. For example, as a first level priest, your maximum skill level in holy magic is 5. As you cast holy spells, your holy skill will eventually max out at 5 points, until you advance to the next level and your holy magic skill cap increases. This was the old system of spell skills, which never made it into vanilla WoW. But weapon skills did make it into the game and worked exactly how it's listed here. Except for, you know, only using weapons instead of spells. The four slots at the bottom of your character window are for your handheld equipment. The first slot is for your primary hand, the second slot is for your offhand, hand, the third slot is for your ranged weapon, and the fourth slot is for your ammunition. Nowadays, we only have two slots for weapons, not four. It used to be you could have two melee weapons equipped along with a ranged weapon at the same time. The ranged weapon was almost exclusively just a stat stick for all classes except hunters. So Blizzard just removed it and moved ranged weapons and wands to the main hand slot. Although I guess an argument could be made that many casters did use their wands also, except you only ever wanded something if you didn't want to use mana. <laughs> so when Blizzard kind of fixed the whole casters never run out of magic thing, they didn't really need wands anymore. For this next part, the manual lists all the types of item quality in the game. You know, gray, white, green, blue, and purple. And then hints that there may be a more powerful type out there. Obviously hinting at legendary. But in addition to those types, including legendaries, 
we now have the artifact quality, heirloom quality, and a quality only used for the WoW token. The manual lists all the classes and a little bit of info about them, so for this first part, I'll basically just summarize a few things that stood out to me, and not be comparing every little thing. For warriors, it details the importance of the stances they used to have, and lists some of the weapons they can use as advanced, including the ability to wear plate armor, which I think was just kind of a leftover thing from copying D&D, because it never really meant anything in game, other than needing to learn how to use those weapons from weapon trainers out in the world, rather than just starting out being able to use those weapons. For mages, it says, A fragile class with little health and poor fighting ability. However, they make up for this physical weakness with their awesome spellcasting. Mages can dish out the most ranged damage in the shortest time. I thought that was funny. Mages are supposed to be a fragile class, which I mean, isn't entirely wrong today either. Mages are still kind of squishy, it's just they also have one of the best defensive cooldowns in the form of Ice Block. Mages did have Ice Block back then as well, it's just raid mechanics have changed over time where a class with a full immunity cooldown is more valuable than a DPS class that just takes mildly less damage baseline. Also, the point about them being able to do the most range damage in the shortest time might still be true today. I'm not exactly an expert on which classes have the most burst damage, but I do remember back in Dragon Soul when guilds were progressing on the spine of Deathwing, a fight which basically only required classes with the most burst possible. Half of the raids on all of the world first kills were comprised of mages for their burst damage. And from what I've read online, mages are still top tier when it comes to burst, but you know, not overwhelming like that. While the Shaman, Druid, and Paladin can also heal, none of them can heal as well as the Priest. Also, the Priest has better resurrection spells than the Paladin or Shaman. Can you imagine a game in which the manual said something like this in an MMO today? Nowadays, all the healers are pretty equal. Priests just have two healing specs instead of one. Also, I'm not sure what it means about priests being better at rezzing. Maybe priests brought them back to life with like more health or something? Which I guess is technically better, but I mean, still not a lot. For the rogue page, funny enough, a lot of the stuff is still kind of the same. Other than the fact that they also have a list of advanced weapons they can learn. Fun fact about Cheap Shot. Cheap Shot is one of the few abilities in the game that still works exactly the same as it did in Vanilla WoW. Their powerful buffs are among the best in the game, able to boost all attributes in addition to conferring strong armor and resistance bonuses. Their offensive spells, while good, are not meant as the druid's main strength. I love how the druid's selling point as their Mark of the Wild buff. Poor hybrid classes in vanilla, they just got the short end of the stick. Nowadays, they're properly balanced and no longer give that buff which was their selling point. Although, it is planned to make a return in the next expansion. The Pally page basically just talks about their auras and seals they used to have, plus mentions a few times about how they excel at fighting undead, which apparently was a selling point in vanilla. Nowadays, they still kind of have auras and seals, just not in the way that they existed in vanilla WoW. And also, they no longer excel at fighting undead, but they do have some, like, flavor interactions with them in one or two abilities. The shaman's unique power is totems. Totems are spiritual objects that a shaman must earn through questing. Once earned, a totem enables a shaman to cast totem spells associated with that totem's element. Totem spells can be purchased from a trader, although, in order to cast a totem spell, the appropriate elemental totem must be carried in the shaman's inventory. Totems are almost exclusively cooldowns now, but that was once what shamans were all about, and their selling point. 
you no longer need to go on crazy long quests to get your totem items to be able to use your totem abilities. Elemental shamans can still drop four totems at once with a talent, but those are mainly just there as like a fluff way of giving you passive buffs and don't function like old school buff totems that gave everyone a buff. A hunter's pet must be kept happy or it will leave you and even turn on you. For those of you who don't know, hunter pets once had a happiness bar, and if it was too unhappy, it would run away from you. Also, pets just lost happiness over time, so if you AFK'd in a city long enough without feeding your pet, it could leave you. Once a character achieves 10th level, it will begin earning talent points at the rate of 1 per level. Talent points can then be spent at the talents window. Every class has three lines of talents not including a character's racial talents list. All right, let's stop there. Racial talents? Now that's a new one. As many of you probably know, there were no such things as racial talents in Vanilla WoW. And in fact, I had no idea what this could be referring to as I don't think it showed up in the beta either. But then I remembered a video I made last year in which another YouTuber helped me out with an alpha client patch, which included skill points. So, I went back and watched my video, and what do you know? Those skill points were indeed called talent points, and even had a TP next to their little indication saying what you needed to spend on them. Now, how these worked was that you got talent points as you leveled up, a lot more than one, and could spend them on an incredibly large selection of talents ranging from giving 2% increased chance to parry while wielding a two-handed axe, not two-handed weapons in general, literally just two-handed axes. Also another for 2% more crit with two-handed axes, 2% 2 more attack power, and so on and so on. Same for all other weapons and spell schools, like a talent to increase your holy magic skill at the cost of reduced shadow resistances. There were a ton of talents like this, going over a wide range of incredibly specific things, and actually looked really neat, if not a tad bit cumbersome. Although these didn't make it into beta WoW, so this manual might have had this part written during an alpha WoW development stage. And now to continue on with the rest of this article from the game manual. Talent points can be spent to purchase talents which can do a variety of things. Many talents can improve your class's existing abilities, give you new abilities, or improve your class skills. All classes have the same talent points, but no single character can hope to acquire every single talent. Thus, there are many talent choices open to your character, and your choices will help differentiate you from other players playing the same class. Talents are still technically in the game, but they work nothing like how they're listed here. Nowadays, you get a new talent once every 15 levels or so, and you just choose one of three abilities. Also, there it goes again talking about class skills, which never made it to life. In addition, there are race restrictions on weapon skills. Gnome warriors, for example, cannot use bows, while night elf warriors can't use guns. I did not know about this. Apparently, it was planned for some races to not be able to use certain weapons. I'm pretty sure that didn't make it into Vanilla WoW though, and instead, races just got racial bonuses if you used a certain weapon, like trolls getting a bonus for using bows and dwarfs getting a bonus for using guns. To harvest an herb, simply right click on it. If you have the necessary skill level, you'll almost always open a loot window containing the herbs you found. If you get a message telling you that you failed to harvest the herb, simply retry it. Apparently, you could fail when trying to herb or mine. That is not the case today. Every character can learn up to two trade skills. This enables a player to be self-sufficient and choose one gathering trade skill and one production trade skill. Alternatively, you could learn two gathering trade skills or two production trade skills. No character can learn more than two trade skills. However, Secondary skills, such as fishing and cooking, do not follow under this restriction. Notice how it doesn't list first aid as a secondary skill. 
Also, later on in the manual, it lists first aid under the production trade skills, like blacksmithing and leatherworking, which hints that first aid was meant to be a primary profession for some time. Nowadays, first aid is a secondary profession, although it is planned on being removed in the next expansion. Hearthstone can only be used every 60 minutes, so after you use a Hearthstone, you must wait another hour before you can use it again. Nowadays, Hearthstones have a 30 minute cooldown, and can be lowered to 15 minutes through a guild perk. But for the longest time, it did have a 1 hour cooldown that couldn't be lowered. As with aerial mount travel, only Horde players may use the Horde Zeppelins, and only Alliance players may use the Alliance ships. I assume this means you couldn't sneak onto ships as Horde and use them at one point? Because today, as long as you can sneak onto boats or Zeppelins, they work for both factions. It's just they're surrounded by hostile NPCs. Each race has its own unique type of mount, except for Torin, who are too big to ride animals and must resort to their plane's running racial ability. Yeah, that did not make it into Vanilla WoW. Torrens were given Kodos to ride eventually. Now, all races can ride pretty much any mount, and there's just faction restrictions instead of racial ones. There are three auction houses in the world. A Horde auction house in Orgrimmar, an Alliance auction house in Ironforge, and a neutral auction house in the Goblin City of Gadgetson. Auctioneers exist within these auction houses and allow you to buy or sell items without having to go through the trade channel. There are now auction houses in pretty much every major city, and even in your garrison. Plus, they're all connected now. That was not the case in Vanilla WoW. Honor points. As you kill opposing players and special PvP-enabled non-player characters, you will earn honor points. You also gain honor points for conquering contested battlegrounds and slaying important NPCs, such as leaders and generals of the opposing faction. At the end of each day, these honor points will be distributed to all players who participated in PvP gameplay, with players contributing the most kills for their side earning the most points. These honor points accumulate to give you a PvP rank, which can fluctuate based on your participation and success in PvP play. Honor points basically worked this way in vanilla, and were later on changed into a currency you just got immediately after doing PvP stuff. And then today, it's just how you level up your honor talents. Dishonor points. Even among enemies as bitter as the Horde and Alliance, there is honor. If you flaunt this honor and engage in objectionable PvP play, such as killing new players vastly inferior to your level, or killing essential non-combat NPCs such as flight masters or quest givers, you will earn dishonor. If you accumulate enough dishonor through your criminal actions, you will be branded an outlaw. As a consequence, you'll suffer experience penalties, lose access to your own faction cities, and become so hated by even your own. Now, dishonor points did make it into the game, but they did not work nearly as drastic as it says in the manual. Dishonor basically just made it so you lost any honor you gained at the end of the week. It was like, just negative honor points. And sometimes people would group up with people who they wanted to lose honor points, and go around and kill a bunch of vendors and quest NPCs to tank their rating. However, let's go over a little bit more about dishonor points in the manual too. Recovering Dishonor World of Warcraft is forgiving of transgressions, and if you refrain from dishonorable actions for a long enough time, you will eventually return to favor with your faction and cast off your criminal label. So, it seems like you would have been able to return to normal plane status eventually. And finally, at the end, there are maps of the old world. Lots of it are still the same, kind of. The Cataclysm did change a lot of things around, but I'm kind of comparing this to like Vanilla WoW's version. But on the Eastern Kingdom segment, you can clearly see the island of Kul Taras, Tol Barad, and Zoldar. Tolbarad wasn't added to the game until Cataclysm. Kulturas won't be added until the next expansion, and Zoldar is still not in the game. Zoldar is an island the Horde used in the Second War to stage their invasion into Lordaeron, and shows up in the first mission in Warcraft 2, I think. So all three islands have been in the game's lore for quite some time, but it's funny to see how close they are to everything on this map and they are in such drastically different locations in-game. Many people will refer to rogues in Vanilla WoW as over 
overpowered, and point to the fact that they could stunlock someone forever until death as proof of this. But could rogues really do that? And where did this infamy come from? Back in Vanilla WoW, rogues had a lot of things going well for them. Before patch 1.8, slow weapons did a lot more damage than faster weapons for instant attacks, which affected rogues most use combo generator Sinister Strike. Rogues could macro weapons into abilities with no cooldown on weapon swapping, so you could always hit with the sword for Sinister Strike, and always hit with a dagger for backstabs whenever you wanted. Eviscerate, Rogue's main way of spending combo points, just did a large sum of static damage, and didn't scale with anything. It also did really good damage for what it was, and could do about 50% of a player's health as damage to low armor targets with a crit. Plus, DRs on CC abilities were a lot more lax during this time period, and PvP trinkets didn't remove all types of CC, only certain kinds. If you cheap shot someone for a 4 second stun, then used Vanish and cheap shot again right after, the next one would only be for 2 seconds. It's just lots of abilities didn't share DRs like they do today, and rogues had a lot of different CC abilities. Rogues had a total of 5 good CC abilities they could use. Cheap Shot, which required them to be in stealth to use and stun the target for 4 seconds and gave 2 combo points. Kidney Shot, which with 5 combo points could stun for 6 seconds, and did not share DRs with Cheap Shot. So if you use Kidney Shot right after a Cheap Shot, you could stun someone for 10 seconds. Gouge, which incapacitated the target for 4 seconds, which broke on damage and could only be used from the front. Sap, which could only be used in stealth, incapacitated the target for over 10 seconds, but did remove you from stealth during this time period. And finally Blind, which caused the target to wander back and forth for about 10 seconds and also broke on damage. Of these 5 CCs, Cheap Shot and Kidney Shot were the most used and useful, but the other abilities absolutely contributed to the infamous status of the Stunlock Rogues. Most people just incorrectly associate Stunlock Rogues to only Cheap and Kidney Shot. So, where does this infamy come from? In Vanilla WoW, a user put out a video by the name of World of Roguecraft that wanted to prove that a rogue who knew how to play his class was unbeatable and showed this by getting on a rogue with no gear and only a starting zone dagger, going out into the world and ganking high level PvPers. And with most of these kills, the rogue never took any damage, and was able to seemingly stunlock a player to death. But surprisingly, stuns played a very small part in these CC chains. The real MVP of these videos was blind. The player would go up and open with a cheap shot, build combo points, vanish, and then cheap shot again, only with a 2 second duration. After those 6 seconds of stuns were over, he would use blind, and then just wait to leave combat, re-stealth, and then sap. Wait to leave combat again, and then re-stealth and pop preparation. Preparation was a cooldown that reset all other row cooldowns. That way, he was good to go for another rotation. The reason he waits through a full blind and sap is to let Cheap Shot come off DRs. If we count up all the seconds of CC, that's 6 seconds for Cheap Shot, 10 seconds for blind, about 10 seconds for sap, for a total of around 26 seconds of CC. Only to reset the cooldowns of blind to do it all over again. And during these two 26 second long CC chains, the rogue also gets in at least two Cold Blood Eviscerates. Cold Blood, of course, was a cooldown that caused your next attack to have 100% crit chance. Which, remember, Eviscerate could crit for nearly 50% the health of a geared, low armor target in Vanilla WoW. That, with a combination of a few other hits and maybe one other normal Eviscerate, could kill a player in a 1v1 situation even if, over the course of the 50 second fight, only 12 seconds of that were spent in a stun. Although, the main power to the stun lock was actually blind. Blind is the MVP of the stun rogue rotation, yet you don't hear about the infamous blind rogues. In fact, blind was so strong with preparation resets that for the rest of WoW after vanilla, Blizzard made sure it excluded blind from being reset, 
starting with the start of the Burning Crusade. So what about just pure stun rooks? Well, in the same video, the character shows duels in the open world with an actual geared rogue, and uses thistle tea with good gear and an item that refills your energy bar. The rogue was able to kill some people with only a cheap shot kidney shot combo. So he really did kill people in a 10 second stun lock. Although, not all of them. A lot of the matches required more skill than that, but he was able to kill some of them within that stun lock window. Of course, it's also well known that some of the duels in those videos were staged, but that didn't really matter. What did matter was that it was technically possible to kill geared players with a rogue naked, but only in one-on-one -on -one situations and only against classes that couldn't break your CCs, unless you were really good. So is World of Roguecraft the only reason rogues were known as stunt rogues and so overpowered? Kind of? Rogues were the only class who could easily stun a player for 10 seconds straight with a simple cheap shot kidney shot combo, which was pretty good. But also, rogues were just really good at the beginning of the game too, and were very easy to play well. Once patch 1.8 hit and weapons got normalized, they lost a big edge in damage that they once had, and that kind of brought them in line with other classes. So for a while, rogues had good damage and CC. Most private servers run with patch 1.12, which is a lot more balanced and takes place after the weapon normalization patch, so you don't hear too many complaints about rogues from the private server community, who like to pretend they played vanilla WoW. So when classic servers come out, you don't really have to worry about rogues being overpowered, but rogues do have a really good matchup against most classes in PvP. That's another thing that kind of contributed to their infamous status. Against Clothies, rogues hit the hardest and only have to worry about a good mage who knew how to kite. Most hybrid classes were garbage and not really a concern for a pure DPS class like a rogue. And that just kind of left hunters and warriors. A pet could keep the rogue in combat and not allow CC chains, and warriors could break saps and hit through their defensive cooldowns. But both classes had a crucial weakness that rogues could take advantage of. The 5 to 8 yard dead zone. If a rogue was smart and just put its bleeds up and kited in that dead zone, they could just slowly bleed kite a warrior or hunter to death. So now let's break everything down. A naked rogue could kill a player through a complicated CC chain, but that CC chain revolved around blind and not really a stun. A geared rogue could kill a player through a stun lock, but not always, and only against certain classes. Rogues had an above average damage for a majority of WoW, but not towards the end of it. And finally, rogues had good matchups against all classes in 1v1 situations. And I think it's a combination of these four things that leads to the notion of rogues being overpowered in vanilla WoW, and led to the infamous name of the stun rogues, which was only further reinforced in the Burning Crusade when mace spec rogues became a thing. Especially since it's a common misconception that mace rogues were a problem in vanilla WoW too. But that's another topic for a different video. The reason vanilla barons, and to a lesser extent TBC and wrath barons, is remembered so fondly by horde players and was so popular was because of a combination of bad planning and zone design by Blizzard. If you look at some of the earliest screenshots of WoW, you'll notice that almost all of it is alliance zones and cities. And pretty much all Alliance Zones were created before they worked on the Horde Zones. Leading many people to speculate that Blizzard just kind of ran out of time when it came to the Horde Zones. And because of this, or maybe not, after all there is no concrete proof, but what is undeniable that for a lot of various different reasons, if you were Horde, you were going to end up in the Barrens eventually. In vanilla, there was no dungeon finder, and the low level dungeons themselves could take anywhere from 1 to 4 hours to complete, if you did manage to get a group together. So those were out of the question if you wanted an alternative to quick leveling. Battlegrounds did not start giving experience until late in Wrath of the Lich King, mining and herbalism didn't give experience either, and obviously pet battles weren't a thing back then. So all the alternative routes that exist today to leveling just weren't there. The only way to efficiently get XP was to grind mobs or quest. The Barons was basically a funnel point for three of the four playable races in Horde, 
After their starting zone, Torin, trolls, and orcs were naturally led through the barrens. And even undead would travel there sometimes rather than deal with Silver Pine Forest or Terran Mill. The zone itself was massive, probably one of the biggest zones ever in the entire game. It also had only three flight paths, and even less graveyards. One flight path in Ratchet, one at the crossroads, and a third at Camp Tarajo. The flight path from Ratchet to the crossroads was an extremely short flight, but the one from the crossroads to Camp Tarajo was the most useful one, and even then, those three flight paths covered only a very small portion of the map, so you had to run everywhere. At that time, you didn't get a mount until level 40, and Old Barons was notorious for sending you to all the very far corners of the zone for questing, so you were running marathons for everything. In addition, it also had the largest level range of any zone, spanning 15 levels. So you pretty much had to go to the Barrens. You stayed there for a long time, and you had to do very long, boring runs to get to quests. On top of some of the quests being infamous for being awful, Mancrick's Wife being one, and probably the most known quest in WoW, the Venture Co. Samaflange quest, the terrible escort quest, Free from the Hold, and collecting four zebra hooves with a very low drop chance and various other similar low drop chance gathering quests. The Zebra, a quest that required you to do one simple little task. Go out into the barrens and kill zebra for four hoofs. Not so bad, right? I mean, each zebra has four hoofs, don't they? Well, actually no, because this quest, if you focused on it and only it, would take you about an hour to complete. The problem with the quest was twofold. One, there were not a lot of zebras, and they liked to roam alone. And two, they had a really low chance to drop the hoofs. So you had to go around and hunt down these little bastards, and then hope the RNG gods were on your side when you finally found one. Lost in Battle, one of the most infamous quests ever. The objective was simple, Find out what happened to Mancrick's wife. Only, this was in the time before there was a vast, readily available database of information. So in order to find his wife, you'd have to dig through pages of comments and message boards or forums, since her body was not in an obvious location. Mancrick gave you the quest here, and his wife's body is over here. Just randomly to the side of the road, not near any other quests, and very far away from Mancrick. The easiest way to find out where Mancrick's wife was, was to simply ask in chat. And Barrens being the most populated zone in those days, you had plenty of people more than willing to help you locate Mancrick's wife. But after the question has been asked for maybe the 10th time in the past 30 minutes, people would start giving not so serious answers, which would then devolve into more off-topic discussions most of which involving various links to certain legendary weapons, and the tales and exploits of one known as Chuck Norris. Baron's Chat If Baron's isn't remembered for its terrible questing experience, because really I could go on and on about some of the other really terrible quests in the zone, the Baron's Chat is what Trey Chat started out as. Random trolling, anal theory, blessed blade of the Windseeker, and other various in-jokes and memes. And since so many Horde players spent so long in this one zone, running very slowly all over the place because it was massive and only had two relevant flight points, you had a lot of free time to chat while auto-running to the crossroads. And that is why Barons is remembered, for Barons chat, and its incredible leveling experience. Oh, and also Alliance Raids. The Barons chat might have been full of memes and childish trolling, but it was also full of the crossroads is under attack, since it seemed like the crossroads were always under attack. So, why were the crossroads always under attack? Well, for a number of reasons. For one, the Alliance knew that there were a lot of Horde players in the Barrens. And not only that, but low-level Horde players. The Barrens also had a very crucial geographical flaw that Alliance zones of similar level did not have. Ratchet. This little city was neutral, had a bow to the Eastern Kingdoms, and a very short run to the Crossroads, which was nearby. The Crossroads is also where a majority of the quest givers were located, 
So just simply taking the easy and convenient boat to Ratchet, and running leisurely into the crossroads and pulling the guards one by one, since at this time guards did not all Zerg attackers like they do today, a small group of max level alliance players could hold the crossroads hostage for quite some time. And why not? It was easy to do. And you were almost guaranteed to get a few lobby trolls, orcs, or torrens try and fight you because they didn't know any better. So it was easy pickings. Until the max level horde players came in to clean house. The crossroads was a site of constant world PvP. Depending on your server, there could be a couple of small scale battles taking place every day. The only reason the Barrens isn't more well known for its world PvP is because it's already infamous for a whole host of other things that this aspect of it kinda gets overshadowed. And don't get me started on the landscape. The landscape of the zone! It's alright actually. Landscapes are a very subjective thing to discuss, and many people have fond memories of the barren wasteland that they spent weeks, maybe even months, leveling through. Personally, I was never the biggest fan of the zone's aesthetics, but it could look very cool at times. In Cataclysm, with the remake of the Old World, the Barrens was cut in half and turned into two leveling zones. And each zone is about the same size as other regular size zones, which should tell you something about just how huge the Old Barrens was. If splitting it in half made each new zone only normal sized. And with the splitting of the zone, most of the old qualities of vanilla barons are gone. You no longer need to stay in any zone for very long with all the alternative ways to level. And with Dungeon Finder being available at level 15, most players totally skip it altogether. So Baron's Chat isn't even a thing anymore. Blizzard fixed pretty much all the old quests to no longer be absolutely terrible. So no more spending an hour killing zebras for four hoofs and guards in low-level towns are actually a threat now. So it's not as easy to take the crossroads as it once was. So world PvP is almost non-existent there anymore. With Blizzard making changes to the zone to fix its many problems, they got rid of what made it unique. But that's not always a bad thing. Sure, we'll never have the old barons again, because most of the things that made it such a heavily traveled zone were because of bad zone design. So would you even want that again? Is it better to have a good zone that's kind of forgettable that hardly anyone goes to? Or a bad zone that everyone's forced to go to? Because that's what Old Barrens was. Back in the day, shamans needed to have a totem in their bag in order to use totems. And slowly, as you leveled up, you got quests to go out and discover one of the four elemental types of totems. The second totem you learn is the water totem, and let me detail what a level 20 quest in order to unlock a class defining feature entailed. First up, since shamans were horde only in vanilla, you could start the quest in Diratar or Grimar or Thunderbluff, but it didn't really matter where you started because they all send you to the same place, Eastlin Waterseer in Ratchet. Eastlin will then send you to the southern part of the Barrens to talk to Brine. The Barrens in Vanilla WoW was the largest zone in the game, and also spanned the highest level range of any other zone. So while it was a long run to Brine, at least Ratchet is located in the middle of the Barrens, and Shamans got Ghost Wolf form at level 20, so they had a bit of a speed boost even if they didn't get mounts until level 40. Once you got to Brine, she would send you to a nearby pool to collect some water, which is pretty easy because it's right next to her house. Not so bad so far, right? Once you collect the water sample, she will then send you to Terran Mill to get a water sample from the well in the middle of the town. Now, let me tell you a thing or two about how far away Terran Mill is from this point in the Barrens. Assuming no hearthstone is used, you have to run the full length of the Barrens to Orgrimmar, then take the Zeppelin to Undercity. Shamans can't be forsaken, so at this point in the game, there's no reason for the races that could be shamans to have any flight points in the Eastern Kingdoms, so it was a run to Terran Mill. And at level 20, your only method was to run through Silverpine Forest first. Now, I went into an older version of the game, in Ghost Wolf form, and timed my run from the front of Undercity to Terran Mill, 
and it took 10 minutes. Which, honestly, a little bit of a shorter run than I thought it would be. Once in Terran Mail, all you had to do was get a little sample of water in the well, and then bring it back to Brian in the Barrens. So, hoptail back to Undercity, take the Zeppelin to Org, and then run the full length of the Barrens to its southern tip, or take some flight points, as you should have them all at this point. And finally, after all the running and travel involved and turning in the quest, you will be at the halfway point. Next, Brian will send you to a pole in Ashenvale, located in the middle of the zone. So you have to run the full length of the Barrens again, and then halfway through Ashenvale to a little island in the middle of the ruins of Stardust. Grab some water from the well in the middle of the bog elementals, and then hightail it back to Splintertail Post, if you wanted to fly back. And then go through the full length of the Barrens again, and turn in the quest. Brian will then send you back to Eastland, just south of Ratchet for the next part of the quest. Eastland will then send you to Silver Pine Forest to kill a water elemental. So, you had to hightail your way back to Orgamark, take the Zeppelin to Undercity again, and make your way down to Silver Pine Forest. Luckily, the water elemental is located near the top of the zone, where you come in from Undercity, so it's not as long of a run. The place you need to go to in Silver Pine is in a hidden, out of the way coastal region that you can only get to by running to the coast and then following it until you run into a bunch of water elementals just hanging around. I'm not sure how many people found this place back when information was scarce and there were no quest markers in game, because this is not in an obvious location. Once you get there, you need to drink your potion which will allow you to fight one of the elementals, and then after you kill it, you'll get the quest item you need to click on the bonfire which will spawn another water elemental who will then give you a quest to turn into Eastland. So then, you go back to Undercity, take the Zeppelin to Org, and then make your way down to Eastland south of Ratchet and turn in the quest. And that's it. You're finally done. You now have completed your low level quest for an essential item needed to use a whole host of your abilities. In this video we'll go over 10 things that appeared in the game's files, but never made it into the live version of the game for one reason or another. And starting off this list at number 10, we have the Island of Kaladar. Kaladar was the name Blizzard originally gave the island that the World Tree Teldrassil was going to be on top of. Once Teldrassil outgrew the island, they decided to build the city on top of it, but there were plans for the island to still be called Kaladar anyway. Eventually though, Blizzard kind of retconned the name of the island and just referred to it as Teldrassil at all times, even when not talking about the tree itself. But since the original name of the island was Kaladar, a lot of the map assets of the tree are referred to as belonging to the zone of Kaladar, and a lot of the map assets are located in the folder called Kaladar on the WoW's client. And not only that, Kaladar was also the name of a battleground in Alpha WoW's testing, which never actually made it into the game. It seems Blizzard was 100% ready to go with the name Kaladar before they decided to just use Teldrassil for everything. In the Beta WoW and Alpha WoW clients, there existed two troll islands off the coast of Stranglethorn Vale, called the Island of Dr. Lapis and Gilajim's Island. Now, what's unique about both of these islands is that they were both basically done and were almost completely textured and full of trees, ruins, artifacts on the beach, and even a few houses and small abandoned towns and caves. Although, none of these textures were unique which means they did eventually use everything on this island somewhere else in WoW. Now, considering both of these islands existed in lore, and showed up a lot in the early WoW maps, it's a mystery as to why they were removed. But then again, a lot of stuff was removed for pretty mundane reasons, as we found out in the WoW Diary book which came out last year. In the Warlords of Draenor beta, a new battleground was added to the game files called Heroes Through Time. Based on a Twitter comment of someone asking the PvP director about the island, Blizzard stated that it was an idea they were experimenting with, but that they eventually decided not to go with it in Warlords. The map is structured very similar to most battleground maps, as it has basically mirrored maps on both sides of the island, with the top half looking like it probably belonged to the Alliance, as it's all clean and proper and green, with the bottom half looking like it was probably the Horde zone, with red buildings and a little bit more rough in its architecture. Not much more is known about this island though. And at number 7, we have the Stormwind Warrior District. In Cataclysm, Blizzard experimented with another version of Old Town that included a retextured version of Stormwind Keep. 
Since Blizzard had to redesign Stormwind to account for flying and Cataclysm, it's possible they were planning on adding another district to Stormwind, called the Warrior District. Although this portion of Stormwind went unused and was never fully developed, so it's most likely just an idea they were throwing about. One that they put a little bit more time and effort into than they usually would, considering it also made it into the game files. And at number 6, we have another unused battleground, and that's the defense of the Ale House. This battleground map made it into the game files during Mist of Pandaria in Patch 5.2, and is a three-lane battleground which seems to take place in Town Long Steps. Now, seeing as the name of the battleground is a pretty obvious reference to the Defense of the Ancients, which was the original name of Dota, it seems like this map was supposed to be a MOBA mode for a battleground. While I have no clue how a MOBA would work with WoW's gameplay and battleground mechanics, being a fan of the MOBA genre myself, I would have loved to have seen Blizzard attempt to do it anyway, although it seems like they have no intentions of coming back to this map, and sadly, they probably won't ever release it. And at number 5, we have the Undead Nerubian Beast model. With the Wrath of the Lich King beta, a new model is added to the game files simply named Undead Nerubian Beast. This model has 5 different color variations, but no animations. Which is pretty standard for models added to the game files, but never actually used in the game. They don't usually waste time animating models they don't intend to use. Now considering there are plenty of Undead Nerubians in Wrath of the Lich King, it's pretty obvious why they made this as it was probably a prototype for what the Nerubians were going to be in the game. And then they just ended up going with the models we actually got in the game instead. Although these could have just been another variation of them, but whatever the case, eventually they were scrapped and just never removed from the game files. And at number 4, we have some unused voice files. It's pretty rare for them to have voice actors record lines they never intend to use, and in this instance we have voice lines for Runus the Shamed. In NPC, players get to know very well while questing in Legion through the Azuna Zone. Now, in the questing zone, Runus is an NPC you come across as a wither trying to attack you. After you beat him up a little bit, he decides to help you out, and tells you about an invasion planned by a horde of other withers who want to attack the blue dragons and steal their mana. And during the quest chain, Runus constantly talks about how he would never think of betraying you. And at the very end, he keeps true to his word and dies due to his mana withdrawals. Now, with the unused voice lines of Runus, we get a different ending to this quest chain. In the voice lines, Runus talks about taking the Tidestone, attacking the blue dragons, and stealing all their mana crystals. Currently, Runus is remembered fondly because of what actually went down in-game, where he helps players. So, I think it was a good move that they didn't go with the betrayal storyline that these unused voice files hint were a planned option. The Tidestone. Such power. We will feast on the dragons instead. Sisters, brothers, the great mana crystal I promised lies in the pool above. Forget the Tidestone, brothers. Let the lizards and the lowborn have their crystal. Two can play at this game, except my touch actually hurts. Know your place or be put in it. If you don't stop, I'll drain every last drop of energy out of your corpse. Plebeian. Oh, the Nightborn are not what they seem. So sorry, my friends. I just couldn't help myself. And at number three, we have the Items of Proficiency. This was a series of items which would give extra skills in certain weapons, up to a maximum of plus seven in that weapon skill which is incredibly high. So basically, there are some items in the game that give random stats, and they generally fit to a kind of theme based on the name of that item. So an item of the bear, for example, would always have strength and stamina on it. An item named of the tiger would always have strength and agility, and so on and so on. They would group up the stats based on arbitrary names. So they had random stats, but were always related to whatever they were named after, and sometimes would even be specific, like of Shadow Protection, which would give increased stamina and shadow resistance. And of Proficiency items gave plus one through plus seven in all weapon skills, but these items were never actually added to the game. And there was a pair of gloves in Vanilla WoW that were incredibly sought after because they gave weapon skills. And I think these gloves gave plus seven weapon skills and three different weapons. So, 
if these of proficiency items would have been added, they probably would have been very sought after, which is why they were probably never added. But these items were completely programmed into the game, so you could even create macros that would link to them, despite the fact that none of them actually existed. And at number two, we have some more unused voice files, and these are for Lorthamar and Romoth. There is a whole set of voice lines indicating that Romoth was supposed to be the traitor during the Cataclysm for the End Time Dungeon. During Cataclysm, there was a Twilight Cultist traitor in both the Horde and Alliance, who was feeding information to Deathwing, and caused a lot of problems in the Horde. On the Alliance side, the traitor ended up being Archbishop Benedictus, which was kind of a big deal as he was a major lore figure. So for the Horde side to be Romoth just kind of made sense in relation. Romoth, for those of you who don't know, is one of the few lore important Blood Elf NPCs and is always accompanying Lorthamar and is located in game next to Lorthamar and Silvermoon. He has been involved in a lot of points in WoW, including being the NPC Horde players talk to during the purging of Dalaran scenario of Mista Pandaria, and he was also one of Kel'thas' staunchest and most loyal supporters but turned away from Kel'thas and sided with Lorthamar instead when he found out how far Kel'thas had fallen, which was a big deal for his character. So he was a morally good character who wanted the best for his people, and there's a reason why they changed his planned traitor status, because it didn't really fit with his pre-established lore. Now, the voice files themselves basically just have Lorthamar accusing Romoth of being the Twilight traitor, shows him proof, and then there's voice lines of them fighting each other. Romoth, you stand accused of high treason to Silvermoon, and of being a member of the Twilight Council! Ah, the long knives come out. Is there proof to these accusations? This document. It's your handwriting. I'd recognize it anywhere. You leave me no choice, then. It's a pity, really. I had plans for our people. There is a war coming. And I've chosen to be on the winning side. You forced my hand a little early, perhaps. But I think you'll find I'm still playing from a position of strength. Feel my wrath. And at number one, we have the Wrath of the Lich King server first titles. Back in Wrath of the Lich King is when Blizzard added achievements to the game including the idea of getting titles attached to your characters based on certain achievements. And there was a series of feat of strengths you can get in-game for being the first person on your server to hit max level, get the highest level in the newest level of professions, and for being the first person to complete the Northrend Vanguard achievement, which was an achievement for getting exalted reputations with all of the Northrend reputations available at the beginning of the expansion. Getting server first in any of these three things would award you with the server first feat of strength, and a special title that only you would have. Like, for example, the first priest on the server to hit level 80 would get the Prophet title. The first Grand Master Enchanter would get the Grand Master Enchanter title. And the first Northrend Vanguard would get the Hero of Northrend title. And only that one person could get that one title per server. Now, there was a huge outcry in the forums over these titles, so during the beta, Blizzard removed the titles associated to these achievements and only left in the titles granted for getting the server first raid kills. People really didn't like the idea of only one person having an exclusive title, but were a little bit more okay with a group of people having an exclusive title for achieving a legitimately hard feat, like getting a server first raid kill. Eventually, Blizzard removed server first achievements altogether but it seems like it was a neat idea to get an exclusive title like that. Trinkets in Vanilla WoW are rare, so make sure to keep any you find while leveling up. And in this list, I'll go over trinkets you can find on your travels to max level that appear in Phase 1, and order them in ease of acquiring and low level requirements in mind, and not necessarily which are the absolute best to grab, because some of those are very difficult to get a hold of. And at number 10, we have the Cold Basculus Eye, which can be obtained at around level 35 as a rare drop from killing Basculus in Stranglethorpe Vale. Now, this isn't a very useful trinket, as all it does is give a minor attack speed slow for 15 seconds on a 5 minute cooldown. But it is one of the earliest trinkets you can obtain for basically any class, and does have the niche distinction of giving Paladins a range pool option 
since the trinket has a 30 yard range. Now, like I said, in order to obtain this trinket, you'll have to farm Cold Eye Basilis, who are around level 40 and located in the Stranglethorn Vale. This trinket has a pretty low drop chance of around 3%, but it is bind unequip, so you can just buy one off the auction house, or sell it yourself if you do happen to come across it. And since this item isn't that useful, and isn't that easy to get, it's only at the number 10 spot on this list, but it still does make the list because it is one of the lowest level trinkets you can get in the game. Now, for the next two items on this list, we'll have engineering trinkets. The first of which is the Gnomish Universal Remote. This item requires you to have at least 125 skill in engineering, but does not require Gnomish engineering despite its name. You just need regular engineering at skill level 125, which can be obtained as early as level 10. So, this is the earliest trinket you can obtain on this list, though there are probably other engineering trinkets at around this level, I'm only going over the best ones. Now, in order to be able to craft this trinket, you need to buy the engineering schematic, which is sold in limited quantities at a vendor in Iron Forge or Thousand Needles. And what this trinket does is give you the ability to mind control mechanical targets, which works like the priest mind control where it replaces your action bar with the mechs bar and allows you to control the robot directly, all on a three minute cooldown. Although being an engineering item, this trinket has a chance to fail. And when it fails, it will make the mech very angry at you and give you something like 5,000 extra threat. But if you want a trinket at early levels, engineering is the way to go, especially for the next item on this list. And at number eight, we have the Gnomish Cloaking Device. Now, despite the name of this trinket, this one does not require you to have Gnomish Engineering either, just a regular engineering skill of at least 200, which can be obtained at level 20. And what this trinket does is allow you to go invisible for 10 seconds, which is an actually pretty useful effect. And unlike basically all other engineering trinkets, this one does not have a chance to fail and works every time. The big downside to this though is that it does have a one hour cooldown. Now, in order to learn how to make the Gnomish cloaking device, you do need to buy another limited quantity schematic from a vendor, just like with the Universal Remote. Except this one is located on a secret vendor in the Alteric Mountains, which I'll show on screen. And the schematic can be bought and sold on the auction house, so you might be able to get one easier from there instead. Of course, if it's your first character and you're leveling up normally, it's much cheaper to just camp out the schematic yourself. And at number seven, we have a non-engineering item as I won't mention any more in this list, even though there are a couple of other really good low level ones, and that is the Thunder Brew Boot Flask. This trinket on a 30 minute cooldown allows you to breathe fire for five seconds, doing about 50 fire damage to everything in front of you, but at the side effect of making your character drunk in the process. Now this trinket is actually a pretty decent AOE trinket at low levels, and even at higher levels, if you're playing a class that just has god awful AoE, or none at all, and can be obtained and equipped at level 44. Now, there is a little bit of a downside to this trinket, and that is absolutely its ease of access. It's an alliance only trinket, and the starter quest is located in a hidden part of Westfall, and the quest itself is one of those long cross continental journey type quests, where you have to go to multiple different zones and do multiple different things in order to complete it. Which is why this trinket has kind of a lower spot on this list, but is still absolutely worth getting, if for its neat little unique effect. And at number 6, we have Lincoln's Boomerang. Now, this is a really good trinket, which on a 3 minute cooldown, has a chance to stun or disarm your target, as well as do a little bit of damage to them. And I think this might be the only way to get a disarm ability if you're on a class which doesn't have one baseline just to show you how unique that effect is. This trinket has a pretty high level requirement though, as the quest chain that gives you this trinket requires level 56, which is almost near max level, and the quest chain required in order to obtain this trinket is another one of those really long cross-continental journey ones, which starts in Ungoro Crater. So, not exactly easy to do at all while leveling up, and more something you do once you're already at max level if you want a really good trinket but still technically fits the parameters of this list, and that's why it's only towards the middle of the list instead of towards the top, considering just how good the effect actually is, even for max level players. 
And at number 5, we have Mark of the Chosen. This is a level 48 trinket, which is a reward from a quest chain that requires you to go into Maradon, a dungeon which wasn't added to the game until patch 1.2, as it was the first dungeon added to the game after the release of World of Warcraft. Luckily, Phase 1 of Classic WoW will include this dungeon at launch, which means you can get the Mark of the Chosen trinket. The trinket itself has a 2% chance every time you're hit to gain 25 in all stats for one minute. And this effect is actually really good. And some players would even use it at max level before they got raid gear to replace it. Because even though this trinket looks like a tanking specific trinket, as that's basically what it is at max level, while leveling up, your character should be getting hit all the time, which means this trinket will proc for the average low level players questing through the world, which makes it perfect for this list, even if you do have to run a dungeon in order to complete the quest to obtain this trinket. And at number 4, we have the Nifty Stopwatch. This trinket gives you a 40% speed buff for 10 seconds, which is just straight up really good effect to have on a trinket, with the downside being that it has a 30 minute cooldown. You'll learn real quick that in Vanilla WoW, if an item has a good ability, it probably has a super long cooldown to compensate, which is what the Nifty Stopwatch is. And in order to obtain this trinket, you need to be level 50 and complete a 6 part quest chain in the Badlands, where you just have to find some rocks and kill some elementals. And since this trinket has a good effect, and is much easier to get than a lot of the other trinkets on this list, and can be also obtained before max level, I think it deserves a pretty high spot on this list even if you do have to be a pretty high level to get it. And at number 3, we have the Lufa, another trinket which requires level 50. There's something about the level 50 mark in which Blizzard allows you to get trinkets, as the next one on this list will also require level 50. Anyways, what the Lufa does is remove one bleed effect from you, and that's all it does. So, its uses are entirely up to how often you run into bleeds, because this does work on any bleed put on you including by bosses and players. And in order to obtain the Lufa, all you have to do is complete a small quest in the Searing Gorge. Here's the thing about the Lufa though, this item wasn't added to Vanilla WoW until patch 1.5, the same patch which introduced Battlegrounds, and Blizzard doesn't plan to add Battlegrounds to the game until Phase 3. So, I'm not sure if Lufa will be in the game at the start, or if it will be introduced within Phase 3. Since it's just a quest reward for something out in the open world, it isn't really associated to Battlegrounds or any of the dungeons and raids that were added along with that patch. So, if it's not in the game with Phase 1, just ignore this spot on this list and instead, we'll go with something like Smot's Compass, which is another level 50 trinket that can be obtained by doing a small quest chain in the Stranglethorn Vale, which has the passive effect to just give you an additional 1% chance to dodge attacks. And at number 2, we have the Carrot on a Stick. This is, again, another level 50 trinket, which has the effect to increase your mounted movement speed by 3%. And the effect of this trinket actually stacked with other mount movement speed increases. So, it was definitely a trinket you wanted to have at max level. And many people in Vanilla WoW would go out of their way to grab this low level trinket. So, what you have to do to obtain this trinket is simply head to Thousand Needles and accept the quest, which has you kill Gazrilla in the dungeon Zolvarak. Unfortunately though, Gazrilla was a secret summoned boss, which requires its own little quest chain to complete in order to even face the boss of that dungeon, so Carried on the Stick is not exactly the easiest thing to grab while leveling up. It is a very useful trinket to have though, that you can grab while leveling up, and it's probably a good idea to get. And at number 1, the best trinket to grab while leveling up in Classic WoW is the Tidal Charm. This is a level 36 trinket, which is obtained by killing a rare mob in the Arathi Highlands called Prince Nazjak, who has about a 50% chance to drop the trinket. And the trinket itself is really good. On a 15 minute cooldown, you can just straight up get a 3 second stun, which can be used from 30 yards away. Having an on-demand stun that can be used from 30 yards away especially on a class who doesn't naturally have a stun, is just useful in so many different ways that max level players will even try to get their hands on this trinket. Now, the biggest downside of obtaining this trinket is the fact that the mob who has a 50% chance to drop it has a very long respawn timer of nearly two days. 
So if you wish to farm out this trinket, be prepared to sit at a spawn location for a very long time with a lot of competition because this is a very in-demand trinket. And even if you do manage to kill the mob, there's only a 50% chance you'll actually get it. But if you happen to be leveling through the Arathi Highlands and you happen to run across Prince Nasjak, it is definitely worth your time to try and kill him for a chance at obtaining this trinket. In this video, we will be going over NPCs who used to do something or were involved in some sort of quest chain in Vanilla WoW, but had that quest chain or function removed from them with the Old World revamp and Cataclysm, but were still left in the game for some reason. And at number 10, we have Tajari. This NPC is located in the Moonglade and is right next to the Keeper Remulus. Now, Remulus is an important lore character, so it makes sense for a couple of guards to be in front of him. But there's also this NPC off to the side who seemingly doesn't do anything, and if you talk to her, basically just tells you that she's watching over Remulus. But in Vanilla WoW, she was involved in a quest chain for druids in order to get their aquatic form. The aquatic form quest chain for druids is infamous for being terrible, and I even made a video about it on my channel. Basically, as part of the quest chain, you had to swim to the bottom of the lake in the middle of the zone and grab a bauble. Then you would turn it into Remulus, who would then tell you to talk to Tajari for the next part of the quest. Tajari would then tell you to ask around Moodglade for clues on where to go get the next two items for the quest. If you're Alliance, you would find out you had to go to Westfall and Darkshore. And if you're Horde, you find out you needed to go to the Barrens in the Silver Pine Forest. Then, after completing this cross-continental fetch quest for two items, you'd come back and turn them into her, and then she would teach you how to do the aquatic form. With the removal of the quest chain, she no longer does anything. And at number 9, we have Fala Sagewind. Fala is an NPC located in the Northern Barrens on top of a mountain randomly, who used to be part of a turn-in quest for the Wailing Caverns. With Cataclysm, all of the dungeon quests were put at the entrance of their respective dungeons, and all your turn-ins were done at the entrance of the dungeons as well. And with this, the one turn-in this NPC used to have was removed. But she still stands there, doing nothing. She's also friendly to Alliance players, randomly, probably because she used to be part of a turn-in for a dungeon quest that was cross-faction. Because when you turned in the Nightmare Shard to her, she would tell you to give it to Hamul Rune Totem if you were Horde, and Bear Walker if you were Alliance. Hamul is a major lore character, and this shard was an early hint at the Emerald Nightmare plot point, an event that came full circle during Legion, as it was the first raid of the expansion. Number 8, Vial. This NPC is an imp located in Winterspring who sells an item called the Fell Elemental Rod, which is a component for a quest chain and the rod is only used in that one quest, which was removed with Cataclysm. But this imp is still in the game, and still sells the elemental rod, even though there is literally no use for it. The quest it was part of, though, was the quest chain required to build the item which allowed you to see ghosts, which you needed in order to complete a series of ghost-related quests throughout the world. Now, out of all the NPCs on this list, this one actually does kind of have a use. It's a vendor who also sells the limited quantity items Grom's Blood and Felcloth. Sometimes people will pay this NPC a visit just to see if they can buy one of these two items. Number 7, Strahad Farson. Strahad is an NPC in Ratchet who was part of the Vanilla WoW Warlock Fell Hunter acquisition quest chain. As part of a long quest chain, you'd come to Strahad Farson multiple times as you went on the cross-continental journey looking for books and he would be the one to ultimately train you on how to use your Fell Hunter, if you were a Warlock. But ever since the Cataclysm, he was turned into a normal Warlock trainer. But ever since they removed training skills from trainers, he doesn't do anything. Like, if you talk to him on a Warlock, he'll show you that he can train you things, but since you automatically learn the abilities as you level up, it's impossible to actually train anything from him. He's one of those leftover NPCs that Blizzard just kind of forgot to remove the training window from. There's a couple of them in the game, so he's one of those rare breeds. Still doesn't do anything, but at least he has his little unique distinction when it comes to being a useless NPC. Number 6, Taev Mordun. Taev was located in the Silverpine Forest. 
This NPC used to be part of the Water Totem quest chain. The class quest, which is nearly universally considered the worst, or hardest, class quest to do back in Vanilla WoW. During one portion of the quest, you're supposed to talk to a water elemental after killing another water elemental, but the water elemental was a limited time spawn. So if you for whatever reason miss the window of opportunity to talk to them, this NPC was literally there just to resummon it for that one part of the quest. Since the quest chain no longer exists, the NPC has nothing associated to it now, and with it being in a very out of the way location, you have to run a very long time along the coast in order to come across him, making him a very secret, obsolete NPC. Number 5. Komar Villard Komar was an NPC involved in the Succubus Warlock pet quest chain. As part of the quest chain, you had to go to remote parts of the world to kill two good and honest men and steal their hearts from their dead bodies. And Komar was one of the two NPCs you had to kill for Horde players. Komar lost the love of his life and was wandering around the wetlands by himself, looking for any signs of her. This particular quest chain was kind of messed up, as it was one of the few quest chains where you literally had to go out and kill good people, who not only had done nothing wrong, but were actively hunted down for being really good people, which made this quest chain kind of notable for being evil. There are very few straight up evil quest chains that players have to do in the game. But with the removal of the succubus quest chain and cataclysm, they just kind of forgot to remove this NPC as well. So now he just kind of hangs out in the wetlands. And at number four, we have Ember Strife. Ember Strife was a black dragon located basically behind Onyxia's lair who was involved in both factions of Nixia Tumen quest chain, a quest chain infamous for being incredibly long and convoluted. On the Alliance side, players had to engage Ember Strife and place an item on the floor, beat him down to around 30% health, and then use an item to mind control him, and while mind controlled, they would force him to like breathe fire on the item they place on the floor to complete their quest. On the Horde side, they'd have to build a costume to dress up as a black dragon, and then talk to Ember Strife who would give them a quest to go out and kill three dragons throughout the world. And then once you kill the three dragons, he'd tell you to kill another dragon before finally giving you the quest item you needed. But with the removal of the Onyxia quest chain, Ember Strife was basically left to do nothing, except to be an elite dragon at the back of the cave. And since Ember Strife is a black dragon, lore-wise, he's probably dead. Because Rathian went around the world killing all the black dragons, although Ember Strife was mentioned by Jaina after the events of Rathion going around the world killing all the black dragons, but before the start of Mista Pandaria, so he might still be alive. Maybe. Rathion did a really good job of killing all the black dragons. But what is for sure is the fact that Ember Strife is an NPC still in the game that is involved with nothing and was made obsolete by the Cataclysm. Number three. As Tordeen. Man, I've probably messed up so many of these names. This NPC is located in Feralis, and used to be involved in a quest chain that would send you into Dire Mall to kill an imp named Pusselin, in order to get back his book of incantations and a key. The key would allow you to go into certain entrances into Dire Mall, and once you turn in the book, As Tordeen would give you a choice between two items and 500 rep with the Shendralar. The Shendralar are a faction that was an incredibly difficult faction to grind rep for from Vanilla WoW to Wrath of the Lich King, and the quest with Ashtordine was one of the few quests that granted rep to that faction. Otherwise, in order to get rep with this faction, you had to turn in a ton of books and crafting materials, and getting this faction to Exalted was so difficult, it used to be part of the Insane in the Membrane achievement, before they removed the ability to get this rep in the Cataclysm. Insane in the Membrane, for those of you who don't know, is an achievement you get for hitting Exalted with some of the hardest factions to grind rep for in the game. But after the Cataclysm, they removed the Shendralar faction from the game, and moved this guy's quest chain to one of the ogres at the entrance of Dire Mall, like they did with all other dungeon quests. They just kind of put them at the entrance rather than requiring you to speak to NPCs in the zone for the dungeon's quests. And with those two changes, Ashtordine wasn't used for anything but his NPC is still in the game today. Number 2. Thungrim Firegaze This NPC was involved in a level 10, level 20, 
and a level 30 warrior quest chain for horde players. At level 10, he would just give you a weapon appropriate for your class. As back in vanilla WoW, there used to be quest chains for your class that would give you a piece of equipment which was perfectly suited for your class, and was usually worth doing for the amazing piece of gear you'd get. At level 30, Thungrim would give you a series of quests that would give you four pieces of gear ultimately, requiring 11 quests in total to complete. At the end of each small quest chain, you'd get one piece of armor appropriate for a warrior, but the chess piece in particular was unique as it had an odd use effect to instantly generate 30 rage, which was a decent chunk of rage at the time. So what some max level warriors would do is equip this chess piece, use its effect to get 30 rage, and then swap back to their normal chess piece before pulling a boss. But this chess piece had a one hour cooldown, so it was a little hard to abuse, as that was about the max cooldown duration most really good abilities had. But with the Cataclysm, and the removal of basically all class quests, this NPC was rendered essentially useless, and is located on top of the mountain with nothing else nearby, with no other NPCs near, except a few plain Shriders. And at number one, we have Gunther Arcanus. Gunther is an undead located in the middle of the lake in the undead starting zone, surrounded by a whole bunch of ghouls. Gunther was an undead who was a powerful mage and necromancer in life. That when he fell to the plague of the Lich King, he just kind of broke free on his own and went off and did his own thing. Because he was just that strong of a necromancer. And then, during Vanilla WoW, it's your job to talk to him and try and convince him that other members of the Scourge managed to break free and now have free will under Sylvanas. But Gunther doesn't believe you and gives you a couple of tasks to complete that a member of the Scourge would never do, like killing an important member of the Scourge. Once you complete the tasks, he exclaims that he didn't believe any other undead had broken free of the Lich King either, and then he tentatively agrees to join the Forsaken, but there was never really any follow-up afterwards. Ever since the Cataclysm, he just kind of hangs out there and there was no quest or anything associated with him. You can't even talk to him anymore. But, if they were to ever have a Necromancer class in the future, Gunther Arcanus is definitely someone who could teach Horde members Necromancy. Now, the reason I have this NPC at the number one spot is because he's kind of a favorite of mine and I've mentioned him in like three other videos. In this video, we'll be going over 10 abilities lost to time over the years of WoW's development which will be making a return to the game once Classic is released, and which ones you should be looking forward to the most. And at number 10, we have a pretty easy one, and that's Eyes of the Beast for the Hunter class. Eyes of the Beast was a hunter ability that allowed you to take direct control over your hunter pet, and move around with it, attack with it, as well as use all of its abilities. So if you used a cat pet, for example, which had the stealth ability, hunters could legitimately scout out areas in stealth before they got the camouflage ability. Eyes of the Beast was also helpful for the very niche Hunter tank, where sometimes a hunter could use a pet to off-tank certain ads or bosses, but not very well. It was incredibly situational, a subpar way to tank, but with Eyes of the Beast, it allowed hunter pets to be positioned in exactly the place they needed to be, which helped with hunter tanking a lot. But there was no other huge benefits to having Eyes of the Beast, and that's why it was removed in Cataclysm, to decrease ability bloat. But it was a very fun ability to use, and I'm happy to see its return. And funny enough, Blizzard said that having to recreate Eyes of the Beast for Classic WoW means they have all the work done in order to reintroduce the ability to Live WoW if they ever decide to do that. As previously, they said they lost the data on how the old Eyes of the Beast work, so they couldn't actually re-add it to the game without a huge amount of effort. And at number 9, we have Detect Magic, for the Mage class. Now here's the thing you probably don't know about Vanilla WoW. You can't actually see buffs on a target, only their debuffs. So a mage would have to use their Detect Magic ability in order to see which buffs the target had. And since nowadays you can see enemy buffs by default, this ability would literally be useless in Modern WoW, and can only exist in the game in which stats are hidden. This is because, back in the day, information on mobs and enemy players used to be considered a valuable commodity, as some RPG games use the fact that the stats are hidden as part of balancing those games. But in the modern day, where people can look up all this information online, 
That kind of gameplay mechanic is rarely used, and is more left to tabletop RPGs. And that's why they removed this feature of the game very early in WoW's life, as it didn't really work very well in an MMO, a mechanic which will be returning to the game with Classic WoW, and hence detect magic as well. And at number 8, we have the Rogue Poison sub-profession. Did you know rogues had two extra professions? They had one for lockpicking, which they still kind of have today, and they had another for creating their poisons. Nowadays, only certain rogue specs even use poisons, and they're more buffs that you cast on the player than they are things you put on your weapons. But in Vanilla WoW, you had to level up your poison profession to create the best possible poisons, which you could then apply on your weapons. And poisons applied to your weapons had a limited amount of charges to them, only lasted 30 minutes instead of an hour, didn't scale with your gear in any way, and would disappear if you entered a different zone, which meant you had to reapply them after every wipe. So it was possible for your weapons to run out of poisons mid-fight with the old mechanic as well. Luckily, Classic Valve will be running on the 1.12 client, and they fix poisons despawning from your weapons when changing zones in patch 1.11. So Classic WoW players will not have to deal with that. Now, in order to level up your poison profession, you would do it just like any other profession, and just make a ton of low-level poisons. And you can get the materials from vendors, lockboxes, pickpocketing, and herbs. So from rogue-related activities and herbalism. The poison sub-profession was removed from rogues in Wrath of the Lich King, so it only really existed for two expansions. And at number 7, we have the Shaman Sentry Totem. This is another fun ability like Eyes of the Beast that didn't really have too many battle-related benefits. So it was removed over the course of the game just to get rid of Ability Bloat. Now what Sentry Totem did was allow you to look through the eyes of the totem. So for example, if you set the Sentry Totem outside of a building and then ran inside of that building, you could click on your Sentry Totem in order to look outside of that building. So it was kind of a scouting tool in certain circumstances. The most useful feature this totem had was scouting in battlegrounds to see when enemy players were going to make a push into your base. And there was also a bug with it that would reset your character's fall distance if used in the air. So it could be used to prevent fall damage. This was not intended though, so I doubt Sentry Totem will do that in Classic WoW. And also its most useful feature, that had nothing to do with combat or fall damage, was its ability to allow you to take a great screenshots of either your character or your guild's first boss kills. And at number 6, we have the Warlock's Detect Invisibility. This was a spell Warlocks had that they could use on themselves and friendly players, which would allow them to see invisible targets. Not stealth targets, mind you, only invisible targets, which basically just included invisible ghosts out in the world, like the ones in front of Undercity, and mages who use the invisibility spell. It also had niche uses to allow you to see invisible succubus pets or incredibly rare mobs or bosses that went invisible. That is to say it didn't have very many uses and was incredibly situationally useful spell, so it was more of a fun flavorful ability. You may be noticing a pattern with all of these removed abilities. Most of them weren't super useful and that's why a lot of them eventually got removed from the game. And with the removal of detect invisibility, players kind of lost the ability to see invisible stuff without special items for a long time. Until Blizzard added in some flavorful abilities through glyphs later on and gave classes the ability to see invisible stuff. Like with the rogue's swirly ball detection ability, for example. And at number 5, we have the human racial ability, Perception. Perception was a pretty weird racial ability that gave humans an increased chance to see stealth targets on an activatable ability that lasted for around 20 seconds. Now, being able to spot stealth rogues in PvP was a little bit easier back in the days when stealth was a lot worse than it is in live, and this racial ability allowed humans to see them even better. Now, unlike Detect Invisibility, this one specifically only worked on stealth targets, and does not, in fact, allow you to see invisible targets. Stealth and invisibility are two separate things in WoW. Now, what made Perception different from most other racial activatable abilities was this one gave you a pretty niche buff, whereas other ones would give you damage boosts, defensive abilities, or other combat-related stuff. 
Perception was kind of an odd one out, and nowhere near as useful as something like Blood Fury or Stone Form, for example. So later on in WoW, Perception was turned into a passive ability, and then removed from the game in Cataclysm. And at number 4, we have Scare Beast and Turn Undead. These are two fear abilities that only worked on two incredibly specific types of mobs. Hunters have Scare Beasts, which was a castable CC with no cooldown, which could fear beasts for a pretty hefty amount of time. And the most useful application this ability had was in PvP against Druids, who, while shapeshifted into some of their forms, were counted as beasts. And Paladins, with their turn on dead, could fear undead mobs, which were normally unfearable. Of course, later on in WoW, Turn on Dead was turned into Turn Evil and worked on more targets than just Undead. But both of these abilities no longer exist currently in WoW. But, funny enough, there are still incredibly specific CC abilities in the game. Druids have Hibernate, for example, which allows them to put beasts and dragon types to sleep. And Priests have Shackle Undead, which allows them to incapacitate undead-only mobs. And these two abilities are incredibly similar to Scare Beast and Turn Undead. So it's a wonder why those two abilities aren't in the game anymore, while Hibernate and Shackle Undead are in the game. But whatever the case, they'll be making a return with Classic WoW. And at number 3, we have Mana Burn abilities. Specifically, Mana Burn, Viper Sting, and Drain Mana. In Cataclysm, Blizzard removed two of the three Mana Drain abilities, and then the final one with the start of Miss because they didn't like the arena strategy of just trying to survive while you burned your opponent's healer's mana. Mana Burn was the Priest Mana Burn ability, which had a long cast time and would destroy 10% of your opponent's mana per cast, and then do damage based on the amount of mana you destroyed through the ability. So if you use Mana Burn 10 times, theoretically, that would be enough to completely wipe out someone's mana. In Vanilla WoW, before arenas were added to the game, Mana Burn abilities weren't really a big deal, as they only really applied in Battlegrounds, and in those kinds of settings, Mana Drains aren't the most important thing in the world for a variety of reasons that just don't apply to arenas. Especially since Mana Burn had such a long cast time, and could be interrupted by just about anything. Drain Mana was kind of in the same vein, except it was a channeled ability and would give the mana it stole to the Warlock, but could also be interrupted or stopped with any kind of CC. Whereas Viper Sting was much different than the other two, as it was instant cast. You could just throw it up on a healer, and that would drain their mana over time. And if the healer didn't have the ability to dispel poisons, they couldn't get rid of it on themselves. And since Viper Sting was the easiest one to apply, it drained the least amount of mana out of all of them. And like I said a little earlier on in the video, mana drain abilities are only really a problem in arenas, which Vanilla WoW won't have. So, they shouldn't be as much of a nuisance as they were in the Burning Crusade or Wrath of the Lich King when they were in full force. And at number 2, we have the Warlock ability, Ritual of Doom. This is a very flavorful RP ability that Warlocks had, where they performed a ritual with four other party members in order to summon a Doom Guard. And when the Doom Guard is summoned, one of the five people who channeled the spell would be sacrificed in order to summon that Doom Guard which could include the Warlock himself. And then once the Doomguard was summoned, it was a neutral demon who would go around and start attacking people. So if you wanted it as a pet, you had to tame it with Enslaved Demon, which only allowed you to use the Doomguard for 5 minutes, unless it broke the seal early. And while the Ritual of Doom was a very neat ability in theory, in practice and usefulness, it was just a tad bit too inconvenient to use in any practical matter. But you definitely could summon the Doomguard and use it as a pet in raids. But, it was also much easier to just use a regular Warlock pet instead, especially since Ritual of Doom also had a 1 hour cooldown. Ritual of Doom was removed from the game later on in WoW, and currently it is incredibly difficult to summon a Doom Guard, as they only randomly spawn if a random talent that only one spec of Warlocks can take is able to get the killing blow on a target. So it doesn't really exist in the game anymore, and especially not in the way it did in Vanilla WoW, where you had to perform the ritual with four other people. And I think the Warlock Ritual of Doom is the perfect example of a Vanilla WoW-like ability, where Blizzard was really experimenting with what they could do with the game, and trying to figure out what was cool and what was useful, and sometimes those two things didn't really mix. Or sometimes they were too useful and had to be removed because of that, like the number one spot on this list. And at number one, we have the Paladin ability, Divine Intervention. 
On a one hour cooldown, the paladin could kill themselves in order to place an unbreakable bubble on a party member, who would drop them out of combat and make them not be able to do anything until they clicked off the bubble. And it was supposed to fulfill the paladin fantasy of sacrificing themselves in order to save someone, as it did this very well and was mostly used in raids as a wipe recovery tool, where the paladin can sacrifice themselves in order to save a healer who could start resing people, while at the same time saving them a repair bill. The problem with this ability though, is it was a little too good at saving people, and the bubble placed on people was a little too good at making them immune to everything and drop out of combat. Because you see, this ability would completely break some encounters, and people were using it in order to bug out boss fights to kill them easier, or to completely ignore tough phases of certain fights. It got to the point where Blizzard said they were designing fights with divine intervention in mind. As in, they constantly had to think, Will this new mechanic be broken by a divine intervention? And if an ability is so powerful that Blizzard has to design fights around it, you know there's a problem with it, and that's why they just kind of removed it with the Cataclysm. Kind of the same reason why they removed the AoE silence from Blood Elves Arcane Torrent Racial. Blizzard doesn't like to design fights around one specific ability, but with Classic WoW, all of the boss fights have already been designed with divine intervention in mind, and there's a good probability that they would have fixed the few fights that Divine Intervention broke, like Razor Gore and Blackwing Lair, and it's kind of one of those abilities that can only exist in Classic WoW, as there's no way it'll come back to live version of the game in its Classic WoW form. Leveling in Vanilla WoW was very unique when compared to how we do things in the modern game. You see, leveling in Vanilla WoW was the game, so you spent a long time doing it and MMOs were just played differently back then. So as I progress through this video, you will notice a lot more differences than similarities to how questing is done today. First off, your character was weak, very weak for the first one to 10 levels. Rogues, for example, didn't start off with dual wielding, the iconic ability of a class who is all about attacking quickly with two small weapons could only run one weapon for the first 10 levels. Also, that one weapon was a dagger, because you couldn't learn how to use other weapons until level 10. And daggers, back then and even today, do not hit very hard. They're meant to attack fast and quickly, but not do a lot of high-end damage, which is fine if it wasn't for the fact that the main ability early rogues could use was Sinister Strike an ability that wants the slowest, highest hitting weapon you have in your main hand. Hunters started off with no ranged attacks at level 1, and instead had Raptor Strike. Raptor Strike was a melee ability that added bonus damage to your next melee attack, and wasn't very good. Also, Hunters started off with a weak one-handed weapon too, but at least it was better than a dagger. Early Hunters could easily be mistaken as a melee class, if you didn't know any better because of just how much melee damage you had to do. The ability to auto shoot while moving wasn't added to the game until Cataclysm, so you had to stutter step auto shoot kite every mob if you wanted to use your ranged weapon. Until you got your pet at level 10 of course. Now let's look at the quests themselves for a bit. Lots and lots of quests where of the go collect this item from mobs that has a small chance to drop variety. This was to force players to have to kill a ton of mobs all the time for nearly half of the quests you did. That way, you'd get that sweet monster kill experience, which was crucial to leveling up in an efficient manner. Most vanilla quest guides would even tell you to kill as many mobs as you could, on your way to the next quest giver and on your way to quests. Gather quests all had really long cast times. If you got a rare quest that wasn't telling you to go commit mass genocide on wolves to get four paws, you'd sometimes get lucky and have a nice and easy gather quest. Although, these weren't really all that easy. Most of the things you had to collect had moderately long respawn timers. So if there were other players in the area, that made them take a lot longer to do. Most items were swarming with mobs that had to be cleared out first. Most of them were very far apart from each other and forced you to have to hunt them down for a long time. And also, they would take about 5 seconds on average to collect each one. 
Same with gathering herbs and mining, about 5 second cast times for each, with the chance of failing and having to do it again. Everything in Vanilla WoW had incredibly long cast times to collect, whereas today it's almost instant, if not collected in 2 seconds at the most. And for quests, that necessarily wasn't just about going out and killing or collecting stuff. You had to read them very carefully to make sure you understood what to do. Information was kind of sparse back then, so you had to pay close attention to the quest text to understand what exactly you needed to do. Because obviously, there were no quest markers in-game. Items didn't glow if you needed them, and mobs didn't even tell you if they dropped anything you needed for your quest either. Killing mobs was hard. Your character was weak. Even after hitting level 10, mobs were powerful. On average, it might take you 20 to 30 seconds to kill one normal, non-elite, level-appropriate mob. Fighting two at once was nearly death, but could be handled if you popped cooldowns or if your class had a way to handle it. Good AoE in Vanilla WoW was the exception, not the norm. So, not many classes could deal with two mobs at once on a regular basis, and getting three mobs was almost guaranteed death unless you had a way to leave combat or escape. Killing large groups of mobs took planning and strategy, because they were usually clumped up together and you didn't want to accidentally pull more than one mob at a time. Also, mobs respawning on top of you usually also meant death, and going into a cave for a quest item usually meant that the mobs at the entrance would respawn before you were finished, because of how long it took to kill everything, and it was most times easier to just die and res outside rather than deal with trying to re-clear it, as you were probably going to die anyway. Combat was a little harder too. Today we have inherent hit chance and expertise, but in vanilla WoW, weapon-based classes had to deal with parries, dodges, glancing blows, blocks, all mobs could block, not just mobs with shields, and misses. Half of the time you attacked a mob on a melee character, you would miss the attack in some way, shape, or form. Because getting the stats needed to attack through those was on gear that you had no control over while leveling. But luckily, casters and hunters didn't have to deal with this as much. In vanilla, the only thing a ranged attack could do was miss, and maybe be blocked. Plus, spells only had to worry about misses and being partially resisted. But because you were so weak, gear felt better and more meaningful. Finding a treasure chest in vanilla WoW was infinitely more valuable than finding one in the more modern versions of the game, as it was almost guaranteed to have a green item in it. Getting a green item that you could use and had stats that you needed just felt better because of how hard everything was and how rare good pieces of gear were. Being so weak also forced cooperation. Quests with hard to kill bosses or lots of adds required a group, and since everyone was used to dying to more than two mobs at once, they were much more willing to join groups and look for them in kind. Speaking of boss mobs, Vanilla WoW had this really unfair way of making boss-like mobs harder to kill. You see, what they would do is just make them a higher level than everything else in the zone. And they did this with dungeon bosses too. If you were doing a quest in the starting zone, and killing mobs level 7 and 8 for most of the quest, you finally get to the final one, which has you kill one mob. And then when you get to it, you'll find out that it's level 12, and destroys you for being 4 levels higher than you, as a level difference makes it harder to hit and gives it crushing blows if the gap is big enough. Over time, Blizzard just completely removed this mechanic from the game, and for good reasons. Making mobs harder by just making them a higher level was kind of unfair. There was no auto loot. You had to hold shift with each pickup in order to manually activate auto loot, and you had to loot each mob one at a time. None of that AoE loot. Also, you couldn't see the sell price of an item unless you were at a vendor. So, if you completed a quest and got a reward that you didn't need, there wasn't really a way to know which item gave more gold, outside of prior knowledge of which items sell for more, usually. Or maybe an add-on. Travel time was what you spent half your time doing. 
Flight points were very sparse, and it was rare for towns to have one. It was entirely normal to have to run to every single point in a questing zone without ever flying, as flying was usually reserved for going to other zones in major cities, not the conveniences of going from one quest hub to the other. Most quests were far apart from each other, and not many of them could be done side by side like today, where maybe three quests could be completed in the same area at the same time. So most of the time, you were traveling slowly to a questing spot to finish one, maybe two quests at the same time before running to a new place for a different quest. And most classes were slow. Priests had absolutely no movement speed increases. Rogues had a sprint once every five minutes. And you didn't get the opportunity to get a mount until level 40, where most players couldn't even afford it on their first character for the high price. So it wasn't unusual for players just to run on foot, slowly, everywhere, to do everything. Because Vanilla WoW loved to have quests that made you go all over the place. The other vast amounts of your time were spent on downtime. Downtime was the name of the game. Killing a few mobs, or one especially tough mob, would mean having to sit down and eat to get your health back, or bandage. First aid was very valuable for leveling, as most classes did not have self-heals, like they do today, and you got the materials for bandages from killing humanoid mobs. Mana classes ran out of mana constantly, and had to sit down to drink all the time as well. Out of combat regeneration is so high today that it's not a problem, like, at all, until maybe max level Mythic Plus Dungeons. With all these hurdles to leveling, and all the time spent running everywhere, it did make a few things more meaningful. The world felt bigger, because you spent so much time on the ground having to slowly run everywhere. Also, reaching a new level felt more rewarding. Every two levels you got new abilities or ranks to train, and every single level after 10 gave a new talent point. So getting a new rank of one of your damaging moves could sometimes double its power which gave a very drastic and fun power climb. Whereas killing a mob may have taken 30 seconds before, now it only took 20 seconds. A new talent every level meant slowly getting stronger and stronger, with the same periodic power climbs, as sometimes hitting a new row of talents could give you an ability to double your damage output. Because the baseline was so incredibly weak, the additions and power-ups you got along the way were much more noticeable. This also made class quests more meaningful. Most class quests in Vanilla WoW gave you either a much needed or crucial ability, like Shaman Totems and Hunter and Warlock Pets, or gave a piece of gear guaranteed to be useful for your class, and were generally worth doing, as well as usually pretty difficult and annoying, some infamously so like the Water Totem quest chain, or the Druid Seal form quests. But having to work hard to get an ability or a good piece of gear did give a good feeling afterwards. So to sum things up, everything hit harder. Your character was weak. Everything took forever to complete. Everything took forever to travel to. Level up rewards were on point and felt genuinely rewarding. The low lows made the highs a lot more enjoyable. And I think that's why vanilla questing is remembered. With heirlooms, much better resource management, higher numbers at lower levels, and the ease of getting new gear in general, the game has just evolved so far past the point of vanilla WoW's harder leveling that it's basically an entirely different game. Quests nowadays are a lot more sane and reasonable more clumped up for ease of access, mounts can be obtained at level 1, and there's more ways to gain XP outside of just grinding mobs and doing quests. I personally think the game is better with all these changes, but is it really an argument of which is better when they're both so fundamentally different? Because the vanilla model is also enjoyable in its own way, and I kind of miss talent points and do ranks with leveling. Back in the day, a lot of spells and abilities players had were restricted or just worked in weird ways for RP reasons, or for lore reasons, like how you can't use Polymorph on a machine because it's an ability that's supposed to transform a living creature into another one. This list will go over abilities that kind of work like that.
Mages used to have to farm light feathers in order to use slowfall. Same with priests, as light feathers weren't just sold by vendors. You had to go out into the world and kill birds in hope of getting some to drop. Of course, you could also just buy some off the auction house. Other classes also had all kinds of reagents. Mages also needed reagents to make portals, druids for rebirth, shamans for reincarnation, water breathing and water walking, and hunters with probably the worst reagent system of needing ammo to use all of their basic abilities in auto attacks, instead of just being used for one-off abilities like all the other classes. None of this is in the game, with some being removed slowly over time in each expansion until finally, you don't need items to really use any player abilities in the game anymore. In addition to having to deal with ammo, hunters also had a whole pet mini-game they had to manage. Something Warlocks, the other pet class in early WoW, didn't have to deal with at all. Pets had happiness levels, and they did 25% more damage if happy, or 25% less damage if unhappy. Also, if your pet was unhappy for too long, it would run away. And pet happiness just went away naturally, even while not in combat, so you had to be careful about AFKing on a hunter for too long while your pet was out. Otherwise, you could lose it. When you first learned how to use your pet, you didn't actually get the ability to feed your pet at the same time. You had to complete a short quest after completing the hunter taming quest, and feeding your pet was the only way to give it happiness, until later on in WoW's life. So for vanilla WoW hunters, if you tamed a pet as soon as you were allowed to, there's a good chance it would run away before you also completed the turn-in for the ability to feed it as well. You also had to level up your pet since they didn't scale to your level until later on. And the only XP a pet gained was through killing mobs. So you had to grind mobs if you were leveling a low level pet for a while. Number 8. Racial Weapon Stat Boosts Some races in lore favor some weapons over others, like dwarves and their guns, or trolls and their bows. These racial bonuses were good enough that you wanted to get a weapon to match the racial if you could since having a plus 5 skill and a weapon on top of maxing it out meant less misses overall. And for some reason, humans were the only race with 4 racial weapon bonuses, having a bonus for maces and swords, both one-handers and two-handers. Trolls kind of came in second since their bonus was for bows and thrown weapons, while orcs I guess are tied since they had a bonus to one and two-handed axes. Number 7, Ritual of Doom. This was an ability warlocks had until Cataclysm that allowed them to perform a little ritual with four other people, and once the ritual was complete, one of them would die at random, and a doom guard would appear and start attacking people. Then the warlock could use their enslaved demon ability to use the doom guard as their pet for a bit. And the only way to learn the ability was through a grimoire you had to find while killing demons. And later on, an alternative way to learn it was added through a small quest chain. Ritual of Doom covers all of the fantasy of being a warlock pretty well. Live sacrifices to summon a powerful demon that you would then manually have to take over to use as your pet. And even after this ability was removed, and warlocks were just given the ability to summon Doom Guards in other ways, the warlock pet version of the Doom Guard always appeared with the enslaved demon animation around it as kind of an homage to its origins. The removal of this ability is pretty obvious in its reasonings. It was kind of an impractical thing to do to get a temporary pet, and Warlocks wanted to use Doom Guards, so it was just turned into a cooldown, later turned into an option for a permanent pet, and I think today it can only be summoned at random through Doom procs or something. Also in Legion, Warlocks could do a version of this ritual to unlock a hidden artifact appearance. Just to point out that they paid homage to this recently, since I know I'll get a whole bunch of comments about it if I don't specifically mention this. Number 6. Detect Magic In Vanilla WoW, you couldn't actually see what buffs, mobs, or enemy players had. But mages had a skill called Detect Magic, which would show you this information. This is because in most fantasy games, including tabletop RPGs like Dungeons & Dragons, information on your enemies isn't something readily available, and it was just standard for you to not actually know much about your opponent on your first playthrough, and just learn things through experience. And in some RPG games, hiding and revealing buffs was a PvP metagame tactic, 
so obviously WoW wouldn't show them by default. But as the game progressed, they figured out WoW wasn't really the kind of game where these mechanics really mattered that much. So they removed the detect magic ability and just started showing all buffs on enemies by default instead. Number 5, Entangling Roots. Did you know Entangling Roots used to have an outside only restriction? Like, for some things, only being usable outside makes sense. Like how you can't ride mounts inside and stuff like that. And there's even a few abilities that still can't be used inside, like a druid's travel form, because it's basically like a mount, I guess. Entangling Roots was a root that did a little bit of damage and would have made for some great CC in early WoW, as it's used today on melee mobs. But you never hear any vanilla stories about it being used, because most raids and dungeons took place indoors. Not all, of course. AQ40 was pretty famous for allowing mounts inside of it, but like almost every other one was indoors, rendering entangling roots useless. Now, as to why it had this restriction is pretty obvious from a fantasy point of view. The ability literally brings the roots of the earth out of the ground to grab the target. And obviously, this can't be used inside buildings. But also obviously, it shouldn't be usable in the desert either, or on hard bedrock, or anywhere where there isn't trees. So just giving it the mount restriction of only being usable outside, seems like it might have just been easier to code. They did eventually remove its zone restrictions, and it's been a staple of Druid PvP and Melee Mob CC ever since. Number 4, Brewing Poisons. As rogues leveled up, they would learn how to brew stronger and stronger poisons with their class-specific profession of poison making. Nowadays, the only class with a class-specific profession is Death Knights, and they don't even level that up, it's just a way to enchant their weapons. With rogue poisons, you had to do a small quest chain to unlock them, then had to level it up like any other profession by crafting tons of lower level poisons. And you needed a recipe from a raid boss to craft the strongest rank of poisons. And mats for poisons were obtained from all kinds of things and not just vendors, like pickpocketing, lockboxes, and herbing. Rogues also had the lockpicking profession to level up, but that was more like a gathering profession. Eventually, it was removed and they just moved poisons to vendors to be bought, as it was kind of too much of a chore for one class to have to go through so much for a basic DPS feature of their class, even if it did fit their fantasy. And eventually, even the vendor poisons were removed, since no other class had to deal with any kind of special items needed to DPS, with the removal of ammo. And now, not even all three specs of rogues use poisons anymore. And they work more like buffs, as you don't actually have to put them on your weapons anymore either. Number 3. Priest Racials Out of all the classes, priests in particular had extra racials on top of their normal racials. What this meant is a Night Elf Priest, for example, would have its normal racials of Shadow Mill, Dodge, and Nature Resist, but also have two additional racials like Star Shards and Elune's Grace while an undead priest wouldn't have star shards or Elune's grace, and instead have Devouring Plague and Touch of Weakness. All priest races had their own special two racial abilities, and some of these racials were really good, like how most alliance players wanted dwarf priests for their fear ward racial. Having different abilities for classes based on race was a unique idea, and I think it would have been fun for more classes to have this feature. Although, these racials didn't last long, as in Wrath, all priest racials were removed, and Blizzard just kind of gave all priests some of the racials they liked the best as baseline or talented abilities, like Devouring Plague and Fear Ward. But just like most of the things on this list, this change was made because it was too much of a hassle to balance a class having two different abilities for each race. Number 2. Having to perform special actions in order to earn basic class abilities. In order to tame a pet, you had to first go out and tame three pets of varying difficulty, in order for your character to actually learn how to do it, which made getting the abilities feel better and fit the fantasy of the class better. In order for warlocks to summon their various demons, they had to go out and get special materials to summon it, and then beat it into submission before forming a pact with them. 
In order for warriors to get their various stances, they had to go out and learn the embodiment of those stances, and so on and so on. These special actions were called class quests, and nearly every class had some in one shape or form. Not all were equal though. Some actually made sense, like the ones I mentioned before with hunters and warlock pets, and some were just kind of ridiculous with their requirements, like a level 20 shaman having to run across two continents multiple times to collect water samples to learn how to use their water totems, or druids having to regularly swim into fatigue zones and run across high level zones to use their most useless form. Eventually, these were all removed, as they might have been fun the first time around, but were just plain annoying to do on alts for the most part. And now, you just get all of your abilities automatically as you level up. There's no need to even visit your class trainer anymore. And number one, basically vanilla paladins. Paladins were a mess of a class who were mainly brought to raids because their buffs were really good. But their buffs only lasted five minutes, and could only be applied to one person at a time in early vanilla. So some of them basically spent the whole raid just reapplying buffs and throwing out little bits of healing. But oh boy, the moment an undead boss came up, paladins finally got their time to shine. As paladins, a class with very few actual damaging abilities in vanilla WoW, did have one of their only damaging spells tied to one specific type of mob. And that of course was Exorcism. Exorcism was a single target, instant cast, long range nuke that did damage to only undead targets. But it also had a 15 second cooldown because you didn't want paladins to be too powerful against undeads, of course. Because in vanilla WoW, instant cast spells that did a lot of damage were pretty rare. So despite its heavy, inherent restriction to only being usable on one type of target, they still had to balance it accordingly, for some reason. Now in vanilla WoW, it was normal for lots of abilities to have specific target restrictions, but a vast majority of them were for CC abilities. Paladins were the only class with a whole host of abilities that seemingly only worked on undeads. They also had Holy Wrath, an AoE ability that hit for almost as much as exorcism to all undeads. And get this, also demons, within 20 yards. But with a 2 second cast time and a 1 minute cooldown, because they didn't want the ability to be too useful, you know? Pallies also had Turn Undead which was a fear CC that only worked on undead targets, and was a little more reasonable for the time period as, like I said, most classes had target restrictions on CC abilities. And finally, Pallies also had Sense Undead, a tracking spell that only worked for undead targets. And that's not all. In Beta WoW, Pallies had two more undead only abilities. Their Seal of Righteousness ability used to give an increase to their attack power against undead targets. And Judgment, a staple of Pally abilities ever since their inception, used to be an AoE nuke that only worked on undead targets. When Vanilla WoW finally launched, Pallies got a huge overhaul and a lot of their abilities were changed and removed. And in this purge, Seal of Righteousness was changed to do bonus damage on swings against any targets, and Judgment was changed to work on any target as well, and would activate the second ability whatever Seal the Pally had active. With all these undead only abilities, you'd think the undead would have played such a large role in vanilla WoW, right? Well, actually, the only raid with a significant population of undead mobs and bosses was Naxxramas, which was also the last and least played raid of vanilla WoW. Eventually, as time went on, they gave Pallies ways to use their undead abilities on more targets and even had a proc that allowed exorcism to be usable on anything, before just removing its target restriction completely. But even today, there are still target restrictions on a lot of CC abilities, just not really on any, you know, single target nukes. In this video, we'll go over 10 abilities that were in the Classic WoW's beta, but did not make it to the live version of the game, or were added to the game much later on in WoW's history. And at number 10, we have Crusader Strike and Holy Strike. Now, I've already made a whole video about these two abilities and why they were removed, so I'll keep it brief at this part. Basically, Crusader Strike was a Ret Paladin ability that did damage and put a debuff on the target that increased your holy damage that would stack up to five times. 
and this ability had no cooldown, so it was an actual spammable ability that Red Paladins had access to. And Holy Strike was just like the Warrior's Heroic Strike, except it did holy damage. Now, after I made my video on these two abilities, a fan then linked me an interview with Kevin Jordan on a podcast, who was one of the three original game designers on the Vanilla WoW team. And in that podcast, someone asked him why Crusader Strike and Holy Strike were removed from Beta Paladins. And I'll play you an audio clip of what his answer to that question was. The, the, early, the early beta incarnation of the Paladin was very much placeholder. A lot of okay. the early classes, sort of before they hit, you know, final testing, were had a lot of placeholder abilities. Well, he needs buttons to push while he's running around, but we're not quite ready with their full systems. So right. a lot of people just had buttons to push, right? And that's exactly what those abilities were. And once the seal and judgment system came to light, we wanted that entire system to be sort of all inclusive. And the previous strikes that weren't connected to that system no longer fit within that mold. So they would have felt really odd, you know, next to all the other abilities. So basically, Crusader Strike and Holy Strike were just placeholder abilities. And they had planned on adding the seal system, which Paladins eventually got the entire time. They just kind of added it very late in development, as the seal system wasn't implemented until about two weeks before the game went live. So it was a very last second change with almost no testing at all. And it wasn't a very popular DPS system. And since this change was so last second, mobs in the old school Scarlet Monastery still used the old school's Crusader Strike and Holy Strike abilities, as they were modeled after Beta Paladins. And at number 9, we have Trip. Now, for some of the abilities I'm going to talk about in this video, I don't actually know which class they belong to specifically, so I might need to make an educated guess for one or two of them, and I'm pretty sure Trip was supposed to be a rogue ability. So what this ability does is on your next weapon swing, it would trip your target, do a little bit of damage, and then award you one combo point. What the Trip actually did, it never actually said, but I assumed it was some kind of stun for like a second or so. Uh, it didn't cost any energy, but the fact that it did give you a combo point is a pretty good indicator that it's supposed to be a rogue ability. And I have a little bit more confirmation to that, as the ability has the exact same icon as the Hunter ability called Wing Clip. And the name of that icon, when you look at it in the game files, is called Ability Rogue Trip. Which is a pretty clear indication that it was supposed to be a rogue ability, and it did make it into the game as an NPC ability, for two mobs in the Hillsrat Foothills and Silver Pine Forest. Kind of like how there's mobs in the game who have the Beta Paladin's Crusader Strike. Although there's not too much confirmation in patch notes that rogues had this ability, so it was most likely never actually given to them, and just kind of intended to be given to them. And at number 8 we have Thunderbolt. This was an early shaman ability with a really unique and kind of overpowered effect, because basically what it does is it literally allows you to throw your weapon at the target for nature damage, interrupt spell casting for 15 seconds, which is like three times longer than the average interrupt lockout, I might add, and then leave you unarmed the entire time this ability is airborne. Which seems kind of like Earth Shock a little bit, in that it does nature damage and interrupts, which is probably why it was never actually given to shamans. There's also a data mined item called the Tablet of Thunderbolt, which is a class ability item that requires level 32, and has the effect of teaching a shaman the ability Thunderbolt. So this one has a pretty clear indication of which class it was meant for, and the ability is very similar to Meriden's Stormbolt ability, so it seems like it could have easily been converted into a warrior ability as well, if they just removed the mana cost and made it interact with rage instead. But the ability honestly seemed kind of powerful with that super long interrupt, and Shaman's already had Earthshock as a really good interrupt, so they didn't really need Thunderbolt as well. So, kind of makes sense why it was never actually added to the game. And also, just a little note, something I found while I was editing this video and putting the pictures together, the icon for Seal of Righteousness ability, which depicts a flying hammer, is known as Thunderbolt in the game files. This seems to be a trend amongst a lot of these abilities in the beta, never actually made into the game. They just reuse the same icon over and over without changing the name of the ability and just keep whichever ability it was originally given to. And at number 7 we have Shadow Word Befuddle. 
This was supposed to be a priest ability that when cast on an enemy target would befuddle them for 30 seconds, making their spells cast much slower. So it seems like it was supposed to be a priest version of Curse of Tongues. And the reason I know this was supposed to be a priest ability is the same reason I know Thunderbolt was supposed to be a shaman ability, as there's a codex in the game files called Codex of Shadow Word Befuddle, which requires a priest class to use and will teach them level 1 Befuddle at level 24. It seems like it would have been neat for priests to also have a Curse of Tongues, but overall not the biggest loss in the world that they never actually gave it to priests. And at number 6 we have Mind Rot. This is another priest ability which is very similar to Hunter's Viper Sting, in that it will put a dot on the target which will drain mana every time it ticks instead of dealing damage. Except Mind Rot seemed to have lasted for 30 seconds, instead of the shorter 8 seconds of Viper Sting. And just like a lot of abilities on this list, the reason I know it's a priest spell is because there's a codex in the game files that teaches this ability to priests at level 38. Now, as to why this was never added to the game, it's probably because priests already have another mana burn ability called Mana Burn. And it's reasonable to assume they didn't want to give priests two separate mana burn abilities, especially one in the form of a dot and then another in the form of a spammable cast. And a little note about the icon for Mind Rot. This icon is more commonly used for the spell lock ability that a Warlock's pet Fellhunter has, and the icon in the game files is still known as Mind Rot. And at number 5 we have Holy Ward. This ability would give you an absorption shield that would only absorb holy damage. Very similar to Shadow Ward, Frost Ward, etc. Lots of casters in Vanilla WoW had damage shields that only worked on one type of magic. Although there was this little distinction about holy damage specifically in Vanilla WoW, in that players could not get resistance to holy damage. It was the only type of damage which existed in the game as its own damaging type that there was no gear that allowed you to get holy resistance. So it would make sense that they removed holy ward to kind of fit in line with the whole holy damage is the only damage that players can't resist mantra. And this was a warlock ability seen as there's an item in the game files called the Grimoire of Holy Ward, which allows Warlocks to train it at level 40. And since Warlocks also had Shadow Ward in Vanilla WoW, it kind of made sense that they would also have Holy Ward as well, seeing as mages had Frost and Fire Ward. But also kind of makes sense that they didn't give it to Warlocks eventually, as this seems kind of weird that a Shadow Damaging spec would have protection from Holy Damage. And then in Legion, Holy Ward was added back to the game in the form of a PvP talent for Holy Priests, and it worked nothing like its beta version, and instead kind of worked like Fear Ward, in that you placed it on a friendly target and it would prevent the next CC effect, instead of just a Fear like Fear Ward did. So it was added in the game as kind of a completely different ability, just sharing the same name. Which leads me into the next item on this list. And at number 4, we have Seal of Righteousness. Now, this ability did actually make it into Vanilla WoW, but the version that existed in the beta was completely different to what it turned into in the live version of the game. That it's basically a different ability. Because what beta Seal of Righteousness did was give a buff to a weapon for one minute, which increased the amount of damage you did to undead targets only. And this ability could be cast on other players, and also had no judgment interaction, because Judgment didn't exist in the same form as it did when it went live. So, this was a completely unique ability that Blizzard removed, kept the name, and then created a new ability and gave it this name, as what Seal of Righteousness did in Vanilla WoW was added extra holy damage to your attacks, could not be cast on other players, and dealt holy damage if it was consumed by Judgment. So, in the live version of the game, Paladins had three abilities that only worked on Undeads, but they had one more in the beta, making them the ultimate anti-undead playable class. Although it makes sense why they just removed another one of their anti-undead abilities, because abilities that only work on undeads are useless in like 90% of the game. And at number 3 we have Sleep. Funny enough, this ability was given to two classes in the beta of WoW, before being changed to basically hibernate and given to druids, and what it did was on a 1.5 second cast time with no cooldown, you could just put an enemy target to sleep for 45 seconds. So, a pretty powerful CC. And it was originally given to priests, 
as, again, there's even a codex in the game files that show that it can be learned by a priest at level 6. But in the beta, they decided to move this ability over to mages, and it worked exactly the same way. And there's even a Tome of Sleep in the game files, as it shows that mages could learn it at level 8. But then in patch 0.8, still in the beta, Sleep was changed into Polymorph for mages, and then Druids were given Hibernate in beta patch 0.12 which is an ability that can put a target to sleep, but only works on beasts and dragons. And at number two, we have a weird ability called Ethereal Form, which is a five minute cooldown ability that makes the user immune to physical damage, but unable to use physical abilities for 10 seconds. So kind of like a Paladin's Blessing and Protection, full immunity to physical damage, but unable to attack. Or the old school version of it anyway, as I think the current version of Blessing and Protection does allow you to attack while it's on you. Anyways, it seems as if Ethereal Form was supposed to be a Shaman ability, as there's a tablet in the game files called the Tablet of Ethereal Form, and it shows that Shamans could learn this ability at level 24. So it almost seems like the Shaman version of Blessing and Protection. And honestly, thematically, Ethereal Form seems like it makes more sense than Blessing and Protection for the kind of effect it provides with the downsides. Also, something interesting I found out while editing this video, Ethereal Form was added to the game in Legion in the form of a PvP talent for shamans, and it functions very similar to how it did in the beta. Okay, and at number one, we're just gonna have a whole bunch of other shaman abilities, because when I first started making this video, I didn't actually know which classes a lot of these abilities came from, so I just put a lot of the shaman ones at number one, because there seemed to be a lot of them at the time, and then it ended up a couple of the other ones earlier on the list also happened to be Shaman abilities, but whatever. So first up we have Group Astral Recall, which on a 15 minute cooldown will send everyone in the caster's group back to their Hearthstone location. So it's kind of like a mass Hearthstone cast without activating the cooldown of your group's Hearthstones. And seems like an incredibly good ability, as the Hearthstone cooldown was one hour long in vanilla. And the ability was never actually given to shamans, but funny enough, the icon used for this ability is known as Astral Recall Group in the game files, despite the fact that the icon is used for a lot of other things. Next up we have Invisibility Totem, which is a totem you can summon that would give everyone in your group invisibility for one minute. Although based on the wording of this ability, I assume it just worked while you were near the totem and didn't actually let you stay invisible outside of the vicinity of your totem. Now, this ability was never actually added to the game, but another Shaman Totem was added later on in the beta called Grace of Air Totem, which uses Invisibility Totem's icon. And in the game files, the icon for Grace of Air Totem is known as Invisibility Totem, which means Invisibility Totem was added to the game files first. Next up we have Shock, or Lightning Shock as it was called later on in the beta, which is very similar to the shock spells that shamans eventually got in the live version of the game, where they were all instant cast, had a 20 yard range, 6 second cooldown abilities that shared a 6 second cooldown between them. And they all did something different, whereas shock has all of these features except it only just does nature damage, and has no indication that it shared a cooldown with other abilities. Which leads me to believe this was just the very first iteration of the shock system they had in the game, and then they removed this one and then added in the three shaman shocks they eventually got. Or maybe this one was just an extra shock on top of the other three. And next up we have Lightning Storm, which is an AoE lightning ability that you would cast on a targeted area and then just leave it alone. There are mobs in the game who have an ability very similar to this, and the icon they use for Lightning Storm in the beta is also named Lightning Storm. Although I don't think any other players can actually use this icon, so it doesn't really matter like it does for the other ones I mentioned. And lastly, we have Molten Blast, which is a spammable fire-based damaging ability with no cooldown and a lower cast time than Lightning Bolt. And I guess it would make sense why they removed a second castable spell with no cooldown, as the class didn't really need to have two of them. And I assume they later incorporated this ability into the Lava Burst ability Shamans eventually got in Wrath of the Lich King. And unlike a lot of these abilities, Molten Blast was actually given to shamans to test in the beta, and then it got removed in beta patch 0.8. In Classic WoW, the racials are not exactly super balanced, so some of them do perform much better with certain classes than others. 
And in this list, I'll go over which ones are the best combinations, but mainly for PvE. And I'll go over that a bit more as we go into our first part on the list. And at number 10, we have the Undead Race with Rogue, Priest, Mage, and Warlock. And this is only on this list for its PvP applications. PvP in Classic WoW is a little weird because there's no rated PvP. PvP consists of Battlegrounds and World PvP, and both of those are inherently unbalanced because of the massive amounts of people involved in the variations in which you'll find each other. And it's to the point where some of the most efficient ways to PvP in Classic WoW is to just spam AoEs. So, which racials are best in PvP is very subjective, which is why this will be one of the only spots on this list relating to its PvP usefulness. And Undead have one of the best PvP racials in the game in the form of Wheel of the Forsaken. The earliest version of Wheel of Forsaken was the most broken racial in the game's history, as it allowed them to just be passively immune to fear, charm, and sleep effects. It was later changed at the start of Vanilla WoW to only give immunity for 20 seconds, and could be used if you were subject to one of those CCs. And it was overpowered in this version as well. It was then later nerfed to give immunity for 5 seconds and also break those three forms of CCs, which is what it will be like in Classic WoW, and this version is also very strong. Especially since PvP trinkets in Classic WoW only break certain kinds of CC, and not all of them. And Fear is one of the more prevalent CCs run in PvP. And the reason I didn't list Warriors, along with all of the other classes that an Undead can be, is because they can already break out of Fears with Berserker Rage, but even they are fine with being Undead for PvP, because you can never have too many ways to break out of CCs. And at number 9, we have the Tauren Warrior Tank, specifically. Now, if you're a Horde and you want to play a Warrior, and want to dabble in PvP, you have the fine option of a Tauren Warrior, since they have fears dealt with thanks to Berserker's Rage, they don't gain as much benefit from Will of the Forsaken as the other Undead classes. And they have War Stomp, an AoE stun for 2 seconds, which is really good for melee classes in PvP. And if you do PvE, Torrent tanks have the highest health pools out of all the tanks, thanks to their racial endurance, which gives them a 5% increased total health. And tanks do like having extra health. Now, the only problem with the Torin Warrior tanks is there is a better option, which I'll talk about later on in this video, but Torins are still pretty solid at this one distinction nonetheless, just not super good at it, and that's why they're only at number 9 on this list. And at number 8, we have the Troll Shaman. Out of all the three races that can be shamans, trolls win out because they have Berserking, which will give them a 10% haste increase for like 10 seconds, with the chance of it going up to a 25% haste increase, the lower they are on health. And since shamans are primarily healers in PvE, this is the only race that actually gives any kind of healing advantages, which makes it the best of the three. But it's not the strongest race slash class combination when compared to a lot of the more top spots on this list. And at number 7, we have the Troll Hunter. Out of all the races that can be hunters, only the trolls and orcs have racials that increase their damage. And the orcs racial only increases the damage of their pets by 5%, which does not translate to a lot of overall damage since the highest DPS spec is Marksman. And their Blood Fury racial only affects melee attacks. So, if you want to become a melee hunter, then the orc is the best race for you. But if you want to go marksman, then troll is your best bet because of their berserk racial, which can increase their haste by 10 to 25% for 10 seconds, and can allow them to cast their aim shot quicker, and can provide a much higher DPS increase than a passive 5% more pet damage if you're able to line up your cooldowns and abilities with it properly. Now, on the alliance side, most people will ping the night elves for hunters, specifically because they have the highest base agility in the game out of all the other hunters, because none of the other alliance races actually have racials that increase their hunter damage. And coincidentally, trolls actually have the second highest base agility out of all the hunters, which kind of makes them even more of the best race to pick. Dwarves have a plus 5 increase to gun skills, but weapon skills don't really matter for ranged weapons, unless you can get it up to a plus 15 in that weapon skill, in which case it would only give you an extra 1% chance to hit. But with only a plus 5, like the gun skill that dwarves have, and the bow skill that trolls have, as trolls also have a racial 
that give them a plus 5 weapon skill and bows, that's not going to do very much for you unless you're able to increase it by an additional 10, which is not easy, and to add to that, I'm not even sure if it's possible, as there are very few items and enchants in the game that increase your weapon skill. So the Troll Hunter wins out because basically all the other classes just aren't as good in comparison. And at number 6, we have the Gnome Warlock. Gnomes have a racial called Expansive Mind, which increases their total intellect by 5%, and Intellect in Vanilla WoW increased your maximum mana pool, and also your spell crit. Though I should mention, Intellect did not increase your spell power in Vanilla WoW. So it was just the spell crit and mana pool increase that Warlocks wanted from the racial, as getting 5% more than all other Warlocks is a pretty decent advantage to have making gnomes the undisputed kings for warlock DPS racials, based on expansive mind alone. And the best a horde warlock could hope for is the orc warlock, thanks to their command ability which increases the damage of their pets by 5%, which is even less useful for warlocks than it is for hunters. Gnomes also have the escape artist racial, and one of the smallest character models in the game, which made them harder to click on which was actually a legitimate advantage in Vanilla WoW PvP. So, they had some good uses in PvP as well, in addition to their engineering racial bonus, as engineering was one of the most powerful professions in Vanilla WoW. And at number 5, we have the No Mage, for basically the same reason as the No Morlock, the 5% increase to intelligence. Basically, if you're playing a DPS caster class, and you have the Gnome available to you in Vanilla WoW, you want to be a gnome for the expansive mind racial, of which there are only two, the mage and warlock. And they also have the benefits of the escape artists and the engineer increase as well. So you'll probably see a lot of gnome mages in PvP, because escape artists is not half bad, even if it does have a cast time in order to break roots in vanilla WoW. Now, if you're playing a horde mage, you obviously don't have gnome available as an option, so the best race to pick is troll for the berserking as casting faster as a caster is always good. And at number 4, we have the Human Rogue. Humans have this racial called Perception, which when activated, for the next 20 seconds, you have an increased stealth detection. So, in a rogue v rogue matchup, human rogues can find other rogues more easily. And humans also gain 10% additional reputation for all rep gains, allowing them to grind out the many reputations of Vanilla WoW much easier. Neither of these things are why rogues are so high on this list though. The real reason human rogues are so good is because of mace and sword specialization. These two specializations increase your weapon skills with one-handed maces and swords, and two-handed maces and swords by five. Now, unlike weapon skills for ranged weapons, weapon skills for melee weapons are actually incredibly valuable. You see, ranged weapons can't be dodged, parries, or produce glancing blows which melee weapons can be, which means melee weapons miss or do less damage much more often. And against boss level targets, the average melee weapon will be a glancing blow 40% of the time. And a glancing blow means your weapon only does 70% of the normal damage and is incapable of a crit. Now, per point of weapon skill past the maximum of 300 increases the amount of damage you do during a glancing blow by about 3%. So. Having a plus 5 in weapon skill increases the damage of your glancing blows by 15%, bringing up the total to 85% of normal damage every time you land at a glancing blow, instead of 70% of normal damage. And this 15% increase translates to about 6% more auto attack damage, and auto attack damage should account for a large chunk of your total damage. So it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to say that this one racial could increase your total damage against bosses by about 3%. And weapon skills increase your damage even further against less than boss level mobs, as against elite mobs who are only 2 levels higher than you, you'll do 10.5% more damage with your auto attacks with only a plus 5 in weapon skill, which is usually the level of most mobs that appear in boss encounters. And since weapon skills increase your damage by this much, having a plus 5 in 2 weapon skills one of them being the most common best in slot weapons, the one handed swords, means humans have a very good damage ratio when it comes to melee classes, putting them near the top of the list, especially with rogues where a lot of their damage comes from weapons, but not all of it. And at number 3, we have the Orc DPS Warrior. 
Orcs also have a weapon skill increase in the form of Axe Specialization, which gives you a plus 5 weapon skill in 1 and 2 handed axes. So if an Orc DPS warrior is using an Axe, they will deal 6% more auto attack damage to boss level mobs, and 10.5% more auto attack damage to just elite level mobs. In addition to that, Orcs also have Blood Fury, which increases their melee attack power by 25% for 15 seconds, which is a pretty good damage ratio on top of having the weapon skill ratio. But since this cooldown also reduces the healing you take by 50% for 25 seconds, that makes them not very good for tanking, as you definitely don't want to nerf the heals you're taking as the tank. Of course, you can just get around this by not using this racial, and instead just take advantage of the Axe Specialization. And Orcs also have their Hardiness Racial, which is really good in PvP, and is kind of a deterrent to rogues wanting to stun you or pick you out of the crowd. All of this put together makes Orcs easily the best race for Horde players if you want to play a DPS Warrior. But then again, they're pretty good for tanking too, as threat actually mattered a lot back then, so doing more damage with your one-handed axe is also good for tanking. And at number 2 we have the Human Warrior, both the tank and DPS versions. Now the reason there's lots of warriors on this list is because every race could be a warrior in Vanilla WoW, so they kind of had the cream of the crop when it came to race class combinations. And Human Warriors make this list for the same reasons why I put the Human Rogue on the list, and that's for the weapon skills racials. Most DPS warriors will dual wield weapons, and having a weapon skill increase in two of them means you have much more options for using a weapon that fits your racial, than the orcs who can only use axes. And most of the best one-handed weapons in the game are swords, which gives humans the edge over the DPS orc warriors, and for their tanking spec still, having the increase in weapon skills is just really good, and since they can use either maces or swords, you have more options for gearing up your tank and using those weapon skills. Now, if you want to go for a warrior tank who actually has defensive racials, the Dwarf Warrior does pretty good, as Stone Form allows you to clear bleeds and basically all other magical effects, and just gives you 10% reduced physical damage for its duration, which is a really good ability for a tank to have, and even Night Elves have a racial which gives them an increased 1% chance to dodge. And even when compared to those other two racials, the Human Warrior is still better because of those weapon skills. A plus 5 in weapon skills is just a really good racial to have for melee fighters, and could have easily put them at the number 1 spot if it wasn't for the actual number 1 spot on this list. And at number 1 we have the Dwarf Priest. You see, priests have priestly racials on top of their normal racials, and the Dwarf Priest specifically is giving the Fear Ward racial, which on a 30 second cooldown allows you to place a buff on someone for 10 minutes, which will negate the effect of one fear. Now this is a pretty situationally useful ability, as it's not as versatile as a lot of the other racials I talked about, but in the situations in which it's useful, boss fights that have a fear, it's so useful that people will bring a Dwarf Priest to raid even if they have absolutely no gear, just to have Fear Ward. And Fear Ward is so useful in those situations that Alliance actually has a slight edge over the Horde when it comes to raiding because they have Fear Ward available to them, and the Horde does not. If one racial is so good that it gives your entire faction an edge, that means it earns the number one spot on this list. But that's not it. Dwarves also still have the Stone Form racial as well, which is really good in PvP and on some raid fights, even for a priest. And they also have another priestly racial in the form of Desperate Prayer, which is an instant cast self-heal that can be used in an emergency to heal themselves to save them from dying. A spell that healing priests have in the live version of WoW as their emergency heal cooldown, and it originated as a dwarf and human racial, as each priest was actually given two racials, and one of them was shared with another race. So only dwarves got Fear Ward, but both dwarves and humans got Desperate Prayer which is a very useful emergency heal, even if it also had a 10 minute cooldown to Vanilla WoW. They loved to give what they thought were powerful abilities back then overly long cooldowns. To start off, this video will be based on a list Blizzard put out in Vanilla WoW that showed the stats of the 20 most dangerous NPCs based on player kill count. 
This video will be using that list exclusively for its rankings. So while there may be some mobs that the community collectively thought of as dangerous, like Murlocs or Hogger, if they don't appear on the list Blizzard put out, they won't be in this video. And at number 10, we have the Harvest Watcher. The Harvest Watcher was the 18th most dangerous mob, and I'll explain a little bit later on why I'm kind of skipping around the list a little bit, instead of starting off with number 10 or the number 20th on the list, because some of them can be kind of grouped together. Now, the Harvest Watcher was dangerous for a few reasons. First off, it had two times the normal aggro radius of other mobs. You could be running on the road, and if you were just slightly below the Harvest Watcher's level, it would start chasing you down. Now, I don't know for sure, but I think Harvest Watcher had one of the largest aggro radiuses of all low-level mobs in the game. Whether this was due to a bug or something that just machine-type monsters could do, it's not really known. But also, it was a machine-type mob, so it was immune to a lot of things, including most CCs and poisons and bleeds which made it particularly deadly because lots of low-level players had probably never run into a monster who was immune to some of their abilities before. Which goes into probably the third reason why it was one of the most dangerous mobs. And that's because it was in one of the zones that you go to directly after the starting zone, in Westfall. Westfall is the first zone human alliance players would go to, which means they were all pretty low-level, rounds levels 10 to 15. And back in Vanilla WoW, Alliance was the most popular faction by far, and humans were the most popular race to play. It wasn't until the Burning Crusade introduced Blood Elves that the populations kind of evened out, but with the most popular race on the most popular faction going into their first zone with hard monsters, it's no reason why the Harvest Watcher killed so many low-level players especially with its double aggro radius and its immunity to certain abilities. And at number 9 we have the Gadgetson Bruiser, who was the 17th most dangerous mob on Blizzard's list. The Bruisers were the bodyguards for the high-level neutral city Gadgetson, so they attacked both factions. If you attacked someone, if you attacked one of the Bruisers, or if you were just attacked by someone else, the Bruisers would gang up on you and kill you. And since the mobs would root you and swarm, it was really hard to run away from them, so it was basically a guaranteed death. And part of the reason the Gadgetson's Bruisers killed so many people is because for some reason, on PvP servers, a lot of people like to PvP in Tanaris. And Gadgetson specifically. If you were standing around Gadgetson and someone attacked you, then the Bruisers would also kill you and the person who attacked you. So it was really easy to grief people. Also, if you were losing a PvP fight out in Tanaris, you could just run two gadgets on, and then the Bruisers would kill both of you and you get a nice revenge kill. So, the reason Bruisers were so deadly in Vanilla WoW was basically because of world PvP. Number 8, Osirian the Unscarred. Now, this guy is just the final boss in AQ20, and what made him particularly deadly was his ease of access for entering it, since AQ20 was a lot more accessible to the average player than AQ40, and kind of a hiccup with one of its earlier mechanics. Assyrian would really quickly enter Supreme Mode when the fight started, and in order to dispel Supreme Mode, you need to click on one of the crystals in the room. Except you had to find one of the crystals as soon as you pulled him. So if you couldn't find it quick enough, because they spawned in random locations, he would just gain supreme mode and start one-shotting people. Later on they changed the fight so the first crystal spawned immediately in a fixed location, so you didn't have to search the room for the first one anymore. But before this change, he probably got in a lot of cheap kills. Plus, I've heard reports that I couldn't really confirm that clicking the crystals for this boss fight was sometimes kind of buggy and just didn't work. So that could also have led to his higher than average body count. And also the crystals he spawned just kind of spawned in random locations around the room, so you had to run around and look for them. And I'd assume if you were really unlucky, you wouldn't be able to find them that quickly, or his supreme buff would come back and he would just start killing everyone. Number 7, the Succubus Pet. For some reason, the stats tracked the kills of player pets. So Warlock, Succubus, Imp, and Fell Hunters all made spots on the list which is why I skipped the 19th and 20th spot and started the list off with the Harvest Watcher, even though he was 18th, because the Imp and Fell Hunter were 19th and 20th on their list. And I thought it just made more sense to group him up with the Succubus, who was number 13th on that list. 
Now the reason the succubus is more popular of a PvP pet, which is what I assume these stats were tracking, is because the succubus had its charm ability, which did not share a DR with fear. So it allowed warlocks a lot more control with their CC. You could keep someone CC'd for a really long time with just a fear into a charm. Or you could charm someone and then hard cast a really hard hitting soul fire on them. Now while the succubus might have been the most popular of the warlock pets for PvP, the imp and the fell hunter weren't that bad either. Number 6, the Stormpike Bowman and Defender, who came in at number 7th and 8th on Blizzard's list. Now, another big reason I kind of skipped a lot of parts when making this list is because about half of the NPCs on this list are NPCs from Alteric Valley. And by removing half of them, I actually kind of got a top 10 list. This is why it's not a top 20 video. Now, the Bowman and Defender are the only two AV NPCs on this list that are kind of just like normal mobs. They're not super special ones, like I'll talk about in a little bit. But what made the Bowmen and Defender so deadly, mainly the Bowmen, is these were the NPCs who guarded the towers in Alteric Valley. The Defenders were just the ground troops, and the Bowmen were the real dangerous ones. You see, the way the Alliance Towers are designed makes them harder to capture than the Horde Towers. And part of the reason they were harder to capture was because they were more open-ended. And the Stormpike Bowmen were positioned in a way where they could shoot you from the road as you ran up to the tower, and while you're running up the stairs of the tower, and while you were trying to capture the flag for the tower. Whereas on the Horde side, once you got inside the tower and started capturing the flag, if you positioned yourself correctly, the Bowmen couldn't shoot you anymore. So the Alliance ones were just a lot more dangerous than the Horde ones. And that's just part of the Alliance geographical advantage in Alteric Valley. Also, the choke point to get into the Alliance home base is across a bridge. And the bridge has two towers right next to it, both filled with Stormpike Bowmen, who had an absolutely incredibly long range back in the day where they could shoot you from the towers on the bridge about 100 yards away just because they had such an incredibly long attack range. And since this was a really good choke point for the Alliance to keep the Horde out of their base, the Bowmen got a lot of cheap kills in. Whereas the Horde equivalent didn't really have a choke point like this at all. In their home base anyway. Their choke point was at a graveyard that didn't have any Bowmen anywhere near it. Now, the Stormpike Bowmen having such a high spot at number 7 on the list kind of makes sense because they could just snipe people down from the bridge. I was kind of surprised that the Defenders, the melee ground unit, made number 8th on the list. That probably could be because of the Alliance advantages in that battleground. Number 5, the Defias Pillagers. The Defias Pillagers were 5th on Blizzard's list, and the Defias Trappers were number 9 which I'll just group up here since they're both Defias mobs. Although, the Defias pillagers were way more deadly than the trappers. The trappers were also in Westfall and just kind of lower level mobs that were really packed close together. And what made them unique was not only were they packed close together and they could just completely destroy you if you pulled more than once, but they also rooted you, which made them a lot harder to run away from. In addition to this, the Defias Trappers also dropped a rare item called the Large Rope Net. This item, which worked in PvP, would root a target for 10 seconds and could be used on any character that had it. And the Defias Trappers were the easiest mob to farm them from. But the Pillagers were the real threats. And since these were some of the first caster mobs that low-level players ran into, they didn't really have any experience with dealing with the fact that they couldn't just run away from them because they could just fireball them from 40 yards away. Or also the fact that if they accidentally pulled another one, they could just attack him from range. And the Defiance Pillagers were clumped really close together as well. It was really hard to just pull one on their own unless you were just kind of picking them off at the edges of the town where they spawned. And since the Pillagers both hit really hard and were always paired up with other Pillagers close by, and Defias Looters, who had this really great distinction of being a low-level mob that really loved to disarm you, which just made them even more deadly to any class that relied on their weapons. And to add to the fact that they're also humanoid mobs, which means they ran when they were low on health. So they would just pull more looters and pillagers that were packed in close nearby. And like I mentioned with the Harvester earlier on in the list, 
These were all in Westfall, one of the most populated low-level zones because, well, it was the human zone, and humans were the most popular race in Vanilla WoW. All of these factors just kind of combined together to make an amalgamation of one of the most deadly low-level mobs in the game that actually beats out most raid bosses when it comes to player kills. Number 4, the War Masters in Alteric Valley. The War Masters are all going to be clumped up together because they collectively take up number 16th, 12th, 11th, 10th, 6th, and 4th on Blizzard's 20 list. And one of the big reasons I decided to reorder the list to kind of clump them together. And instead, I decided if I was going to clump up these NPCs together, I was just going to take whichever one was highest on the list and use that to place them on my list. So since one of the War Masters made number 4 on the list, they're making it on a high spot on my list as well. Now, the War Masters are just the NPCs who accompany the General in Alteric Valley and hit really hard as well, and either exist or disappear depending on how many towers you control. And because they fought alongside the Generals, they got tons of kills in, which I'll get into a little bit more when I cover the number one spot on this list. Number three, Anixia. Anixia was also number three on Blizzard's list. Now, Anixia is one of the first raid bosses available to players in Vanilla WoW, and also one of the first that is just like the only boss of its raid. In fact, I'm pretty sure Onyxia is the first single boss raid in the game. And because Onyxia was the first single boss raid, the first dragon boss, it was done by pretty much every player who ever raided in Vanilla WoW. And because of this, and the fact that Onyxia was kind of a hard boss fight, it raked up probably the most amount of kills out of any other raid bosses in Vanilla. Maybe, I mean, until we get to number two spot on this list. Number two, Valistraz the Corrupt, who was also number two on Blizzard's list. Valistraz is the second boss in the Blackwing Lair, and is the reason Blizzard made early bosses and raids a little bit easier than all the other bosses in the raid, because Valistraz was also more commonly known as Valistraz the Guildbreaker. Being the second boss in the raid, it was an incredibly hard boss to take down. In fact, one of the hardest bosses in the game, like ever. And because it was the second boss in the raid, it was somewhat easy to get to, which means a lot of people got to see the fight, and tons and tons of people got to die to it. Especially since one of the mechanics of the fight basically just made sure you were going to die no matter what. Valistraz raked up the highest body count of all of the bosses from when this list was made anyway. I think this list that I'm getting all this information from came like somewhere towards the middle of Vanilla WoW or something. So it's not really the most accurate thing in the world. So if you've ever wondered why modern raids have the very sane mechanic of the early bosses being easier than the final bosses, it's because of Valistraz. Before then, all of the bosses in the raid were kind of difficult. Kind of like equally difficult. And it was kind of unreasonable for one of the harder bosses to be at the beginning of the raid. Because then you couldn't really farm the raid for gear in order to down it. And that's why they moved all of the harder bosses towards the end. And number one, Drek'thar, the Horde General in Alteric Valley. Now with half of the NPCs on this list being NPCs from Alteric Valley, it shouldn't come as too much of a surprise as one of the generals was the number one spot. Of course, the Alliance General, Vandar, also did make the list. He was number 15th on Blizzard's list. I just didn't include him because I thought I would just mention him here with Drek'thar, who was number one. Now, the reason Drek'thar was so much more deadly than the Alliance General was because Alteric Valley kind of favored the Alliance a little bit more than it did the Horde. And because the Alliance kind of outnumbered the Horde a little bit when it came to population size, until the Burning Crusade kind of evened it out with the Blood Elves being added. And because both the Battleground favored the Alliance a little bit more than it did the Horde, and because the Alliance had a larger population, they got to make it to the enemy general more often, and therefore die to him a lot more. And since the hardest NPC in Alteric Valley was the enemy general, since that's what you needed to kill in order to win the battleground, 
And in vanilla WoW, there wasn't a reinforcements mechanic, so you could just keep wiping and wiping to the general as much as you wanted. It's no surprise that it raked up the most amount of kills out of all the other NPCs. And it also makes sense why six of the other spots in this list were just the war masters who accompanied their generals, because there was so much killing going on in those general rooms. Whether they be good or bad, these are 10 things that people use as arguments for classic WoW servers. 10 things that are remembered about vanilla WoW. Number 10, only having one spec per class. Are you a warrior who wanted DPS? No, you weren't. You were a tank. You wanted to be a shadow priest? Do you PvP? No, then you're a healer. A holy priest healer, to be exact. No one went full disc. Were you a druid who wanted to do anything in raid? No, you were there to give innervate to the healers. The holy priest healers. Specs weren't really balanced like they are today. You were lucky if one of your specs was raid viable and you were going to like it. Plus, since dual spec wasn't a thing, and changing your spec too much cost too much gold if you did it too often, you kinda had to pick something and just stick to it. Number 9, 40 man raiding. It's hard enough to get 20 competent people together at the same time every week to run mythics. I can't imagine how much of a pain in the ass it was to get 40 people together. But, I bet, it was fun to feel like you were throwing an army of people at the hardest bosses, instead of just the elite task force thing we've got going on today with half as many people. Number 8, Class Quests. At level 10, hunters had to go out and tame three different pets before being able to tame a real one for themselves. Warlocks had to do lengthy quest chains to summon their demons, then defeat them before they got to use them. Shamans had to run halfway across the world to get their totems. Rogues had to level up two class-specific professions to make their own poisons, or to pick locks. The list goes on and on. Pretty much all classes had quests that needed to be completed in order to get basic abilities. And you could be severely gimped if you ignored them and just leveled up normally, since some of your core class abilities came from these quests. Nowadays, you just get all your abilities automatically as you level up. There are still some class-specific quests in order to get special armor and weapons, but they're optional, so most people never do them, or even know that they exist. The closest thing we have to class quests in Legion is the artifact quest lines, which are actually pretty faithful to old-school class quests, as they have you use all of your abilities in creative ways to solve problems. Number 7. Grinding. Everything was a grind. Quest items routinely had low drop rates, there wasn't enough quests to get to max level, so you had to grind mobs for those last few levels. You would miss all the time with new weapons, so you had to go out and grind out weapon skills to use them. No daily quest meant you had to grind any and all gold you got since there was no way to earn it passively. Many raid fights required you to have resist gear that you had to grind. Many attunements required random items from dungeons that only dropped from one player, so lots of dungeon grinding. There was also lots of attunements to do pretty much all of the raids, which all required a huge grind. Getting high warlord in PvP meant full-time job levels of grinding PvP all day, every day. And many, many more grinds. Nothing we have in Legion is close to the grinding that went on back then. Unless... You're a mythic raider, part of a world first pushing guild trying to grind out as much artifact power as possible, and even then it's not really comparable to some of the vanilla grinds. Number 6. No catch up mechanics. Start late in vanilla and want to raid the new Naxxramas raid? Well you better run AQ40 first. But in order to run AQ40, you're going to need gear from at least Blackwing Lair. But, if you want to do Blackwing Layer, you need a cloak made from Anixia Scales, and at least gear from Molten Core. But, if you want to do Molten Core or Onyxia, you need gear from Upper Blackrock Spire, Stratholme, and other high-level dungeons to at least get your Tier 1 set, plus Fire Resistance gear. And don't forget all the attunements required to do all of those places. There's a reason Blizzard remade Nax for Wrath. Almost no one got to do the original one. 
Today, if you want to start raiding in the newest raid, there are so many different ways to get gear good enough to start doing normal mode, it's not even worth listing them here. If you have an alt that you casually play on, you probably have gear good enough to start at least running the normal mode of the current raid here, and then just work your way on up from there. Number 5. Carrying around stacks of food while questing. Today, leveling has been made so easy that Blizzard is actually looking at ways to make it less brain dead, without reverting it back to how it used to be. But in vanilla WoW, mobs hit hard, mana pools were low, and default regen was garbage. Some classes had some kind of regen mechanic tied to getting killing blows on mobs to kind of lessen the effect, but no matter what class you played, you needed to have food on you at all times. After killing maybe 5 to 10 mobs, your health or mana would need to be replenished, and you could be lazy and just auto attack, but eventually you were going to have to eat and drink. Mages were actually extremely helpful for other players for their ability to create food and water and trade it to people. Today, the only people who need to eat or drink are healers in mythic dungeons to get mana back in between pools, and raiders for the buffs they provide only and not the actual mechanic that eating provides. Food items while leveling are just kind of an optional thing that might sometimes give you a buff if you get a special food item from a quest. And until pretty recently, you still started off with food in your bags when you made new characters. But that's no longer the case. Every class has some kind of self-heal or bubble now, and you don't run out of mana at low levels anymore unless you're specifically trying to. Number 4. Codexes. Believe it or not, some class abilities couldn't be learned from your class trainer, or from class quests. You needed to get special items called codexes, which dropped mostly from raid bosses in order to learn basic class abilities. Like hunters, for example, got their trank shot ability from a codex, which was one of the few ways to purge rage effects back in the day. And most other classes could only learn the highest spell rank of certain abilities from codexes. It was a fun RPG element of the game that sometimes you would get stronger or learn new abilities by killing bosses. Today, they're not really a thing anymore, but there are various items that give cosmetic abilities, like the different animal mage polymorphs, or the pet training manual that teaches your pet to loot corpses for you. So it's kind of similar, but you no longer learn core abilities from items that drop in raids, like the codexes from vanilla. Number 3. Hunter Pets Today, hunter pets are more of a cosmetic than they are anything else. But it used to be that pets had special abilities and stats depending on which beast you tamed. For example, gorillas were the only pet who actually have an AoE. So getting to a high enough level to actually tame one was a special event. Lots of different pets had special hidden abilities as well like a certain rare cat having a less than one second attack speed, which made him attack faster than all other pets, or how wolves from AV could run faster than mounts. It was a treat to go out and hunt rare beasts to use their hidden abilities, or to just go out and get a new special ability to use on a normal pet. But players just had to ruin it. Eventually, everyone found out which pets were the best pets, and everyone was running around with exactly the same pets. I remember in Wrath of the Lich King when I first started raiding, the best pet was a wolf. So all hunters only had wolves. Or maybe cats if they didn't mind a slight DPS decrease, as that was the second highest DPS pet. So Blizzard over the many expansions kept trying to streamline pets so that players could have more choice with them, until finally they just got rid of nearly all special abilities and just made the good ones baseline that everyone could use. Now, there are still pets with special abilities, don't get me wrong. Turtles can shell shield to act like a personal tank, core hounds can bloodlust, moths can battle res, but it's a complete shell of its former self from when all pets had special abilities. Number 2. The Community Did you know people used to actually know each other on their respective servers? So many things you did in-game required a group of people, and you couldn't always rely on your guild to run everything, so you had to pug things. And with there being no auto-group finders, people had to actually talk to each other and play nice. You would develop a rep on your server for being good at what you did, or bad. 
being known can go both ways. You'd recognize people in trade chat, or notice people were running by them in major cities, forcing people to interact with each other in order to do everything made the game's in-game community seem bigger. Today, you mainly just talk to your guild, and rarely other people unless you absolutely need to. Running random dungeons are pretty much quiet. It's very common to get in a group with four other people and not say a word to them over the course of a 30 minute run. If you go out and do world quests and use the add-on to search for groups, like I do, to make them quicker, I can't remember one person saying a thing in over a hundred world quests. In fact, I can't remember anyone ever saying anything in a world quest group, despite doing hundreds of them like I've said. I personally love this. I'm totally antisocial and I hated having to look for groups to gear up and raid. The Dungeon Finder was my favorite addition to the game, but being forced to talk to people to do everything is a thing that's remembered about Vanilla WoW and one of the cornerstone arguments for people wanting classic servers. I can understand this argument, even if I personally don't really care for it. And number one, talent trees. Old school talent trees, where you had a set amount of points to spend on things you thought were fun. I personally loved old school talents. You got a new one every time you leveled up, which made new levels a lot of fun because you knew you just got a little bit stronger in a tangible sense and could feel like you were progressing to something bigger. Sometimes reaching a new talented ability could double your damage output since a lot of the core abilities were buried deep in a specs tree. Nowadays, you get a ton of your core spells early on so that you can actually get used to doing what you'll be doing at max level. It makes more sense this way and I do like it, but a part of me also really like the old method better. The talent trees of today do also sometimes give you big boost to your abilities when you get a new row unlocked, but it's just not the same as slowly working your way up to it over time, since you just get it all at once every 15 levels or so. Hell, the last time I had fun leveling a new character was with my demon hunter, and that was because you got a new talent every two levels instead of every 15. It almost felt like having old talent points again. The artifact weapon design was really close to recapturing that magic. I did like getting new traits on the weapon while leveling up for the first time in Legion, but the fact that you just get everything eventually kinda kills some of the fun of it. To the point where I kind of like how the Netherlight Crucible forces you to pick an ability over another. That element of choice is fun for me, and made me want to farm artifact power for the first time ever in the expansion just to unlock all of the choices. In today's video we're going to go over the best race and class combinations in Vanilla WoW, and what class maximizes their race's potential as much as possible. Starting off with the Alliance and working our way down. Keep in mind, Druid is not going to be in this video, as only one race on both the Horde and Alliance can be them. And this video is being made with both PvE and PvP comparisons, and we'll be discussing both as much as possible. Starting off with everyone's favorite pet tamer, the Hunter. When taking a look at all of the playable races that could even be a Hunter on Alliance, you had Dwarves and Night Elves. And while neither of these races had good active racials for PvE, few races did. However, the racials were very good for PvP like the Dwarves' stone form because of how it removed all poisons, bleeds, and diseases. But more importantly, allowed the Dwarf to break out of a rogue's blind, with Night Elves having their Shadow Mail to go invisible, and with both of them having their own resistances as well. However, the Dwarves being arguably better here, as Frost Mages were very popular during this time, and being able to potentially resist a Frost Bolt could mean victory. But Night Elves also being able to resist nature damage could make them stronger against things like Shaman's Earth Shock, Lightning Bolt, or a Druid's Thorns, or Wrath, for example. For the PvP side of things, they were both equally strong, with Dwarves pulling through just a tiny bit more in this regard. For PvE content, the difference between these two races is very minor, and in an unstated passive effect with Night Elves, they have the highest base agility in the game because they start off with an extra 9 points of agility for a total of 22 agility while Dwarves only had 16. Though Dwarves did start off with gun specialization. While Hunters rarely had guns as their BIS weapon, this does mean you could get more use out of those weapons, allowing you to gain more benefit from the items usually ignored by other Hunters. 
and the Night Elf Agility Bonus squeezes out just that much more with its very tiny damage increase no matter what ranged weapon they had. Even still, both of these races are very close to each other, and you're better off playing whichever you like the most. If you want to be ridiculously good looking though, you might want to be a dwarf. Next up we have the mage. Gnomes are the way to go for this class. Humans did not offer up much in the ways of the mage, and this is because it was just sword and mace specializations, which the mage didn't need. Their perception practically had no use in PvE, and although it was rather good in PvP, to prevent rogues and feral druids from getting the jump on you, which is a big threat to them. And while the human spirit increased their spirit by 5%, this only gave them a tiny boost to mana generation, but it still had, you know, minor uses in PvP and PvE. Mainly to increase the time before they had to sit and drink from blizzard farming, or give them some amount of mana back between fights and battlegrounds. Also of note, because of diplomacy granting 10% more reputation, if getting to max rep faster to unlock powerful items is more important to you, like say in a season of mastery, this is the go-to choice. Although, this is more for people who are limited on time. So for any class that can be human, if time is important to you, this is the go-to race. The Gnome Mages being far better for PvE and PvP content because Expansive Mind increases their intellect by 5%, which not only boosted their total mana, but also buffed their spell crit chance. Escape Artist is an amazing ability to have access to in PvP, allowing them to escape from effects like Entangling Roots or Improved Hamstring. And the engineering specialization was also great to have, since engineering is the best profession for mages to have. Now we have the Paladin. Paladin Vanilla wasn't the best class, but if for some reason you wanted to play this, then you have two races to choose from, being a dwarf or a human. So which of the two is better? Well, your best bet is choosing a human. And why is that? See, humans are significantly better for PvE due to their extra weapon skills, thanks to mace and sword specialization. Especially since there are plenty of amazing endgame swords like the Corrupted Ashbringer, and a hammers like Sulphurus, Hand of Ragnaros. Higher weapon skills as a melee spec meant a lower chance to miss your attacks, have a glance, or be dodged. Diplomacy played a bigger part for Paladins, because some of their best in slot gear required reputation checks, and allows them to get some of those BIS slots sooner than dwarves normally could. Dwarves, however, are better for PvP because of their stone form and frost resistance but provided very little in regards to PvE content, outside of a few minor exceptions, like fighting Safarion and Naxxramas, as he required frost resistance. But that one fight still made humans reign king because of their overall combat prowess, and frost resist gear could be obtained by every class, making humans once again the best choice for melee classes. If you're looking to heal as a paladin, the humans are better than dwarves due to their increase of spirit as well, meaning the human is the overall superior choice for paladins for both damage and healing if you decide to play this class. For our main healers in vanilla, Priest is a tough decision. The three races that could be a Priest are humans, dwarves, and night elves, and all three had their own very strong racials. So which is better? Well, this is between the humans and dwarves, as the night elves having Shadow Meld offered nothing in comparison to what humans and dwarves did. While each of these races had one different Priest racial, Feedback for humans and Fear Ward for dwarves, both of them having Desperate Prayer, a large instant cast self-heal. So, between these two, this is very difficult one to say, as they both had equal levels of worth in many different situations. Humans, having the increased 5% spirit stat, helped both their mana regeneration and your healing, as this stacked well with the spiritual guidance talent, which increased your spell damage and healing based on your total spirit, as well as the meditation talent, which lets you regen mana in combat. These three passives made this stat very important, especially for long fights along with humans just having good overall stats, which made them great for really any class. And while feedback was strong, it required a niche opponent. So when you did get use of it, it was good, but that was rare. Dwarves, however, have Fear Ward, which allows them to place a buff on a teammate that will prevent the next fear effect on them and consume the ward in the process. This is an extremely useful spell in PvE, this being an alliance defining mechanic even, leading to alliance being by far the best raiding faction in vanilla as this ability alone made many difficult fights far easier. And since dwarves are better than humans in PvP during this time, allowing them to use their stone form ability, they could use stone form to break out of a rogue's blind and then use their desperate prior to heal themselves, and doing this could mean the difference between life and death. So, which is better for what activity? Well, if you're just looking for raw healing potential, PvE-wise, human is better. 
but for actual PvE, Fear Ward is just way too good to pass up, as many bosses love to cast Fear, and a quick way to wipe is for a tank to get Fear. So, it's common to have Fear Ward up 100% of the time in the main tank, using multiple dwarves. And when it comes to PvP, dwarves and humans come neck and neck, with dwarves having good abilities to counter direct attacks, with humans having better healing and stealth detection. Rogues, for the class that people play, they hate themselves. The rogue is unique as every race and alliance can play one. So, out of dwarves, gnomes, humans, and night elves, which is the best? For PvE content, humans without a doubt. Humans, once again, reign due to their mace and sword specialization. Which, as mentioned earlier in the video, a higher weapon skill means a lower chance to miss, get a glancing blow, and lower chance to have your attacks be dodged. Which, for a rogue, can increase their damage by a pretty significant amount. But what about PvP, you ask? Well, out of the races, the best one for PvP combat is gnomes. Although dwarves still have a fair bit of use, gnomes because of their escape artist ability. And since the best way to control rogue is just to use those effects, a gnome rogue can skip getting improved sprint in their talent trees, as this is basically a better version of it, and allows them to spec further into damaging ones instead, like Cold Blood, for example, making them the kings of PvP. Dwarves still, of course, have their stone form, allow them to remove various dots that may normally prevent them from casting Vanish. Now, this isn't to say that picking a dwarf or a night elf is basically bad or anything, as you can absolutely play them if you wish to, but for a rogue specifically, you are losing out in damage by picking the other two races, and losing out on utility by picking them as well. And before we move on, if you want to farm gold using your rogue, the dwarf is a good option because of their ability to see treasures on the minimap, and paired with the rogue's ability to stealth and lockpick, this makes them a rather good gold maker. For the edgy players who want to summon demons and such, we have the warlock. Now, humans and gnomes can both be warlocks, although to no one's surprise, gnomes are vastly superior casters than humans in this case as well, just like with the mages. As you guessed, because of the expansive mind racial. Intellect is a very important stat to warlocks, maybe even more so than for mages, as the mix of increased spell crit and mana pool is far more important to a class that relies on lots of spell crit, and also constantly consuming their HP to fill their mana. Another fact being that while warlocks are strong defensively compared to mages, they do not have the same means of escape like blink, freezes, or ice blocks, meaning in PvP they are rather easy to lock down with a rogue or warrior. Escape Artist comes in handy as an amazing counter to this. And lastly, engineering specialization is very good, as engineering is the best profession in the game for combat bonuses, especially DPS. And while for mages, humans are only a bit worse than mages, for warlocks, they are far worse. Demonic Embrace, a talent in the very first row of demonology tree, more than almost every single warlock spec takes. It decreases your spirit by 5% and increases your stamina by 15%. Do I need to say more? A class that willingly reduces its spirit by 5%, playing a race that has a racial that increases their spirit by 5%. Spirit is by far the lowest stat for warlocks, at least until Wrath of the Lich King, and I have a whole video on that if you're interested. For the warrior players out there, humans are the way to go, but all the other races can be what you're looking for. However, the reason humans rule PvE is because of their weapon specialization racials, as hitting with attacks is very important, but far more important for tanks especially as warriors are the go-to tank. They need to be able to hit, both to generate aggro and, of course, to deal damage, both tanking and DPS. For PvP, however, gnomes and dwarves are strong competitors, with gnomes pulling ahead just that much more, since gnomes are able to remove movement impairing effects and stay within melee range to do damage far more often. As well as being just smaller to hit, which, believe it or not, is actually a very slight advantage in PvP. Dwarves having stone form, though, can provide them with extra armor, making them even more difficult to kill, even as a tank. But its main use is definitely around removing dots instead, which does make them decent flag carriers. However, with no real use for PvP, outside of maybe some niche situations, or acting as a tank, as long as you make up for the missing expertise. With Night Elves literally offering little to nothing for warriors, except maybe the memes of a stealth warrior in PvP. Now onto the Horde faction. Starting with the Hunter. With Orc, Torrent, and Troll being available to Hunters, all three of these races are solid choices, and bring their own unique utility to both PvE and PvP, with Trolls being the best in PvE and Orcs the better in PvP. In PvE content, Trolls with their Berserking cause them to attack much faster, 
and gave a significant more amount of damage output than any other hunter race in the game, with trolls also having the second highest base agility for hunters. And with the Beast Slayer passive combined with their attack speed, make them pump out good consistent damage, with the 5% more damage to beasts not only useful while leveling, but also had multiple uses in raid, with one major use in Molten Core on fights like Magmadar. But for PvP content, orcs are by far the best race for PvP regarding hunters, and almost overall, because of their hardiness ratio. See, hardiness made them have a chance to resist all stun effects by 25%. Each race in the game has a baseline chance to resist stuns by 5%, and this stacked with the orcs racial, which allowed orcs to have a massive 30% chance to resist every stun of the game, which is incredibly powerful for PvP. It was so good, in fact, it got nerfed constantly in following expansions, to now, in retail, it just reduces the durations of stun slightly, rather than giving you a chance to negate the whole stun without resist. They also have Command, which is both a great damage boost to PvP and PvE content for your pet, but is kind of held back by the horrible pet AI, which is, funny enough, in some ways, a benefit in PvP. With Torrens not having any racials that make them a good choice for PvE hunters, they do have very decent ones for PvP with War Stomp, which can be useful to get a melee character off you for a second and hopefully get a heal, or allow you to feign death and then use Freezing Trap, as you couldn't use traps during combat yet. Their Endurance and Nature Resistance racials were good, but seen as health gain from Endurance is very small and not too noticeable, and Nature Resistance having very small uses, since Shamans are the class with the most meaningful nature damage and they're on Horde, and fighting a Shaman as a Horde member only happened in duels and not regular battlegrounds, but did help ever so slightly against druids in some of their attacks. Now, with the Horde version of Mage, trolls and undead are able to be mages. Luckily, deciding what's best here is very easy, as trolls are once again the best for PvE, but undead are better for PvP. For the same reason trolls are the best for hunters in PvE combat, their racial berserking is just simply too good to pass up especially as a spellcaster because being able to cast faster is just a pure DPS increase. Along with their beast slain passive, helping mage is the same as hunters, while none of the other racials benefited the mage for the most part. Except maybe regeneration just a tiny bit because of the passive health regeneration. For PvP combat, however, undead characters are broken due to their will of forsaken racial, as it allowed them to break free of all charm, fear, and sleep effects while it was active and lasted for 5 seconds. So, compared to a regular insignia of the horde, which has a 5 minute cooldown, and Will the Forsaken having a 2 minute cooldown, it was a better PvP trinket. That you could also use alongside the PvP trinket, as these two things didn't share a cooldown in vanilla, allowing the undead to basically get out of everything whenever it happened. The other racials, Cannibal Eyes, could have niche use in PvP, if a 1v1 had happened and you can get a quick resource gain, or just use it to BM a player, which is how it was mostly used for PvP anyways. Their Shadow Resistance could also have use in PvP, seeing as Shadow Magic was also very popular to use. And the Resistance could help that much more against the Warlock's Dots. And since Warlocks are very popular during this time, this could come in handy more than once. Once again, the only two races that can be Priests on Horde are Trolls and Undead. And both of their special Priest abilities are Hex of Weakness and Shadow Guard for Trolls, and Devouring Plague and Touch of Weakness for Undead, as Priests had their extra racials, remember. Hex of Weakness weakened the enemy it was used on, which reduced their damage for 2 minutes. This is actually pretty useful to just throw in a dungeon boss or even other players in PvP. Shadow Guard surrounded the user in Shadow Orbs that did a tiny bit of damage to anyone that hit them. It had 3 charges and lasted for 10 minutes. This is very similar to a Shaman's Lightning Shield and is actually kind of basically the same thing. Undead's Touch of Weakness is just a straight up better version of the Troll's ability, Hex of Weakness. Not only does it reduce their damage for the same duration, but it costs less mana to use, and makes them take a tiny amount of shadow damage when they use their next attack. However, what makes this ability nearly useless is the fact it requires the priest melee attack the enemy to activate it, while the troll version could simply be casted at range. Devouring Plague gave Undead Priest an instant ability that applied a decently damaging 24 second dot on a 3 minute cooldown, while also healing the caster for the damage dealt, and because of the significant mana cost, made it only really useful to Shadow Priests. So, which one's better? Well, Undead does have the highest base spirit in the game, which does help with their mana regeneration, as well as the aforementioned talents that increase healing based on your spirit, let you regen mana in combat, and of course, since mana regeneration is a pain to deal with, it does make a tiny difference. But for PvE and PvP healing content, trolls still pull ahead because of the Berserk and Racial. 
It's quite undersaid that Berserking making you cast that much faster is such a difference for casters, especially as being able to cast spells healing or damage 10-30% to faster is just dumb strong. But for PvP, Undead are a bit more powerful because of their defensive abilities. However, when it comes to Shadow Priests for PvP and PvE, Undead are well above Trolls. And while in original WoW Classic they would be shunned in any raid, in Season of Mastery with no debuff cap, it is very likely we will see some Shadow Priests in raids. This might be the only time in history that it's considered for vanilla era high-end PvE. And thus, Devouring Plague might actually play a factor. Now for Rogues and Horde, you have Orc, Undead, and Trolls available to you. Now this one is actually quite hard to label as the best, because all of these races are very, very strong, when put against each other to the point of almost being equal, with an Orc's a hardiness passive, having a 30% chance to resist every stun of the game, being really good, which in case you forgot, each race has a baseline 5% chance to resist a stun, and it stacks with the racial. An Orc's Blood Fury scales with the gear that the Rogue has, and just gets better and better the more gear the Rogue gets making this one of the best cooldowns in the game for a melee character. With Trolls having Berserk units, also a very strong melee ability since it makes them attack that much faster. Beast Lane plays a minor part in raids later on, Regeneration can help them but it's very minor, and both Specialization with Throwing Specialization don't really make a difference since they're a melee character. Undead on the other hand still have Will the Forsaken, and since that's basically a trinket it allows them to replace their Insignia of the Horde with another trinket instead for more PvP power. Cannibalize can help them get some resource back and then re-stealth after, and save them a bandage. Shadow Resistance can possibly have a part to play in PvP since Rogue vs Warlock is quite common, and being able to resist Shadow Magic can be strong. All three of these races are so close that there really isn't a best to play, as an Orc's Hardiness might proc quite a lot and make them better than a Rogue's Will of Forsaken. And with their Blood Fury, this could make you unstoppable. Trolls and their Berserking makes them pretty close to Orcs in PvE content, and Undead having Will of the Forsaken makes them very strong for PvP. But an Orc's Hardiness having a 30% chance to proc all stuns might pay off more often than having a single use with a small after effect. For both PvP and PvE, I think it's fair to say all three of these races are so close, it's basically equal in power. For players who want to use the power of Water and Earth to heal and damage, we have the Shaman. This class is Horde exclusive and Orcs, Trolls, and Tauren can all be one. And well, the reason why Trolls are the best PvE spellcasters also applies here as well with their Berserking, while all the other racials that Trolls got don't really offer anything worthwhile. For PvP, Orcs are simply the best because of hardiness, and being a healer or damage caster, potentially being able to fully ignore a stun effect is huge. Tauren lacks anything that's worth it for both PvP and PvE. Even with their Endurance Racial, it only increases their health by 500 points, which isn't that much. The Horde Warlock is playable by both Orcs and Undead, with both of them bringing their own Situational Racials to the group. For Warlocks on the Horde side, they gain an advantage by playing Horde because of the benefits that the Shamans provide. Shamans give Mana Spring Totem, Tranquil Air Totem, and Mana Tide Totem, assuming the Shaman has it. This isn't as common for PvE, however, because Totems are stuck to only giving the benefits to the members of the group where the Shaman is. This means that if there aren't enough shamans in the raid, they will be focusing on buffing the melee group instead of the casters, since Wind Fury provides that much more to the melee. This also means that Warlocks will gain threat far faster than they otherwise would and have to stop doing some damage to let them drop threat. With that being said, looking at the races, when it comes to Orc Warlocks, they don't really have any notable racials for Warlocks in PvE content. The only thing Orcs have that makes just a tiny difference is their command racial. But this is dependent on what build you're running, as Warlocks have four good ones to play with, with various types of plays. Warlocks may be having the largest variety of builds available compared to other classes. Their Affliction Tree focusing on Shadow Damage, their Demonology focusing on either sacrificing a demon to gain one buff, or having one summoned to gain another for the pet and Warlock, and Destruction to increase crit damage, and the possibility to increase fire damage, leading to working with the Succubus summon to increase all damage dealt by 10%, or sacrifice to increase only shadow damage by 15%, the imp summon to reduce threat caused by 20%, and give health bonus to your party, or sacrifice to increase your fire damage by 15%. So, depending on which combo of the two trees you take, you can get a very separate combo. So of course, some of the builds would gain a good benefit from this, while others would not. Whereas with Undead Warlocks, the racial obviously doesn't provide any damage buffs to pets, but as you may have guessed it, the Will of Forsaken is very strong, as there are quite a few bosses vanilla that use AoE Fears throughout the fight. 
Now when this does happen, it lets the Undead Warlock use their Will the Forsaken and skip the mechanic and keep doing damage, while their Orc counterparts might be stuck dealing with the mechanic instead. With the faster these mechanics are dealt with and the bosses get killed, the more value is added to Will of Forsaken and increase into Undead Warlock's overall damage output. And with the Undead's Shadow Resistance Racial, it only plays a tiny part in PvE combat, but does help just that much more in some raids, like when a Warlock has to tank Emperor Vecklor in Encourage. Speaking overall, Undead Warlocks are just a tiny bit better, seeing as sacrificing your pet is more favorable and a common build to play with, along with being able to skip fear mechanics and doing more damage. Now this isn't to say Orc Warlocks are bad, because they aren't by any means, it's just Undead Warlocks having that tiny advantage over Orcs, more consistently speaking, as if you're not playing with a pet, then Orcs offer absolutely nothing with the racials. Although, another benefit that Undead have over Orcs specifically for Warlocks only, is Warlocks are the only class who can change health into mana, allowing the Undead after combat to spam Life Tap till they're almost dead, and then consume a nearby body in order to fill some of their health bar back. But since Vanilla's Cannibalize doesn't actually heal for very much, only 35% of your maximum health, even this is only a situational benefit. And finally, we have the Horde Warriors. As with Alliance, every race on Horde can play a warrior. Horde Warriors have quite a big benefit of being able to raid with Shamans as well, which allows them access to Wind Fury Totem, which gives them a chance to swing in extra time for more damage. And this allows Warriors to use Hamstring to trigger their auto attacks to proc Wind Fury for even more damage. With all of the races being so close to one another, which one is the best? Well, for a DPS warrior that wants to PvE, this goes to Orcs. This is because Blood Fury grants melee DPS so much power, and even though their axe specialization doesn't matter endgame, as most of the best in slot items are swords, this does play a small part while leveling up. However, for a warrior who wants to be a tank, the trolls are actually better. This is because the Berserkin Ratio allows them to use Heroic Strike two more times in their opening rotation, which not only helps them keep aggro, but it gives them quite a big damage boost. For PvP, Orcs are still a top tier pick because of just how strong hardiness really is. Torrin are also a decent pick behind Orcs because Blizzard gave Torrin's melee range a tiny bit more range, along with it increased hitbox size, and their War Stomp gives them just that much more crowd control, which could allow the warrior to retaliate and potentially kill the person attacking them. The Undead having Will the Forsaken is powerful as expected, but other than that, they don't offer much PvP-wise for warriors, and it can be argued that the Orcs having the consistency of hardiness especially in PvP situations, just makes them the overall better choice for PvP. Although in PvE, having access to Will of Forsaken as a tank can be useful in the same way as Fear Ward is for Alliance, so it is sometimes picked up for that. Now, it goes without saying that this is looking at all the classes and seeing what race fits them as a hardcore perspective. The differences between the races is noticeable and can give you an advantage, but should you choose what race you want to purely on aesthetics alone, and not necessarily what is overall the best, then you won't really be hampered by any race class combo. Back in the day, in order to learn how to smelt enchanted elementium, an item needed to craft a legendary, you needed a priest to mind control a mini boss in Blackwing Lair to teach it to you. Nowadays, you can just kill the mini boss and he'll drop a recipe to learn it. It's totally understandable and why they would change it, but needing a priest to mind control something to teach you a skill just seems like such a neat idea. In practice, it was probably a huge pain in the ass, though. Rogues used to have to craft their own poisons by visiting labs spread across the world, kind of like going to more advanced places to create more advanced poisons. Again, neat as an idea, but in practice was probably just another pain in the ass. Rogues also had to level their skill in lockpicking by actually lockpicking things, and had to go out into the world and open and reopen footlockers spread across different zones and hidden places. Rogues were the only class with two extra professions that they needed to level up. Now that I think about it, I don't think any other class really has their own class professions, besides the Death Knights. Hunter Pets used to be a lot more high maintenance. They had happiness bars and loyalty points. You had to make sure to feed your pet appropriate food for their diet to keep their happiness high. If their happiness dropped too low, your pet could actually run away. And this could happen mid-fight as well. In order to summon a Doom Guard, Warlocks had to perform the Ritual of Doom, which required four other people to help you out. Once the ritual was complete, one of the four helpers would die instantly, and you had to capture the Doom Guard since it wasn't a friendly guardian right off the bat. The Death Knight's Battle Res used to bring people back to life as ghouls, with their own special ghoul action bars instead of their normal class abilities. The action bar was very similar to what an unholy Death Knight's pet did at the time, and wasn't half bad. 
You wouldn't do as much damage as if you had not died in a raid fight, but some damage as a ghoul was better than no damage. This was also back when there was no battle res limits in raid fights. If you had a battle res available, you could use it. Weapons required you to see a weapon trainer to learn how to use them. Then you had to level up the skill in the weapons by attacking random mobs for hours on end with the lowest level weapon you could find. Since having zero skills in the weapon meant you were going to miss a lot if you tried using it. Speaking of trainers, you used to actually have to go to your class trainer to learn new spells and skill ranks to make your ability stronger. Now all that happens automatically while you level up, and spell ranks aren't even a thing anymore. There's not even really a reason to see your trainer anymore with the changes to how specializations work. Class trainers are slowly losing all significance. All the way until Cataclysm, Nature, Fire, Frost, and other resistance gear was still used in boss fights. In vanilla, it was really important to sacrifice a few pieces of gear to throw on some of your resistance gear, like Nature Resistance for Princess Huharan, or Frost Resistance for Saffron, and some mobs were straight up immune to certain types of damage, like Fire Elementals were immune to fire, machines were immune to poisons, etc. They really toned it down every expansion though, with the Wrath of the Lich King only really requiring tanks to use resistances and only for certain fights, like Frost Resistance Gear for Syndragosa. And in Cataclysm, it became even more of a niche, with really only top raid guilds farming the trinket from Tolbarad to reduce the nature damage of Nefarian's Crackle ability. Resistances and lore specific magic counters are all but gone now. Mana and health used to regenerate outside of combat at a snail's pace when compared to day at lower levels. Having food and drinks on you at all time was almost necessary since it could take an unreasonable amount of time to get all your health and mana back after killing a few mobs. The idea behind slow mana regen could be from D&D's spellcasting mechanic, in which you could only cast a handful of spells a day before you had to take a long rest to get your spell slots back. WoW does borrow heavily from fantasy tropes, especially Dungeons & Dragons. Each class had unique quests to unlock certain things, like Warlock and Paladin mounts, Hunters being able to tame pets, Stances for Warriors, Totems for Shamans, etc. Now you just learn them as you level up baseline. But the artifact quests in Legion are very similar to how class quests used to work, so they're making somewhat of a return in that you need to use your specific class abilities in order to complete some of the objectives, but not in the way that they reward class-specific abilities, just a class-specific weapon. Each class used to have an extra equipment slot. Druids, Shamans, Paladins, and Death Knights had a special item specific to their class. Casters had wands, and Hunters, Rogues, and Warriors had ranged weapons. In order to create a basic campfire, you needed the item Simple Wood and Flint. Lots of class spells required items to use as well, like mages needed a light feather to cast slow fall, and shamans needed fish oil to use water walking. In order to learn the max rank of certain spells, that is, the most powerful form of some of your baseline abilities, you needed a codex. Some classes could only learn certain spells from these codexes, like how hunters could only learn trink shot from a codex, or mages different types of polymorphs. These codexes could be sold, so you could just pick them up on the auction house rather than having to actually go out to dungeons and raids to get them yourself. It used to be you needed a fishing pole equipped to fish, a knife in your bags to skin, and a mining pick to mine. Now, not so much. Hunter Pants used to have special abilities based on which mob you tank. For example, Broken Tooth had a 1.0 attack speed, the fastest of all pets and faster than most rogues could attack. Opposite that you had Bears that had a 2.5 attack speed. Frost Wolves in Alteric Valley ran at 255% speed and could catch up to players on epic ground mounts. And Lupus the Wolf attacked with shadow damage instead of physical damage. In PvE, this usually lowered his DPS, but in PvP it meant his attacks went right through armor. And many others, including certain pets having higher magical resistances than others, and pets with mana bars hitting for less than standard pets since they had caster stats. Some professions had sub-specializations. Blacksmith could specialize in Weaponsmith or Armorsmith. Alchemist could be Transmute Potion or Flask Masters, which has the baseline ability to proc extra items when you create items normally of the type you specialize in. And Engineers could focus on Goblin or Gnome recipes. Most of these specializations are still in the game, but Blizzard hasn't given them any kind of significant support since the Burning Crusade, other than a few token gestures. Alchemy specializations just straight up don't work for Warlord or Draenor recipes anymore but still proc extra potions, flasks, and transmute for expansions before WAD. 
Blacksmith and engineers could make skeleton keys and small bombs to open lockboxes or doors. They're still in the game, only Blizzard stopped supporting them in Cataclysm, so engineers and blacksmith can unlock chests and doors up to Cataclysm content. But like profession specializations, they just stopped supporting them. In order to unlock max level lockboxes, you need a rogue. While on the note of unlocking doors, key bags used to be a thing. Sometimes you get keys from quests or mobs and they'd go in their own special little bag right next to your normal bags. Blacksmith skeleton keys could also be put in the key bag, but not the engineer's blast charges. Flight paths used to only take you to the very next flight path. Want to fly across the whole world while AFKing? Well, too bad, because you're going to have to make sure you take the next flight path to the next zone every 30 seconds. There used to be a couple of location-specific requirements for professions. Alchemists used to require alchemist labs to create certain flasks, and you used to have to be next to a lexicon of power to change out glyphs. Although, some location-specific things are still in the game, like how you can only smelt dark iron ore at the Black Forge and Black Rock Depths. In this video, we'll go over 10 things that existed in Vanilla WoW, but were made better later on in WoW's history. At number 10, we have the Stealth Mechanic. Stealth in Vanilla WoW reduced your movement speed by 50%, and there is a high chance mobs can detect you, even if you're like 10 or 15 yards away. Unless you took talents with major stealth better, or wore pieces of gear or had racials that could increase it. Rogues had a talent called Master of Deception, with 5 ranks, each one making your stealth better, by reducing the chance enemies have to detect you while you're stealth. And this was considered a good talent, because of how bad the baseline stealth was. With higher ranks of stealth, druids and rogues could go a little bit faster than 50%, but you could never go the full 100% run speed with their classes, specs, and talents you were always just moving slower than normal. Then later on in WoW's history, they removed the slow penalty to stealth and gave stealth max ranks of Master of Deception-like talents by default, so you can sneak right past a mob in stealth of similar level to you, and as long as you don't touch them, they won't notice you, which is amazing compared to the vanilla WoW stealth, and also a pretty minor thing on a whole, and that's why it's only the number 10 spot. Number 9, Gathering Times. Gathering herbs could take about a 5 second cast time, and it had a chance to fail. Gathering ore didn't take as long of a cast time, but you had to do it multiple times on the same node of ore, which also had a chance to fail. Gathering materials out in the open world to complete quests also had really long cast times, and could take up to 5 seconds on average per item. Whereas today, if you have the enchant on your gloves, you can gather herbs in half a second. Same with mining or skinning. Gathering items out in the open world never takes more than 2 seconds, unless it's for special items that has a long cast time for RP purposes. Number 8, Tracking. Did you know, if you had the ability to track herbs or mining nodes, you had to open up your spellbook and click on the ability to activate tracking on your map? There wasn't a drop down on your mini map like there is today. That wasn't added until the Burning Crusade in patch 2.3. And even then, they didn't have the ability to track mailboxes or innkeepers, or other useful people out in the world until an even later day in WoW's history. Having tracking on the minimap is just much more convenient, especially if you're playing a hunter and have multiple ways to track different mobs. Number 7, the clock and calendar. Before a late patch in the Burning Crusade, there was not an in-game clock, and instead you just had a little icon which would show you a sun or moon to denote day or nighttime cycles. There also wasn't a calendar, and most people would organize raid events with each other by using either a third-party website or an add-on, which Blizzard eventually added to the game, and functioned basically exactly like the add-on that everyone used. Number 6, Raid Flexibility. In Vanilla WoW, you needed exactly 40 people for raids, which a lot of people think was a great plus, and for a lot of legitimate reasons that I agree somewhat with. There's also some places that only need 20, some that needed 10. Basically, for a long time, you needed an exact amount of people to enter raid groups. But with the new flex system that works on normal and heroic mode, you only need 10 to 30 people. But you still do need exactly 20 people to do the hardest mode, Mythic. Being able to flexibly include up to 30 people is just so much better for scheduling raids, where real people have conflicts that make it so they can't show up and you don't have to sit people on the bench who will get mad and eventually leave. It just solves a lot of the human problems that come with organizing a raid group. Of course, for the most hardcore people out there, they do still have to deal with an exact amount of 20 people, which is understandable because they're doing the hardest content in the game. 
but the option to have flexible rating on the other two much more used modes is a very nice convenience. Number 5. Max Level Talent Trees Now, this is a pretty controversial thing to praise, but just hear me out on it. Old school talent trees, I believe, were much better for leveling up, and had a niche distinction of allowing some hybrid spec play. For some classes anyway. But once you hit max level, there wasn't much choice with your talent points. You could go down your specs tree and grab all the useful abilities and talents, and then just ignore all the ones that weren't as good. You couldn't really change your playstyle or any of your abilities without changing specs. But with max level talent trees, you actually do get a little bit of choice with picking what abilities you want and what you want to specialize in for the spec you're in. If you're on a fight that has lots of AoE, you can change your talent points around to have better AoE, without having to swap to the better AoE spec. If there's a boss mechanic that does a lot of damage for a short period of time, you can swap your talents to pick better defensives. If you're healing a fight where people are at low health often, you can change your talents to pick up one which will take advantage of that. Or if you're like me and hurt one of your hands, you can just pick a whole bunch of passive abilities to reduce the amount of buttons you need to press. The talent trees we have now are just more flexible in endgame content than the old school talent trees where you basically had set places where you spent your points, and you couldn't change your rotation or what abilities you choose anywhere near as effectively as the talent trees we have today. But at the same time, I do really miss the old school talent tree whenever I'm leveling a new character, as the ones we have now are really boring as you only get a new ability once every 15 levels or so. So it's not a perfect system, but for end game content specifically, I believe it is better than the old talent trees. Number 4. More Complex Raid Fights Raids have been adding more mechanics and becoming more complicated to do over time, whereas vanilla WoW raids had mechanics about on par as LFR does today. In fact, some LFR bosses are actually more complicated than some of the raid bosses in vanilla WoW. The thing that made raids in vanilla WoW more difficult was just a lot of other factors in the game at the time, and not really the mechanics of the raid fights themselves. For some of them anyway, there were absolutely some raid fights that had intricate mechanics like we do today, but that was more of an exception than it was the norm though. In raiding today, that's one of the few things WoW players agree on, is that raid fights are good, and it's really hard to get WoW players to agree on anything. In vanilla WoW, the only way to gain experience was through killing monsters, turning in quests, and exploration, which gave an incredibly minor amount. So if you want to level up your character, you had to go out and quest and grind a ton of mobs, which isn't really that bad, unless you're doing it for the 10th time. Then you really want some alternative ways to level up a new character. And in the current game, in addition to the three ways of gaining experience from vanilla WoW, you can also gain experience from battlegrounds, pet battles, gathering herbs and ore, finding treasures, completing a dungeon, and completing island expeditions. I'm sure there's a few other I'm missing, but those are the major things you can do if you really don't want to quest or grind monsters. Considering how many people got banned with the XP potion stacking bug, players are really looking for new ways to level their characters. So having all of these alternatives, or just them being additions to the regular stuff, is a much welcome change to the game. Number 2. More Endgame Content In vanilla WoW, endgame content consisted of doing dungeons until you had gear good enough to go into raids, and then farming gold to supply those raids, or grinding endlessly in the three battlegrounds for honor to get High Warlord. Once you got to a certain gear level, you no longer ran dungeons, and only people who played WoW as if it was a full-time job got the High Warlord title. So besides those two things, raiding and PvP, you didn't really have anything else to do to advance the power of your character or really anything fun to do besides that. But over time, they've added a ton of things to do at Endgame, where now there's three major things you can do at max level. Raiding, Mythic Plus Dungeons, and Raided PvP, which includes arenas and battlegrounds. And outside of that, there's also a whole bunch of other, more minor things to do, like daily quests, world quests, the Brawler's Guild, an entire minigame within the game of pet battles. Most of these things are just things you can do to get gold and make slight progression to the power of your character, or just tough challenges to accomplish for the fun of it. Even if people like to claim there's nothing to do in the game, it's more like they just don't want to do the things that are in the game, where there is a lot more to do at Endgame than there was in Vanilla WoW. But it probably doesn't seem like it since you spent most of that time at max level grinding something out, as there was a lot of grinds to do in Vanilla WoW, for reputations, weapon skills, professions, and gold for the vast amounts of consumables you needed to raid. 
And finally, number one, AoE looting. Now, I'm actually a pretty big advocate for no changes in Classic WoW. I want Classic WoW to be as inconvenient as possible. And the best way to accomplish that is to have as little changes as possible. Because all of those inconveniences kind of give Classic WoW its charm. And really makes you appreciate just how many good changes have been made to the game. Like when you level a brand new character in Classic and all of your abilities get dodged, parried, missed, blocked, or reduced through glancing blows, you realize it's hard enough just trying to hit a normal mob in addition to everything else in the game. Normal mobs don't have anywhere near as much avoidance in the live version of the game as they do in Classic. And for good reason. It's annoying to have all your abilities miss like that. And I want that kind of system to persist in Classic WoW. I couldn't imagine all of my abilities being able to hit like they do in live. But if I were to make one change, something that's just convenient for me and me alone, and wouldn't affect the core gameplay of Vanilla WoW at all, <sighs> that would be to have AoE looting. Being able to loot everyone at once with one click, within the radius of a dead mob of course, is just so convenient that it's really hard to imagine the game without it. Now, I'm not saying they should add AoE looting to Classic. Like I said earlier, I want it to be as inconvenient as possible. But if they were to make one small little change, just add in one little convenience, something that wouldn't affect the game too much, I would definitely want AoE looting, as I think it's one of the best conveniences they've ever added to the game. In fact, I wish they had a system to just auto-loot by running over corpses so you don't have to click on anything. Looting random, non-boss mobs is one of the most tedious things to do when running old content or leveling up. And one of the few things I like about Islands is that you don't actually have to loot any of the mobs, and you can just run around and kill shit. I think many people would agree that AoE looting is great, and a no-brainer for the number one spot on this list.